Section 59 of Mark Twain, A Biography, Part 2, 1907 to 1910. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 270, The Aldridge Memorial. At the end of June came the dedication at Portsmouth, New Hampshire, of the Thomas Bailey Aldridge Memorial Museum, which the poet's wife had established there in the old Aldrich homestead. It was hot weather. We were obliged to take a rather poor train from South Norwalk, and Clemens was silent and gloomy most of the way to Boston. Once there, however, lodged in a cool and comfortable hotel, matters improved. He had brought along for reading the old copy of Sir Thomas Mallory's Arthur Tales, and after dinner he took off his clothes and climbed into bed and sat up and read aloud from those stately legends with comments that I wish I could remember now, only stopping at last when overpowered with sleep. We went on a special train to Portsmouth next morning, through the summer heat, and assembled with those who were to speak in the back portion of the opera house, behind the scenes. Clemens was genial and good-natured with all the discomfort of it, and he liked to fancy, with Howells, who had come over from Kittery Point, how Aldridge must be amused at the whole circumstance if he could see them punishing themselves to do honor to his memory. Richard Watson Gilder was there, and Hamilton Maybe, also Governor Floyd of New Hampshire, Colonel Higginson, Robert Bridges, and other distinguished men. We got to the more open atmosphere of the stage presently, and the exercises began. Clemens was last on the program. The others had all said handsome, serious things, and Clemens himself had mentally prepared something of the sort. But when his turn came and he rose to speak, a sudden reaction must have set in, for he delivered an address that certainly would have delighted Aldridge living, and must have delighted him dead, if he could hear it. It was full of the most charming humor delicate, refreshing, and spontaneous. The audience, that had been maintaining a proper gravity throughout, showed its appreciation in ripples of merriment that grew presently into genuine waves of laughter. He spoke out his regret for having worn black clothes. It was a mistake, he said, to consider this a solemn time. Aldridge would not have wished it to be so considered. He had been a man who loved humor and brightness and wit, and had helped to make life merry and delightful. Certainly, if he could know, he would not wish this dedication of his own home to be a lugubrious, smileless occasion. Outside, when the services were ended, the venerable juvenile writer J. T. Trowbridge came up to Clemens with extended hand. Clemens said, "'Trowbridge, are you still alive? You must be a thousand years old. Why, I listened to your stories while I was being rocked in the cradle. Trowbridge said, Mark, there's some mistake. My earliest infant smile was wakened with one of your jokes. They stood side by side against a fence in the blazing sun and were photographed. An interesting picture. We returned to Boston that evening. Clemens did not wish to hurry in the summer heat, and we remained another day, quietly sightseeing and driving around and around Commonwealth Avenue in a Victoria in the cool of the evening. Once remembering Aldridge, he said, I was just planning Tom Sawyer when he was beginning the story of a bad boy. When I heard that he was writing that, I thought of giving up mine. But Aldridge insisted that it would be a foolish thing to do. He thought my Missouri boy could not by any chance conflict with his boy of New England, and of course he was right. He spoke of how great literary minds usually came along in company. He said, Now and then, on the stream of time, small gobs of that thing which we call genius drift down, and a few of these lodge at some particular point, and others collect about them, 
and make a sort of intellectual island, a towhead, as they say on the river. Such an accumulation of intellect we call a group, or school, and name it. Thirty years ago there was the Cambridge group. Now there's been still another, which included Aldridge and Howells and Stedman and Cable. It will soon be gone. I suppose they will have to name it by and by. He pointed out houses here and there of people he had known and visited in other days. The driver was very anxious to go farther, to other and more distinguished sites. Clemens mildly but firmly refused any variation of the program, and so we kept on driving around and around the shaded loop of Beacon Street until dusk fell and the lights began to twinkle among the trees. End of chapter 270 The Aldrich Memorial Read by John Greenman Section 60 of Mark Twain, A Biography Part 2, 1907 to 1910. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 271 Death of Sam Moffat. Clemens' next absence from Reading came on August 1st, 1908, when the sudden and shocking news was received of the drowning of his nephew Samuel E. Moffat in the surf of the Jersey Shore. Moffat was his nearest male relative, and a man of fine intellect and talents. He was superior in those qualities which men love. He was large-minded and large-hearted, and of noble ideals. With much of the same sense of humor which had made his uncle's fame, he had what was really an abnormal faculty of acquiring and retaining encyclopedic data. Once as a child he had visited Hartford when Clemens was laboring over his history game. The boy was much interested and asked permission to help. His uncle willingly consented and referred him to the library for his facts. But he did not need to consult the books. He already had English history stored away and knew where to find every detail of it. At the time of his death Moffat held an important editorial position on Collier's Weekly. Clemens was fond and proud of his nephew. Returning from the funeral, he was much depressed, and a day or two later became really ill. He was in bed for a few days, resting, he said, after the intense heat of the journey. Then he was about again, and proposed billiards as a diversion. We were all alone one very still, warm August afternoon, playing, when he suddenly said, I feel a little dizzy. I will sit down a moment. I brought him a glass of water, and he seemed to recover. But when he rose and started to play, I thought he had a dazed look. He said, I have lost my memory. I don't know which is my ball. I don't know what game we are playing. But immediately this condition passed, and we thought little of it considering it merely a phase of biliousness due to his recent journey. I have been told since, by eminent practitioners, that it was the first indication of a more serious malady. He became apparently quite himself again, and showed his usual vigor, light of step and movement, able to skip up and down stairs as heretofore. In a letter to Mrs. Crane, August 12th, he spoke of recent happenings. Dear Aunt Sue, it was a most moving, a most heart-breaking sight, the spectacle of that stunned and crushed and inconsolable family. I came back here in bad shape, and had a bilious collapse, but I am all right again, though the doctor from New York has given peremptory orders that I am not to stir from here before frost. No oh, fortunate Sam Moffat, fortunate Livy Clemens, doubly fortunate Susie, those 
swords go through and through my heart, but there is never a moment that I am not glad, for the sake of the dead, that they have escaped. How Livy would love this place, how her very soul would steep itself thankfully in this peace, this tranquillity, this deep stillness, this dreamy expanse of woodsy hill and valley. You must come, Aunt Sue, and stay with us a real good visit. Since June twenty-sixth we have had twenty-one guests, and they have all liked it, and said they would come again. To Howells on the same day he wrote, won't you and Mrs. Howells and Mildred come and give us as many days as you can spare and examine John's triumph? It is the most satisfactory house I am acquainted with, and the most satisfactorily situated. I have dismissed my stenographer and have entered upon a holiday whose other end is the cemetery. End of chapter 271 Death of Sam Moffat Read by John Greenman Section 61 of Mark Twain, A Biography Part 2, 1907-1910 to This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography By Albert Bigelow Payne Chapter 272 Stormfield Adventures Clemens had fully decided by this time to live the year round in the retirement at Stormfield, and the house at 21 Fifth Avenue was being dismantled. He had also, as he said, given up his dictations, for the time at least, after continuing them with more or less regularity for a period of two and a half years during which he had piled up about half a million words of comment and reminiscence. His general idea had been to add portions of this matter to his earlier books as the copyrights expired, to give them new life and interest, and he felt that he had plenty now for any such purpose. He gave his time mainly to his guests, his billiards, and his reading, though of course he could not keep from writing on this subject and that as the fancy moved him, and a drawer in one of his dressers began to accumulate fresh, though usually fragmentary, manuscripts. He read the daily paper, but he no longer took the keen, restless interest in public affairs. New York politics did not concern him any more, and national politics not much. When the Evening Post wrote him concerning the advisability of renominating Governor Hughes, he replied, If you had asked me two months ago, my answer would have been prompt and loud and strong. Yes, I want Governor Hughes renominated, but it is too late, and my mouth is closed. I have become a citizen and taxpayer of Connecticut, and could not now, without impertinence, meddle in matters which are none of my business. I could not do it with impertinence without trespassing on the monopoly of another. Howells speaks of Mark Twain's absolute content with his new home, and these are the proper words to express it. He was like a storm-beaten ship that had drifted at last into a serene South Sea haven. The days began and ended in tranquility. There were no special morning regulations. One could have his breakfast at any time and at almost any place. He could have it in bed if he liked, or in the loggia, or living room, or billiard room. He might even have it in the dining room or on the terrace just outside. Guests, there were usually guests, might suit their convenience in this matter, also as to the forenoons. The afternoon brought games, that is, billiards, provided the guest knew billiards, otherwise hearts. Those two games were his safety valves, 
and while there were no printed requirements relating to them, the unwritten code of Stormfield provided that guests, of whatever age or previous faith, should engage in one or both of these diversions. Clemens, who usually spent his forenoon in bed with his reading and his letters, came to the green table of skill and chance eager for the onset. If the fates were kindly, he approved of them openly. If not, well, the fates were old enough to know better, and, as heretofore, had to take the consequences. Sometimes, when the weather was fine and there were no games, this was likely to be on Sunday afternoons, there were drives among the hills and along the Saugatuck through the Bedding Glen. The cat was always purring on the hearth at Stormfield, several cats, for Mark Twain's fondness for this clean, intelligent domestic animal remained, to the end, one of his happiest characteristics. There were never too many cats at Stormfield, and the hearth included the entire house, even the billiard table. When, as was likely to happen at any time during the game, the kittens Sinbad or Danbury or billiards would decide to hop up and play with the balls, or sit in the pockets and grab at them as they went by, the game simply added this element of chance, and the uninvited player was not disturbed. The cats really owned Stormfield. Anyone could tell that from their deportment. Mark Twain held the title Deeds, but it was Danbury and Sinbad and the others that possessed the premises. They occupied any portion of the house or its furnishings at will, and they never failed to attract attention. Mark Twain might be preoccupied and indifferent to the comings and goings of other members of the household, but no matter what he was doing, let Danbury appear in the offing, and he was observed and greeted with due deference, and complimented and made comfortable. Clemens would arise from the table and carry certain choice food out on the terrace to Tammany, and be satisfied with almost no acknowledgment by way of appreciation. One could not imagine any home of Mark Twain where the cats were not supreme. In the evening, as at 21 Fifth Avenue, there was music, the stately measures of the orchestral, while Mark Twain smoked and mingled unusual speculation with long, long backward dreams. It was three months from the day of arrival in Reading that some guests came to Stormfield without invitation. Two burglars, who were carrying off some bundles of silver when they were discovered, Claude, the butler, fired a pistol after them to hasten their departure, and Clemens, wakened by the shots, thought the family was opening champagne and went to sleep again. It was far in the night, but neighbor H. A. Lounsbury and Deputy Sheriff Banks were notified, and by morning the thieves were captured, though only after a pretty desperate encounter, during which the officer received a bullet wound. Lounsbury and a Stormfield guest had tracked them in the dark with a lantern to Bethel, a distance of some seven miles. The thieves, also their pursuers, had boarded the train there. Sheriff Banks was waiting at the West Reading station when the train came down, and there the capture was made. It was a remarkably prompt and shrewd piece of work. Clemens gave credit for its success chiefly to Lounsbury, whose talents, in many fields, always impressed him. The thieves were taken to the Reading Town Hall for a preliminary hearing. Subsequently they received severe sentences. Clemens tacked this notice on his front door. Notice to the next burglar. There is nothing but plated ware in this house now and henceforth. You will find it in that brass thing in the dining room over in the corner by the basket of kittens. If you want the basket, put the kittens in the brass thing. Do not make a noise. It disturbs the family. You will find rubbers in the front hall by that thing which has the umbrellas in it. Chiffonier, I think they call it, or pergola, or something like that. Please close the door when you go away. Very truly yours, S. L. Clemens. End of chapter 272 Stormfield Adventures 
read by john greenman Section 62 of Mark Twain, A Biography, Part 2, 1907 to 1910. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 273 Stormfield Philosophies. Now came the tranquil days of the Connecticut autumn. The change of the landscape colors was a constant delight to Mark Twain. There were several large windows in his room, and he called them his picture gallery. The window panes were small, and each formed a separate picture of its own that was changing almost hourly. The red tones that began to run through the foliage, the red berry bushes, the fading grass, and the little touches of sparkling frost that came every now and then at early morning, the background of distant blue hills and changing skies, these things gave his gallery a multitude of variation that no art museums could furnish. He loved it all, and he loved to walk out in it, pacing up and down the terrace or the long path that led to the pergola at the foot of a natural garden. If a friend came, he was willing to walk much farther, and we often descended the hill in one direction or another, though usually going toward the gorge, a romantic spot where a clear brook found its way through a deep and rather dangerous-looking chasm. Once he was persuaded to descend into this fairy-like place, for it was well worth exploring. But his footing was no longer sure, and he did not go far. He liked better to sit on the grass-grown rocky arch above and look down into it, and let his talk follow his mood. He liked to contemplate the geology of his surroundings the record of the ageless periods of construction required to build the world. The marvels of science always appealed to him. He reveled in the thought of the almost limitless stretches of time, the millions upon millions of years that had been required for this stratum and that. He liked to amaze himself with the sounding figures. I remember him expressing a wish to see the Grand Canyon of Arizona, where, on perpendicular walls six thousand feet high, the long story of geological creation is written. I had stopped there during my western trip of the previous year, and I told him something of its wonders. I urged him to see them for himself, offering to go with him. He said, I should enjoy that, but the railroad journey is so far, and I should have no peace. The papers would get hold of it, and I would have to make speeches and be interviewed and i never want to do any of those things again i suggested that the railroads would probably be glad to place a private car at his service so that he might travel in comfort but he shook his head that would only make me more conspicuous how about a disguise yes he said i might put on a red wig and false whiskers and change my name but i couldn't disguise my drawling speech and they'd find me out it was amusing but it was rather sad too his fame had deprived him of valued privileges he talked of many things during these little excursions once he told how he had successfully advised his nephew moffat in the matter of obtaining a desirable position. Moffat had wanted to become a reporter. Clemens devised a characteristic scheme. He said, I will get you a place on any newspaper you may select, if you promise faithfully to follow out my instructions. The applicant agreed, eagerly enough. Clemens said, Go to the newspaper of your choice, Say that you are idle and want work, that you are pining for work, longing for it, and that you ask no wages and will support yourself. All that you ask is work, that you will do anything, sweep, fill the inkstands, mucilage bottles, run errands, and be generally useful you must never ask for wages. 
you must wait until the offer of wages comes to you. You must work just as faithfully and just as eagerly as if you were being paid for it. Then see what happens. The scheme had worked perfectly. Young Moffat had followed his instructions to the letter. By and by he attracted attention. He was employed in a variety of ways that earned him the gratitude and the confidence of the office. In obedience to further instructions he began to make short, brief, unadorned notices of small news matters that came under his eye and laid them on the city editor's desk. No pay was asked, none was expected. Occasionally one of the items was used. Then, of course, it happened, as it must sooner or later at a busy time, that he was given a small news assignment. There was no trouble about his progress after that. He had won the confidence of the management and shown that he was not afraid to work. The plan had been variously tried since, Clemens said, and he could not remember any case in which it had failed. The idea may have grown out of his own pilot apprenticeship on the river, when cub pilots not only received no salary, but paid for the privilege of learning. Clemens discussed public matters less often than formerly, but they were not altogether out of his mind. He thought our republic was in a fair way to become a monarchy, that the signs were already evident. He referred to the letter which he had written so long ago in Boston, with its amusing fancy of the Archbishop of Dublin and his grace of Pongapog, and declared that, after all, it contained something of prophecy. See chapter 97, also Appendix M. He would not live to see the actual monarchy, he said, but it was coming. I'm not expecting it in my time, nor in my children's time, though it may be sooner than we think. There are two special reasons for it, and one condition. The first reason is that it is in the nature of man to want a definite something to love, honor, reverently look up to, and obey. A god and king, for example. The second reason is that while little republics have lasted long, protected by their poverty and insignificance, great ones have not. And the condition is vast power and wealth, which breed commercial and political corruptions, and incite public favorites to dangerous ambitions. He repeated what I had heard him say before, that in one sense we already had a monarchy, that is to say, a ruling public and political aristocracy which could create a presidential succession. He did not say these things bitterly now, but reflectively and rather indifferently. He was inclined to speak unhopefully of the international plans for universal peace, which were being agitated rather persistently. The gospel of peace, he said, is always making a deal of noise, always rejoicing in its progress, but always neglecting to furnish statistics. There are no peaceful nations now. All Christendom is a soldier camp. The poor have been taxed in some nations to the starvation point to support the giant armaments which Christian governments have built up, each to protect itself from the rest of the Christian Brotherhood, and incidentally to snatch any scrap of real estate left exposed by a weaker owner. King Leopold II of Belgium, the most intensely Christian monarch, except Alexander the Sixth, that has escaped hell thus far, has stolen an entire kingdom in Africa, and in fourteen years of Christian endeavor there has reduced the population from thirty millions to fifteen by murder and mutilation 
and overwork, confiscating the labor of the helpless natives and giving them nothing in return but salvation and a home in heaven, furnished at the last moment by the Christian priest. Within the last generation each Christian power has turned the bulk of its attention to finding out newer and still newer and more and more effective ways of killing Christians, and, incidentally, a pagan now and then, and the surest way to get rich quickly in Christ's earthly kingdom is to invent a kind of gun that can kill more Christians at one shot than any other existing kind. All the Christian nations are at it. The more advanced they are, the bigger and more destructive engines of war they create. Once, speaking of battles great and small, and how important even a small battle must seem to a soldier who had fought in no other, he said, to him it is a mighty achievement, an achievement with a big A, when to a wax-worn veteran it would be a mere incident. For instance, to the soldier of one battle, San Juan Hill, was an achievement with an A as big as the pyramids of Chops, whereas if Napoleon had fought it, he would have set it down on his cuff at the time to keep from forgetting it had happened. But that is all natural and human enough. We are all like that. The curiosities and absurdities of religious superstitions never fail to furnish him with themes more or less amusing. I remember one Sunday, when he walked down to have luncheon at my house, he sat under the shade and fell to talking of Herod's slaughter of the innocents, which he said could not have happened. Tacitus makes no mention of it, he said, and he would hardly have overlooked a sweeping order like that, issued by a petty ruler like Herod. Just consider a little king of a corner of the Roman Empire ordering the slaughter of the firstborn of a lot of Roman subjects. Why, the emperor would have reached out that long arm of his and dismissed Herod. That tradition is probably about as authentic as those connected with a number of old bridges in Europe which are said to have been built by Satan. The inhabitants used to go to Satan to build bridges for them, promising him the soul of the first one that crossed the bridge. Then, when Satan had the bridge done, they would send over a rooster or a jackass, a cheap jackass. That was for Satan. And, of course, they could fool him that way every time. Satan must have been pretty simple, even according to the New Testament, or he wouldn't have led Christ up on a high mountain and offered him the world if he would fall down and worship him. That was a manifestly absurd proposition, because Christ, as the Son of God, already owned the world, and besides, what Satan showed him was only a few rocky acres of Palestine. It is just as if someone should try to buy Rockefeller, the owner of all the Standard Oil Company, with a gallon of kerosene. He often spoke of the unseen forces of creation, the immutable laws that hold the planet in exact course and bring the years and the seasons always exactly on schedule time. The great law was a phrase often on his lips, the exquisite foliage, the cloud shapes, 
the varieties of color everywhere. These were for him outward manifestations of the great law, whose principle I understood to be unity, exact relations throughout all nature, and in this I failed to find any suggestion of pessimism, but only of justice. Once he wrote on a card for preservation, From everlasting to everlasting, this is the law. The sum of wrong and misery shall always keep exact step with the sum of human blessedness. No civilization, no advance, has ever modified these proportions by even the shadow of a shade, nor ever can, while our race endures. End of chapter 273 Stormfield Philosophies Read by John Greenman Section 63 of Mark Twain, A Biography, Part 2, 1907-1910. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 274, Citizen and Farmer. The procession of guests at Stormfield continued pretty steadily. Clemens kept a book in which visitors set down their names and the dates of arrival and departure and when they failed to attend to these matters, he diligently did it himself after they were gone. Members of the Harper Company came up with their wives. Angelfish swam in and out of the aquarium. Bermuda friends came to see the new home. Robert Collier, the publisher, and his wife, Mrs. Sally, as Clemens liked to call her, paid their visits. Lord Northcliffe, who was visiting America, came with Colonel Harvey, and was so impressed with the architecture of Stormfield that he adopted its plans for a country place he was about to build in Newfoundland. Helen Keller, with Mr. and Mrs. Macy, came up for a weekend visit. Mrs. Crane came over from Elmira, and, behold, one day came the long-ago sweetheart of his childhood, little Laura Hawkins, Laura Fraser now, widowed and in the seventies, with a granddaughter already a young lady quite grown up. That Mark Twain was not wearying of the new conditions we may gather from a letter written to Mrs. Rogers in October. I've grown young in these months of dissipation here, and I have left off drinking. It isn't necessary now. Society and theology are sufficient for me. To Helen Allen, a Bermuda angelfish, he wrote, we have good times here in this soundless solitude on the hilltop. The moment I saw the house, I was glad I built it, and now I am gladder and gladder all the time. I was not dreaming of living here except in the summer time. That was before I saw this region and the house, you see. But that is all changed now. I shall stay here winter and summer both, and not go back to New York at all. My child, it's as tranquil and contenting as Bermuda. You will be very welcome here, dear. He interested himself in the affairs and in the people of Reading, not long after his arrival he had gathered in all the inhabitants of the countryside, neighbors of every quality, for closer acquaintance, and threw open to them for inspection every part of the new house. He appointed Mrs. Lounsbury, whose acquaintance was very wide, a sort of committee on reception, and stood at the entrance with her to welcome each visitor in person. It was a sort of gala day, and the rooms and the grounds were filled with the visitors. In the dining room there were generous refreshments. Again, not long afterward, he issued a special invitation to all of those architects, builders, and workmen who had taken any part, however great or small, in the building of his home. Mr. and Mrs. Littleton were visiting Stormfield at this time, 
and both Clemens and Littleton spoke to these assembled guests from the terrace, and made them feel that their efforts had been worth while. Presently the idea developed to establish something that would be of benefit to his neighbors, especially to those who did not have access to much reading matter. He had been for years flooded with books by authors and publishers, and there was a heavy surplus at his home in the city. When these began to arrive, he had a large number of volumes set aside as the nucleus of a public library. An unused chapel not far away, it could be seen from one of his windows, was obtained for the purpose. Officers were elected, a librarian was appointed, and so the Mark Twain Library of Reading was duly established. Clemens himself was elected its first president, with the resident physician, Dr. Ernest H. Smith, vice-president, and another resident, William E. Grunman, librarian. On the afternoon of its opening, the president made a brief address. He said, I am here to speak a few instructive words to my fellow farmers. I suppose you are all farmers. I am going to put in a crop next year, when I have been here long enough and know how. I couldn't make a turnip stay on a tree now after I had grown it. I like to talk. It would take more than the redding air to make me keep still, and I like to instruct people. It's noble to be good, and it's nobler to teach others to be good and less trouble. I am glad to help this library. We get our morals from books. I didn't get mine from books, but I know that morals do come from books, theoretically at least. Mr. Beard or Mr. Adams will give some land, and by and by we are going to have a building of our own. This statement was news to both Mr. Beard and Mr. Adams, and an inspiration of the moment. But Mr. Theodore Adams, who owned a most desirable site, did in fact promptly resolve to donate it for library purposes. Clemens continued, I am going to help build that library with contributions from my visitors. Every male guest who comes to my house will have to contribute a dollar or go away without his baggage. A characteristic notice to guests requiring them to contribute a dollar to the library building fund was later placed on the billiard room mantel at Stormfield with good results. If those burglars that broke into my house recently had done that, they would have been happier now, or if they'd have broken into this library, they would have read a few books and led a better life. Now they are in jail, and if they keep on, they will go to Congress. When a person starts downhill, you can never tell where he's going to stop. I am sorry for those burglars. They got nothing that they wanted and scared away most of my servants. Now we are putting in a burglar alarm instead of a dog. Some advised the dog, but it costs even more to entertain a dog than a burglar. I am having the ground electrified so that for a mile around anyone who puts his foot across the line sets off an alarm that will be heard in Europe. Now I will introduce the real president to you, a man whom you know already, Dr. Smith. So a new and important benefit was conferred upon the community. 
and there was a feeling that redding besides having a literary colony was to be literary in fact it might have been mentioned earlier that redding already had literary associations when mark twain arrived as far back as revolutionary days joel barlow a poet of distinction and once minister to france had been a resident of redding and there were still barlow descendants in the township william edgar grumman the librarian had written the story of redding's share in the revolutionary war no small share for general israel putnam's army had been quartered there during at least one long trying winter charles burr todd of one of the oldest redding families himself still a resident was also the author of a redding history of literary folk not native to redding dora reed goodall and her sister elaine the wife of dr charles a eastman had long been residents of redding center Jeanette L. Gilder and Ida M. Tarbell had summer homes on Redding Ridge. Dan Beard, as already mentioned, owned a place near the banks of the Sagatuck, while Kate V. St. Maur, also two of Nathaniel Hawthorne's granddaughters, had recently located adjoining the Stormfield lands, by which it will be seen that Redding was in no way unsuitable as a home for Mark Twain. End of chapter 274 Citizen and Farmer Read by John Greenman Section 64 of Mark Twain, A Biography Part 2, 1907-1910 to This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography By Albert Bigelow Payne Chapter 275 A Mantle and a Baby Elephant Mark Twain was the receiver of two notable presents that year, the first of these a mantle from Hawaii, presented to him by the Hawaiian Promotion Committee, was set in place in the billiard-room on the morning of his seventy-third birthday. This committee had written, proposing to build for his new home either a mantle or a chair, as he might prefer, the same to be carved from the native woods. Clemens decided on a billiard-room mantle and John Howells forwarded the proper measurements. So in due time the mantle arrived, a beautiful piece of work, and in fine condition, with the Hawaiian word aloha, one of the sweetest forms of greeting in any tongue, carved as its central ornament. To the donors of the gift Clemens wrote, The beautiful mantle was put in its place an hour ago, and its friendly aloha was the first uttered greeting received on my seventy-third birthday. It is rich in color, rich in quality, and rich in decoration. Therefore it exactly harmonized with the taste for such things which was born in me, and which I have seldom been able to indulge to my content it will be a great pleasure to me daily renewed to have under my eye this lovely reminder of the loveliest fleet of islands that lies anchored in any ocean and i beg to thank the committee for providing me that pleasure to f n otremba who had carved the mantle he sent this word I am grateful to you for the valued compliment to me in the labor of heart and hand and brain which you have put upon it. It is worthy of the choicest place in the house, and it has it. It was the second beautiful mantle in Stormfield. The Hartford Library mantle, removed when that house was sold, having been installed in the Stormfield living-room. Altogether the seventy-third birthday was a pleasant one. Clemens, in the morning, drove down to see the library lot which Mr. Theodore Adams had presented, and the rest of the day there were fine, close billiard games, during which he was in the gentlest and happiest moods. He recalled the games of two years before, and as we stopped playing I said, 
I hope a year from now we shall be here, still playing the great game. And he answered, as then, Yes, it is a great game, the best game on earth. And he held out his hand and thanked me for coming, as he never failed to do when we parted, though it always hurt me a little, for the debt was so largely mine. Mark Twain's second present came at Christmas time, about ten days earlier. A letter came from Robert J. Collier, saying that he had bought a baby elephant which he intended to present to Mark Twain as a Christmas gift. He added that it would be sent as soon as he could get a car for it, and the loan of a keeper from Barnum and Bailey's headquarters at Bridgeport. The news created a disturbance in Stormfield. One could not refuse, discourteously and abruptly, a costly present like that, but it seemed a disaster to accept it. An elephant would require a roomy and warm place, also a variety of attention which Stormfield was not prepared to supply. The telephone was set going, and certain timid excuses were offered by the secretary. There was no good place to put an elephant in Stormfield, but Mr. Collier said, quite confidently, "'Oh, put him in the garage.' "'But there's no heat in the garage.' "'Well, put him in the loggia, then. That's closed in, isn't it, for the winter? Plenty of sunlight, just the place for a young elephant.' but we play cards in the loggia we use it for a sort of sun parlor but that wouldn't matter he's a kindly playful little thing he'll be just like a kitten i'll send the man up to look over the place and tell you just how to take care of him and i'll send up several bales of hay in advance it isn't a large elephant you know just a little one a regular plaything there was nothing further to be done only to wait and dread until the Christmas present's arrival. A few days before Christmas, ten bales of hay arrived and several bushels of carrots. This store of provender aroused no enthusiasm at Stormfield. It would seem there was no escape now. On Christmas morning, Mr. Lounsbury telephoned up that there was a man at the station who said he was an elephant trainer from Barnum and Bailey's, sent by Mr. Collier to look at the elephant's quarters and get him settled when he should arrive. Orders were given to bring the man over. The day of doom was at hand. But Lounsbury's detective instinct came once more into play. He had seen a good many elephant trainers at Bridgeport, and he thought this one had a doubtful look. "'Where is the elephant?' he asked, as they drove along. "'He will arrive at noon.' "'Where are you going to put him?' "'In the loggia.' "'How big is he?' about the size of a cow. How long have you been with Barnum and Bailey? Six years. Then you must know some friends of mine, naming two that had no existence until that moment. Oh, yes, indeed, I know them well. Lounsbury didn't say any more just then, but he had a feeling that perhaps the dread at Stormfield had grown unnecessarily large. Something told him that this man seemed rather more like a butler or a valet than an elephant trainer. They drove to Stormfield, and the trainer looked over the place. It would do perfectly, he said. He gave a few instructions as to the care of this new household feature, and was driven back to the station to bring it. Lounsbury came back by and by bringing the elephant, but not the trainer. It didn't need a trainer. It was a beautiful specimen, with soft, smooth coat and handsome trappings, perfectly quiet, well-behaved, and small, suited to the loggia, as Collier had said, for it was only two feet long and beautifully made of cloth and cotton, one of the finest toy elephants ever seen anywhere. It was a good joke, such as Mark Twain loved, a carefully prepared, harmless bit of foolery. He wrote Robert Collier, threatening him with all sorts of revenge, declaring that the elephant was devastating Stormfield. To send an elephant in a trance under pretense that it was dead or stuffed, he said. The elephant came to life as you knew it would, and began to observe Christmas 
and we now have no furniture left and no servants and no visitors no friends no photographs no burglars nothing but the elephant be kind be merciful be generous take him away and send us what is left of the earthquake collier wrote that he thought it unkind of him to look a gift elephant in the trunk and with such chafing and gaiety the year came to an end end of chapter two hundred and seventy five a mantle and a baby elephant read by john greenman section sixty five of mark twain a biography part two nineteen o seven to nineteen ten this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne chapter two hundred and seventy six shakespeare bacon talk when the bad weather came there was not much company at stormfield and i went up regularly each afternoon for it was lonely on that bleak hill and after his forenoon of reading or writing he craved diversion my own home was a little more than a half mile away and i enjoyed the walk whatever the weather i usually managed to arrive about three o'clock he would watch from his high windows until he saw me raise the hilltop and he would be at the door when i arrived so that there might be no delay in getting at the games or if it happened that he wished to show me something in his room I would hear his rich voice sounding down the stair. Once, when I arrived, I heard him calling, and going up I found him highly pleased with the arrangement of two pictures on a chair, placed so that the glasses of them reflected the sunlight on the ceiling. He said, They seem to catch the reflection of the sky and the winter colors. Sometimes the hues are wonderfully iridescent. He pointed to a bunch of wild red berries on the mantel with the sun on them. How beautifully they light up, he said. Some of them in the sunlight, some still in the shadow. He walked to the window and stood looking out on the somber fields. The lights and colors are always changing there, he said. I never tire of it. To see him then so full of the interest and delight of the moment, one might easily believe he had never known tragedy and shipwreck. More than any one I ever knew, he lived in the present. Most of us are either dreaming of the past or anticipating the future, forever beating the dirge of yesterday or the tattoo of tomorrow. Mark Twain's step was timed to the march of the moment. There were days when he recalled the past and grieved over it, and when he speculated concerning the future. But his greater interest was always of the now, and of the particular locality where he found it. The thing which caught his fancy, however slight or however important, possessed him fully for the time, even if never afterward. He was especially interested that winter in the Shakespeare-Bacon problem. He had long been unable to believe that the actor-manager from Stratford had written those great plays, and now a book just published, The Shakespeare Problem Restated, by George Greenwood, and another in press, Some Characteristic Signatures of Francis Bacon, by William Stone Booth, had added the last touch of conviction that Francis Bacon, and Bacon only, had written the Shakespeare dramas. I was ardently opposed to this idea. The romance of the boy, Will Shakespeare, who had come up to London and began by holding horses outside of the theatre, and ended by winning the proudest place in the world of letters, was something I did not wish to let perish. I produced all the stock testimony, Ben Jonson's sonnet, the internal evidence of the plays themselves, the actors who had published them, but he refused to accept any of it. He declared that there was not a single proof to show that Shakespeare had written one of them. "'Is there any evidence that he didn't?' I asked. "'There's evidence that he couldn't,' he said. 
it required a man with the fullest legal equipment to have written them when you have read greenwood's book you will see how untenable is any argument for shakespeare's authorship i was willing to concede something and offered a compromise perhaps i said shakespeare was the belasco of that day the managerial genius unable to write plays himself but with the supreme gift of making effective drama from the plays of others in that case it is not unlikely that the plays would be known as shakespeare's even in this day john luther long's madame butterfly is sometimes called belasco's play though it is doubtful if belasco ever wrote a line of it he considered this view but not very favorably the booth book was at this time a secret and he had not told me anything concerning it but he had it in his mind when he said with an air of the greatest conviction i know that shakespeare did not write those plays and i have reason to believe he did not touch the text in any way how can you be so positive i asked he replied i have private knowledge from a source that cannot be questioned i now suspected that he was joking and asked if he had been consulting a spiritual medium but he was clearly in earnest it is the great discovery of the age he said quite seriously the world will soon ring with it i wish i could tell you about it but i have passed my word you will not have long to wait i was going to sail for the mediterranean in february and i asked if it would be likely that i would know this great secret before i sailed he thought not but he said that more than likely the startling news would be given to the world while i was on the water and it might come to me on the ship by wireless i confess i was amazed and intensely curious by this time i conjectured the discovery of some document some bacon or shakespeare private paper which dispelled all the mystery of the authorship i hinted that he might write me a letter which i could open on the ship but he was firm in his refusal he had passed his word he repeated and the news might not be given out as soon as that but he assured me more than once that wherever i might be in whatever remote locality it would come by cable and the world would quake with it i was tempted to give up my trip to be with him at stormfield at the time of the upheaval naturally the shakespeare theme was uppermost during the remaining days that we were together he had engaged another stenographer and was now dictating forenoons his own views on the subject views coordinated with those of mr greenwood whom he liberally quoted but embellished and decorated in his own gay manner these were chapters for his autobiography he said and i think he had then no intention of making a book of them i could not quite see why he should take all this argumentary trouble if he had as he said positive evidence that bacon and not shakespeare had written the plays i thought the whole matter very curious the shakespeare interest had diverging bypaths one evening when we were alone at dinner he said there is only one other illustrious man in history about whom there is so little known and he added jesus christ he reviewed the statements of the gospels concerning christ though he declared them to be mainly traditional and of no value i agreed that they contained confusing statements and inflicted more or less with justice and reason but i said i thought there was truth in them too why do you think so he asked because they contain matters that are self-evident things eternally and essentially just then you make your own bible yes from those materials combined with human reason then it does not matter where the truth as you call it comes from i admitted that the source did not matter that truth from shakespeare epictetus or aristotle was quite as valuable as from the scriptures we were on common ground now 
He mentioned Marcus Aurelius, the Stoics, and their blameless lives. I, still pursuing the thought of Jesus, asked, do you not think it strange that in that day when Christ came, admitting that there was a Christ, such a character could have come at all in the time of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, when all was ceremony and unbelief? I remember, he said, the Sadducees didn't believe in hell. He brought them one. Nor the resurrection, he brought them that also. He did not admit that there had been a Christ with the character and mission related by the Gospels. It is all a myth, he said. There have been saviors in every age of the world. It is all just a fairy tale, like the idea of Santa Claus. But, I argued, even the spirit of Christmas is real when it is genuine. Suppose that we admit there was no physical savior, that it is only an idea, a spiritual embodiment which humanity has made for itself and is willing to improve upon as its own spirituality improves. Wouldn't that make it worthy? But then the fairy story of the atonement dissolves, and with it crumbles the very foundations of any established church. You can create your own testament, your own scripture, and your own Christ. But you've got to give up your atonement. As related to the crucifixion, yes, and good riddance to it. But the death of the old order and the growth of spirituality comes to a sort of atonement, doesn't it? He said, A conclusion like that has about as much to do with the Gospels and Christianity as Shakespeare had to do with Bacon's plays. You are preaching a doctrine that would have sent a man to the stake a few centuries ago. I have preached that in my own Gospel. I remembered then and realized that by my own clumsy ladder I had merely mounted from dogma and superstition to his platform of training the ideals to a higher contentment of soul. End of chapter 276 Shakespeare Bacon Talk Read by John Greenman Section 66 of Mark Twain, A Biography Part 2 1907 to 1910. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 277. Is Shakespeare Dead? I set out on my long journey with much reluctance. However, a series of guests with various diversions had been planned, and it seemed a good time to go. Clemens gave me letters of introduction and bade me Godspeed. It would be near the end of April before I should see him again. Now and then, on the ship, and in the course of my travels, I remembered the great news I was to hear concerning Shakespeare. In Cairo, at Shepherd's, I looked eagerly through English newspapers, expecting any moment to come upon great headlines. But I was always disappointed. Even on the return voyage there was no one I could find who had heard any particular Shakespeare news. Arriving in New York, I found that Clemens himself had published his Shakespeare Dictations in a little volume of his own, entitled, Is Shakespeare Dead? The title certainly suggested spiritistic matters, and I got a volume at Harper's and read it going up on the train, hoping to find somewhere in it a solution of the great mystery. But it was only matter I had already known. The secret was still unrevealed. At Reading, I lost not much time in getting up to Stormfield. There had been changes in my absence. Clara Clemens had returned from her travels, and Jean, whose health seemed improved, was coming home to be her father's secretary. He was greatly pleased with these things, and declared he was going to have a home once more with his children about him. He was quite alone that day, and we walked up and down the great living room for an hour, perhaps, while he discussed his new plans. For one thing, he had incorporated his pen-name Mark Twain 
in order that the protection of his copyrights and the conduct of his literary business in general should not require his personal attention. He seemed to find a relief in this, as he always did in dismissing any kind of responsibility. When we went in for billiards I spoke of his book, which I had read on the way up, and of the great Shakespearean secret which was to astonish the world. Then he told me that the matter had been delayed, but that he was no longer required to suppress it, that the revelation was in the form of a book, a book which revealed conclusively to any one who would take the trouble to follow the directions that the acrostic name of Francis Bacon, in a great variety of forms, ran through many, probably through all, of the so-called Shakespeare plays. He said it was far and away beyond anything of the kind ever published, that Ignatius Donnelly and others had merely glimpsed the truth, but that the author of this book, William Stone Booth, had demonstrated, beyond any doubt or question, that the Bacon signatures were there. The book would be issued in a few days, he said. He had seen a set of proofs of it, and while it had not been published in the best way to clearly demonstrate its great revelation, it must settle the matter with every reasoning mind. He confessed that his faculties had been more or less defeated in attempting to follow the ciphers, and he complained bitterly that the evidence had not been set forth so that he who merely skims a book might grasp it. He had failed on the acrostics at first, but more recently he had understood the rule and had been able to work out several Bacon signatures. He complimented me by saying that he felt sure that when the book came I would have no trouble with it. Without going further with this matter I may say here that the book arrived presently, and between us we did work out a considerable number of the claimed acrostics by following the rules laid down. It was certainly an interesting, if not wholly convincing, occupation, and it would be a difficult task for anyone to prove that the ciphers are not there. Just why this pretentious volume created so little agitation it would be hard to say. Certainly it did not cause any great upheaval in the literary world, and the name of William Shakespeare still continues to be printed on the title page of those marvelous dramas so long associated with his name. Mark Twain's own book on the subject, Is Shakespeare Dead?, found a wide acceptance, and probably convinced as many readers. It contained no new arguments, but it gave a convincing touch to the old ones, and it was certainly readable. Mark Twain had the fullest conviction as to the Bacon authorship of the Shakespeare plays. One evening with Mr. Edward Loomis we attended a fine performance of Romeo and Juliet, given by Southern and Marlowe. At the close of one splendid scene he said, quite earnestly, "'That is about the best play that Lord Bacon ever wrote.'" Among the visitors who had come to Stormfield was Howells. Clemens had called a meeting of the Human Race Club, but only Howells was able to attend. We will let him tell of his visit. "'We got on very well without the absentees, after finding them in the wrong, as usual, and the visit was like those I used to have with him so many years before in Hartford, but there was not the old ferment of subjects. Many things had been discussed and put away for good. But we had our old fondness for nature and for each other, who were so differently parts of it. He showed his absolute content with his house, and that was the greater pleasure for me, because it was my son who designed it. The architect had been so fortunate as to be able to plan it where a natural avenue of savins, the close-knit, slender, cypress-like cedars of New England, led away from the rear of the villa to the little level of a pergola, meant some day to be wreathed and roofed with vines. But in the early spring days all the landscape was in the beautiful nakedness of the northern winter. It opened in the surpassing loveliness of wooded and meadowed uplands, under skies that were the first day's blue, and the last gray over a rainy and then a snowy floor. We walked up and down, up and down, between the villa terrace and the pergola, and talked with the melancholy amusement, the sad tolerance of age, for the sort of men and things that used to excite us or enrage us, 
now we were far past turbulence or anger once we took a walk together across the yellow pastures to a casmal creek on his grounds where the ice still knit the clay banks together like crystal mosses and the stream far down clashed through and over the stones and the shards of ice clemens pointed out the scenery he had bought to give himself elbow-room and showed me the lot he was going to have me build on the next day we came again with the geologist he had asked up to stormfield to analyze its rocks truly he loved the place my visit at stormfield came to an end with tender reluctance on his part and on mine every morning before i dressed i heard him sounding my name through the house for the fun of it and i know for the fondness and if i looked out of my door there he was in his long nightgown swaying up and down the corridor and wagging his great white head like a boy that leaves his bed and comes out in the hope of frolic with some one the last morning a soft sugar snow had fallen and was falling and i drove through it down to the station in the carriage which had been given him by his wife's father when they were first married and had been kept all those intervening years in honorable retirement for this final use this carriage a finely built coupe had been presented to mrs crane when the hartford house was closed when stormfield was built she returned it to its original owner its springs had not grown yielding with time it had rather the stiffness and severity of age but for him it must have swung low like the sweet chariot of the negro spiritual which i heard him sing with such fervor when those wonderful hymns of the slaves began to make their way northward howells's visit resulted in a new inspiration clemens started to write him one night when he could not sleep and had been reading the volume of letters of james russell lowell then next morning he was seized with the notion of writing a series of letters to such friends as Howells, Twitchell, and Rogers, letters not to be mailed, but to be laid away for some future public. He wrote two of these immediately, to Howells and to Twitchell. The Howells letter, or letters, for it was really double, is both pathetic and amusing. The first part ran, Three in the Morning april seventeenth nineteen o nine my pen has gone dry and the ink is out of reach howells did you write me day before day before yesterday or did i dream it in my mind's eye i most vividly see your hand write on a square blue envelope in the mail pile i have hunted the house over but there is no such letter was it an illusion i am reading lowell's letters and smoking i woke an hour ago and am reading to keep from wasting the time on page three hundred and five volume one i have just margined a note young friend i like that you ought to see him now it seemed startlingly strange to hear a person call you young it was a brick out of a blue sky and knocked me groggy for a moment ah me the pathos of it is that we were young then and he why so was he but he didn't know it he didn't even know it nine years later when we saw him approaching and you warned me saying don't say anything about age he has just turned fifty and thinks he is old and broods over it well clara did sing and you wrote her a dear letter time to go to sleep yours ever mark 
the second letter begun at ten a m outlines the plan by which he is to write on the subject uppermost in his mind without restraint knowing that the letter is not to be mailed the scheme furnishes a definite target for each letter and you can choose the target that's going to be the most sympathetic for what you are hungering and thirsting to say at that particular moment and you can talk with a quite unallowable frankness and freedom because you are not going to send the letter when you are on fire with theology you'll not write it to rogers who wouldn't be an inspiration you'll write it to twitchell because it will make him writhe and squirm and break the furniture when you are on fire with a good thing that's indecent you won't waste it on twitchell you'll save it for howells who will love it as he will never see it you can make it really indecenter than he could stand and so no harm is done yet a vast advantage is gained the letter was not finished and the scheme perished there the twitchell letter concerned missionaries and added nothing to what he had already said on the subject he wrote no letter to mr rogers perhaps never wrote to him again end of chapter 277 is shakespeare dead read by john greenman section 67 of mark twain a biography part 2 1907 to 1910 this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne chapter 278 the death of henry rogers clemens a little before my return had been on a trip to norfolk virginia to attend the opening ceremonies of the virginia railway he had made a speech on that occasion in which he had paid a public tribute to henry rogers and told something of his personal obligation to the financier he began by telling what mr rogers had done for helen keller whom he called the most marvelous person of her sex that has existed on this earth since joan of arc then he said that is not all mr rogers has done but you never see that side of his character because it is never protruding but he lends a helping hand daily out of that generous heart of his you never hear of it but he is supposed to be a moon which has one side dark and the other bright but the other side though you don't see it is not dark it is bright and its rays penetrate and others do see it who are not god i would take this opportunity to tell something that i have never been allowed to tell by mr rogers either by my mouth or in print and if i don't look at him i can tell it now in eighteen ninety four when the publishing company of charles l webster of which i was financial agent failed it left me heavily in debt if you will remember what commerce was at that time you will recall that you could not sell anything and could not buy anything and i was on my back my books were not worth anything at all and i could not give away my copyrights mr rogers had long enough vision ahead to say 
Your books have supported you before, and after the panic is over they will support you again. And that was a correct proposition. He saved my copyrights, and saved me from financial ruin. He it was who arranged with my creditors to allow me to roam the face of the earth and persecute the nations thereof with lectures, promising at the end of four years I would pay dollar for dollar. That arrangement was made, otherwise I would now be living out of doors, under an umbrella, and a borrowed one at that. You see his white mustache and his hair trying to get white. He is always trying to look like me. I don't blame him for that. These are only emblematic of his character, and that is all. I say, without exception, hair and all, he is the whitest man I have ever known. This had been early in April. Something more than a month later, Clemens was making a business trip to New York to see Mr. Rogers. I was telephoned early to go up and look over some matters with him before he started. I do not remember why I was not to go along that day, for I usually made such trips with him. I think it was planned that Miss Clemens, who was in the city, was to meet him at the Grand Central Station. At all events, she did meet him there, with the news that, during the night, Mr. Rogers had suddenly died. This was May twentieth, 1909. The news had already come to the house, and I had lost no time in preparation to follow by the next train. I joined him at the Grosvenor Hotel on Fifth Avenue and Tenth Street. He was upset and deeply troubled by the loss of his staunch adviser and friend. He had a helpless look, and he said his friends were dying away from him and leaving him adrift. And how I hate to do anything, he added, that requires the least modicum of intelligence. We remained at the Grosvenor for Mr. Rogers' funeral. Clemens served as one of the pallbearers, but he did not feel equal to the trip to Fairhaven. He wanted to be very quiet, he said. He could not undertake to travel that distance among those whom he knew so well, and with whom he must of necessity join in conversation. So we remained in the hotel apartment, reading and saying very little until bedtime. Once he asked me to write a letter to Jean. Say, your father says every little while, how glad I am that Jean is at home again. For that is true, and I think of it all the time. But by and by, after a long period of silence, he said, Mr. Rogers is under the ground now. And so passed out of earthly affairs the man who had contributed so largely to the comfort of Mark Twain's old age. He was a man of fine sensibilities and generous impulses, with all a keen sense of humor. One Christmas, when he presented Mark Twain with a watch and a match case, he wrote, My dear Clemens, for many years your friends have been complaining of your use of tobacco both as to quantity and quality. Complaints are now coming in of your use of time. Most of your friends think that you are using your supply somewhat lavishly, but the chief complaint is in regard to the quality. I have been appealed to in the meantime, and have concluded that it is impossible to get the right kind of time from a blacking box. Therefore, I take the liberty of sending you herewith a machine that will furnish only the best. Please use it with the kind wishes of yours truly, H. H. Rogers. P.S. Complaint has also been made in regard to the furrows you make in your trousers in scratching matches. You will find a furrow on the bottom of the article enclosed. 
please use it compliments of the season to the family he was a man too busy to write many letters but when he did write to clemens at least they were always playful and unhurried one reading them would not find it easy to believe that the writer was a man on whose shoulders lay the burdens of stupendous finance burdens so heavy that at last he was crushed beneath their weight end of chapter 278 the death of henry rogers read by john greenman section 68 of mark twain a biography part 2 1907 to 1910 this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne chapter 279 an extension of copyright one of the pleasant things that came to mark twain that year was the passage of a copyright bill which added to the royalty period an extension of fourteen years champ clark had been largely instrumental in the success of this measure and had been fighting for it steadily since mark twain's visit to washington in nineteen o six following that visit clark wrote it the original bill would never pass because the bill had literature and music all mixed together being a missourian of course it would give me great pleasure to be of service to you what i want to say is this you have prepared a simple bill relating only to the copyright of books send it to me and i will try to have it passed clemens replied that he might have something more to say on the copyright question by and by that he had in hand a dialogue similar to the open letter to the register of copyrights north american review january nineteen o five which would instruct congress but this he did not complete meantime a simple bill was proposed and in early nineteen o nine it became a law in june clark wrote dr samuel l clemens stormfield redding connecticut my dear doctor i am gradually becoming myself again after a period of exhaustion that almost approximated prostration after a long lecture tour last summer i went immediately into a hard campaign as soon as the election was over and i had recovered my disposition i came here and went into those tariff hearings which began shortly after breakfast each day and sometimes lasted until midnight listening patiently and meekly withal to the lying of tariff barons for many days and nights was followed by the work of the long session that was followed by a hot campaign to take uncle joe's rules away from him on the heels of that campaign that failed came the tariff fight in the house i am now getting time to breathe regularly and i am writing to ask you if the copyright law is acceptable to you if it is not acceptable to you i want to ask you to write and tell me how it should be changed and i will give my best endeavors to the work i believe that your ideas and wishes in the matter constitute the best guide we have as to what should be done in the case your friend champ clark to this clemens replied stormfield Reading, Connecticut, June fifth, nineteen o nine. Dear Champ Clark, is the new copyright law acceptable to me? Emphatically, yes. Clark, it is the only sane and clearly defined and just and righteous copyright law that has ever existed in the united states whosoever will compare it with its predecessors will have no trouble in arriving at that decision the bill which was before the committee two years ago when i was down there was the most stupefying jumble of conflicting and apparently irreconcilable interests that was ever seen and we all said the case is hopeless absolutely hopeless out of this chaos nothing can be built but we were in 
error. Out of that chaotic mass this excellent bill has been constructed. The warring interests have been reconciled, and the result is as comely and substantial a legislative edifice as lifts its domes and towers and protective lightning rods out of the statute book, I think. When I think of that other bill, which even the deity couldn't understand, and of this one, which even I can understand, I take off my hat to the man or men who devised this one. Was it R. U. Johnson? Was it the Authors' League? Was it both together? I don't know, but I take off my hat anyway. Johnson has written a valuable article about the new law. I enclose it. At last, at last and for the first time in copyright history, we are ahead of England, ahead of her in two ways, by length of time and by fairness to all interests concerned. Does this sound like shouting? Then I must modify it. All we possessed of copyright justice before the 4th of last March we owed to England's initiative. Truly yours, S. L. Clemens. Clemens had prepared what was the final word on the subject of copyright just before this bill was passed, a petition for a law which he believed would regulate the whole matter. It was a generous, even if a somewhat utopian, plan, eminently characteristic of its author. The new fourteen-year extension, with the prospect of more, made this or any other compromise seem inadvisable. The reader may consider this last copyright document by Mark Twain under Appendix N at the end of this volume. End of Chapter 279 An Extension of Copyright Read by John Greenman Section 69 of Mark Twain, A Biography Part 2, 1907-1910 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Chapter 280 A Warning Clemens had promised to go to Baltimore for the graduation of Francesca of his London visit in 1907 and to make a short address to her class. It was the 8th of June when we set out on this journey. The reader may remember that it was the 8th of June, 1867, that Mark Twain sailed for the Holy Land. It was the 8th of June, 1907, that he sailed for England to take his Oxford degree. This 8th of June, 1909, was at least slightly connected with both events, for he was keeping an engagement made with Francesca in London, and my notes show that he discussed, on the way to the station, some incidents of his Holy Land trip and his attitude at that time toward Christian traditions. As he rarely mentioned the Quaker City trip, the coincidence seems rather curious. It is most unlikely that Clemens himself in any way associated the two dates. But the day was rather bleak, and there was a chilly rain. Clemens had a number of errands to do in New York, and we drove from one place to another attending to them. Finally, in the afternoon, the rain ceased, and while I was arranging some matters for him, he concluded to take a ride on the top of a Fifth Avenue stage. It was fine and pleasant when he started, but the weather thickened again, and when he returned he complained that he had felt a little chilly. He seemed in fine condition, however, next morning, and was in good spirits all the way to Baltimore. Chauncey Depew was on the train, and they met in the dining car, the last time, I think, they ever saw each other. He was tired when we reached the Belvedere Hotel in Baltimore, and did not wish to see the newspaper men. It happened that the reporters had a special purpose in coming just at this time, for it had suddenly developed that in his Shakespeare book, through an oversight, due to haste in publication, full credit had not been given to Mr. Greenwood for the long extracts quoted from his work. 
the sensational headlines in a morning paper is mark twain a plagiarist had naturally prompted the newspaper men to see what he would have to say on the subject it was a simple matter easily explained and clemens himself was less disturbed about it than anybody he felt no sense of guilt he said and the fact that he had been stealing and caught at it would give mr greenwood's book far more advertising than if he had given him the full credit which he had intended he found a good deal of amusement in the situation his only worry being that clara and jean would see the paper and be troubled he had taken off his clothes and was lying down reading after a little he got up and began walking up and down the room presently he stopped and facing me placed his hand upon his breast he said i think i must have caught a little cold yesterday on that fifth avenue stage i have a curious pain in my breast i suggested that he lie down again and i would fill his hot water bag the pain passed away presently and he seemed to be dozing i stepped into the next room and busied myself with some writing by and by i heard him stirring again and went in where he was he was walking up and down and began talking of some recent ethnological discoveries something relating to prehistoric man what a fine boy that prehistoric man must have been he said the very first one think of the gaudy style of him how he must have lorded it over those other creatures walking on his hind legs waving his arms practicing and getting ready for the pulpit the fancy amused him but presently he paused in his walk and again put his hand on his breast saying that pain has come back it's a curious sickening deadly kind of pain i never had anything just like it it seemed to me that his face had become rather gray i said where is it exactly mr clemens he laid his hand in the center of his breast and said it is here and it is very peculiar indeed remotely in my mind occurred the thought that he had located his heart and the peculiar deadly pain he had mentioned seemed ominous i suggested however that it was probably some rheumatic touch and this opinion seemed warranted when a few moments later the hot water had again relieved it this time the pain had apparently gone to stay for it did not return while we were in baltimore it was the first positive manifestation of the angina which eventually would take him from us the weather was pleasant in baltimore and his visit to st timothy's school and his address there were the kind of diversions that meant most to him the flock of girls all in their pretty commencement dresses assembled and rejoicing at his playfully given advice not to smoke to excess not to drink to excess not to marry to excess he standing there in a garb as white as their own it made a rare picture a sweet memory and it was the last time he ever gave advice from the platform to anyone edward s martin also spoke to the school and then there was a great feasting in the big assembly hall it was on the lawn that a reporter approached him with the news of the death of edward everett hale another of the old group clemens said thoughtfully after a moment i had the greatest respect and esteem for edward everett hale the greatest admiration for his work i am grieved to hear of his death as i can ever be to hear of the death of any friend though my grief is always tempered with the satisfaction of knowing that for the one that goes the hard bitter struggle of life is ended we were leaving the belvedere next morning and when the subject of breakfast came up for discussion he said that was the most delicious baltimore fried chicken we had yesterday morning i think we'll just repeat that order it reminds me of 
john quarles farm we had been having our meals served in the rooms but we had breakfast that morning down in the dining room and francesca and her mother were there as he stood on the railway platform waiting for the train he told me how once fifty-five years before as a boy of eighteen he had changed cars there for washington and had barely caught his train the crowd yelling at him as he ran we remained overnight in new york and that evening at the grosvenor he read aloud a poem of his own which i had not seen before he had brought it along with some intention of reading it at st timothy's he said but had not found the occasion suitable i wrote it a long time ago in paris i'd been reading aloud to mrs clemens and susie in ninety three i think about lord clive and warren hastings from macaulay how great they were and how far they fell then i took an imaginary case that of some old demented man mumbling of his former state i described him and repeated some of his mumblings susie and mrs clemens said write it so i did by and by and this is it i call it the derelict he read in his effective manner that fine poem the opening stanza of which follows you sneer you ships that pass me by your snow pure canvas towering proud you traders base why once such fry paid reverence when like a cloud storm swept i drove along my admiral at post his pennon blew faint in the wilderness of sky my long yards bristling with my gallant crew my ports flung wide my guns displayed my tall spars hid in bellying sail you struck your topsails then and made obeisance now your manners fail he had employed rhyme with more facility than was usual for him and the figure and phrasing were full of vigor it is strong and fine i said when he had finished yes he assented it seems so as i read it now it is so long since i have seen it that it is like reading another man's work i should call it good i believe he put the manuscript in his bag and walked up and down the floor talking there is no figure for the human being like the ship he said no such figure for the storm-beaten human drift as the derelict such men as clive and hastings could only be imagined as derelicts adrift helpless tossed by every wind and tide we returned to reading next day on the train going home he fell to talking of books and authors mainly of the things he had never been able to read when i take up one of jane austen's books he said such as pride and prejudice i feel like a barkeeper entering the kingdom of heaven i know what his sensation would be and his private comments he would not find the place to his taste and he would probably say so he recalled again how steniak had come to hartford and how humiliated mrs clemens had been to confess that her husband was not familiar with the writings of thackeray and others i don't know anything about anything he said mournfully and never did my brother used to try to get me to read dickens long ago i couldn't do it i was ashamed but i couldn't do it yes i have read the tale of two cities and 
could do it again. I have read it a good many times, but I never could stand Meredith and most of the other celebrities. By and by he handed me the Saturday Times Review, saying, Here is a fine poem, a great poem, I think. I can stand that. It was the Palatine in the Dark Ages by Willis Siebert Cather, reprinted from McClure's. The reader will understand better than I can express why these lofty opening stanzas appealed to Mark Twain. THE PALATINE Have you been with the king to Rome, brother, big brother? I've been there, and I've come home, back to your play, little brother. Oh, how high is Caesar's house, brother, big brother? Goats about the doorway's brows, night-hawks nest in the burnt roof-tree, home of the wild bird and home of the bee. A thousand chambers of marble lie wide to the sun and the wind and the sky. Poppies we find amongst our wheat grow on Caesar's banquet seat. Cattle crop and neat herds drowse on the floors of Caesar's house. But what has become of Caesar's gold, brother, big brother? The times are bad, and the world is old. Who knows the where of the Caesar's gold? Night comes black on the Caesar's hill. The wells are deep, and the tales are ill. Fireflies gleam in the damp and mold all that is left of the Caesar's gold. Back to your play, little brother. Farther along in our journey he handed me the paper again, pointing to these lines of Kipling. How is it not good for the Christian's health to hurry the Aryan brown, for the Christian riles and the Aryan smiles, and he weareth the Christian down? and the end of the fight is a tombstone white and the name of the late deceased and the epitaph drear a fool lies here who tried to hustle the east i could stand any amount of that he said and presently life is too long and too short too long for the weariness of it, too short for the work to be done. At the very most, the average mind can only master a few languages and a little history. I said, Still, we need not worry. If death ends all, it does not matter, and if life is eternal, there will be time enough. Yes, he assented, rather grimly, that optimism of yours is always ready to turn hell's backyard into a playground. I said that, old as I was, I had taken up the study of French, and mentioned Bayard Taylor's having begun Greek at fifty, expecting to need it in heaven. Clemens said reflectively, Yes, but, you see, that was Greek. End of chapter 280 A Warning Read by John Greenman Section 70 of Mark Twain, A Biography Part 2, 1907-1910 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography By Albert Bigelow Payne Chapter 281 the last summer at Stormfield. I was at Stormfield pretty constantly during the rest of that year. At first I went up only for the day, but later, when his health did not improve and when he expressed a wish for companionship evenings, I remained most of the nights as well. Our rooms were separated only by a bathroom, and as neither of us was much given to sleep, there was likely to be talk or reading aloud at almost any hour when both were awake. In the very early morning I would usually slip in, softly, 
sometimes to find him propped up against his pillows, sound asleep, his glasses on, the reading lamp blazing away, as it usually did, day or night. But as often as not he was awake, and would have some new plan or idea of which he was eager to be delivered, and there was always interest and nearly always amusement in it, even if it happened to be three in the morning or earlier. Sometimes, when he thought it time for me to be stirring, he would call softly, but loudly enough for me to hear, if awake, and I would go in, and we would settle again problems of life and death and science, or rather he would settle them, while I dropped in a remark here and there, merely to hold the matter a little longer in solution. The pains in his breast came back, and with a good deal of frequency as the summer advanced. Also they became more severe. Dr. Edward Quintard came up from New York, and did not hesitate to say that the trouble proceeded chiefly from the heart, and counseled diminished smoking with less active exercise, advising particularly against Clemens's lifetime habit of lightly skipping up and down stairs. There was no prohibition as to billiards, however, or leisurely walking, and we played pretty steadily through those peaceful summer days, and often took a walk down into the meadows or perhaps in the other direction, when it was not too warm or windy. Once we went as far as the river, and I showed him a part of his land he had not seen before, a beautiful cedar hillside, remote and secluded, a place of enchantment. On the way I pointed out a little corner of land which earlier he had given me to straighten our division line. I told him I was going to build a study on it and call it Markland. He thought it an admirable building site, and I think he was pleased with the name. Later he said, If you had a place for that extra billiard table of mine, the Rogers table which had been left in New York, I would turn it over to you. I replied that I could adapt the size of my proposed study to fit a billiard table, and he said, Now that will be very good. Then when I want exercise, I can walk down and play billiards with you, and when you want exercise, you can walk up and play billiards with me you must build that study. So it was, we planned, and by and by Mr. Lonsbury had undertaken the work. During the walks Clemens rested a good deal. There were the New England hills to climb, and then he found that he tired easily, and that weariness sometimes brought on the pain. As I remember now, I think how bravely he bore it. It must have been a deadly, sickening, numbing pain, for I have seen it crumble him, and his face become colorless while his hand dug at his breast. But he never complained, he never bewailed, and at billiards he would persist in going on and playing in his turn, even while he was bowed with the anguish of the attack. We had found that a glass of very hot water relieved it, and we kept always a thermos bottle or two filled and ready. At the first hint from him I would pour out a glass and another, and sometimes the relief came quickly. But there were times, and alas, they came oftener, when that deadly gripping did not soon release him. Yet there would come a week or a fortnight when he was apparently perfectly well, and at such times we dismissed the thought of any heart malady, and attributed the whole trouble to acute indigestion, from which he had always suffered, more or less. We were alone together most of the time, he did not appear to care for company that summer. Clara Clemens had a concert tour in prospect, and her father, eager for her success, encouraged her to devote a large part of her time to study. For Jean, who was in love with every form of outdoor and animal life, he had established headquarters in a vacant farmhouse on one corner of the estate, where she had collected some stock and poultry, and was overflowingly happy. Osip Gabrilovich was a guest in the house a good portion of the summer, but had been invalided through severe surgical operations, and for a long time rarely appeared, even at mealtimes. So it came about that there could hardly have been a closer daily companionship than was ours 
during this the last year of mark twain's life for me of course nothing can ever be like it again in this world one is not likely to associate twice with a being from another star end of chapter two hundred and eighty one the last summer at stormfield read by john greenman section seventy one of mark twain a biography part two nineteen o seven to nineteen ten this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow Payne. chapter two hundred and eighty two personal memoranda in the notes i made of this period i caught a little drift of personality and utterance and i do not know better how to preserve these things than to give them here as nearly as may be in the sequence and in the form in which they were set down one of the first of these entries occurs in june when clemens was re-reading with great interest and relish andrew d white's science and theology which he called a lovely book a history of the warfare of science with theology in christendom june twenty first a peaceful afternoon and we walked farther than usual, resting at last in the shade of a tree in the lane that leads to Jean's farmhouse. I picked a dandelion ball with some remark about its being one of the evidences of the intelligent principle in nature, the seeds winged for a wider distribution. Yes, he said, those are the great evidences. No one who reasons can doubt them. And presently he added, that is a most amusing book of White's. When you read it, you see how those old theologians never reasoned at all. White tells of an old bishop who figured out that God created the world in an instant on a certain day in October, exactly so many years before Christ and proved it. And I knew a preacher myself once who declared that the fossils in the rocks proved nothing as to the age of the world. He said that God could create the rocks with those fossils in them for ornaments if he wanted to. Why, it takes twenty years to build a little island in the Mississippi River, and that man actually believed that God created the whole world and all that's in it in six days. White tells of another bishop who gave two new reasons for thunder, one being that God wanted to show the world his power, and another that he wished to frighten sinners to repent. Now, consider the proportions of that conception, even in the pettiest way you can think of. Consider the idea of God thinking of all that. Consider the President of the United States wanting to impress the flies and fleas and mosquitoes getting up on the dome of the capitol and beating a bass drum and setting off red fire he followed the theme a little further then we made our way slowly back up the long hill he holding to my arm and resting here and there but arriving at the house seemingly fresh and ready for billiards june twenty third I came up this morning with a basket of strawberries. He was walking up and down, looking like an ancient Roman. He said, Consider the case of Elsie Siegel, granddaughter of General Franz Siegel. She was mysteriously murdered while engaged in settlement work among the Chinese. What a ghastly ending to any life! Then turning upon me fiercely, he continued, Anybody that knows anything, knows that there was not a single life that was ever lived that was worth living. 
not a single child ever begotten that the begetting of it was not a crime suppose a community of people to be living on the slope of a volcano directly under the crater and in the path of lava flow that volcano has been breaking out right along for ages and is certain to break out again they do not know when it will break out but they know it will do it that much can be counted on suppose those people go to a community in a far neighborhood and say we'd like to change places with you come take our homes and let us have yours those people would say never mind we are not interested in your country we know what has happened there and what will happen again we don't care to live under the blow that is likely to fall at any moment and yet every time we bring a child into the world we are bringing it to a country to a community gathered under the crater of a volcano knowing that sooner or later death will come and that before death there will be catastrophes infinitely worse formerly it was much worse than now for before the ministers abolished hell a man knew when he was begetting a child that he was begetting a soul that had only one chance in a hundred of escaping the eternal fires of damnation he knew that in all probability that child would be brought to damnation one of the ninety-nine black sheep but since hell has been abolished death has become more welcome i wrote a fairy story once it was published somewhere i don't remember just what it was now but the substance of it was that a fairy gave a man the customary wishes i was interested in seeing what he would take first he chose wealth and went away with it but it did not bring him happiness then he came back for the second selection and chose fame and that did not bring happiness either finally he went to the fairy and chose death and the fairy said in substance if you hadn't been a fool you'd have chosen that in the first place the papers called me a pessimist for writing that story pessimist the man who isn't a pessimist is a damn fool but this was one of his savage humors stirred by tragic circumstance under date of july fifth i find this happier entry we have invented a new game three ball carom billiards each player continuing until he has made five counting the number of his shots as in golf the one who finishes in the fewer shots wins it is a game we play with almost exactly equal skill and he is highly pleased with it he said this afternoon i have never enjoyed billiards as i do now i look forward to it every afternoon as my reward at the end of a good day's work his work at this time was an article on marjorie fleming the wonder child whose quaint writings and brief little life had been published to the world by dr john brown clemens always adored the thought of marjorie and in this article one can see that she ranked almost next to joan of arc in his affections we went out in the loggia by and by 
and Clemens read aloud from a book which Professor Zubelin left here a few days ago, The Religion of a Democrat. Something in it must have suggested to Clemens his favorite science, for presently he said, I have been reading an old astronomy. It speaks of the perfect line of curvature of the earth in spite of mountains and abysses, and I have imagined a man three hundred thousand miles high picking up a ball like the earth and looking at it and holding it in his hand. It would be about like a billiard ball to him, and he would turn it over in his hand and rub it with his thumb, and where he rubbed over the mountain ranges, he might say, there seems to be some slight roughness here, but I can't detect it with my eye. It seems perfectly smooth to look at. The Himalayas to him, the highest peak, would be one sixty thousandth of his height, or about the one thousandth part of an inch as compared with the average man. I spoke of having somewhere read of some very tiny satellites, one as small perhaps as six miles in diameter, yet a genuine world. Could a man live on a world so small as that? I asked. Oh, yes, he said. The gravitation that holds it together would hold him on, and he would always seem upright, the same as here. His horizon would be smaller, but even if he were six feet tall, he would only have one foot for each mile of that world's diameter. So, you see, he would be little enough, even for a world, that he could walk around in half a day. He talked astronomy a great deal, marvel astronomy. He had no real knowledge of the subject, and I had none of any kind, which made its ungraspable facts all the more thrilling. He was always thrown into a sort of ecstasy by the unthinkable distances of space, the supreme drama of the universe. The fact that Alpha Centauri was twenty-five trillions of miles away, two hundred and fifty thousand times the distance of our own remote sun, and that our solar system was traveling as a whole toward the bright star Vega in the constellation of Lyra at the rate of forty-four miles a second, yet would be thousands upon thousands of years reaching its destination, fairly enraptured him. The astronomical light-year, that is to say the distance which light travels in a year, was one of the things which he loved to contemplate. But he declared that no two authorities ever figured it alike, and that he was going to figure it out for himself. I came in one morning to find that he had covered several sheets of paper with almost interminable rows of ciphers, and with a result, to him at least, entirely satisfactory. I am quite certain that he was prouder of those figures and their enormous aggregate than if he had just completed an immortal tale, and when he added that the nearest fixed star, Alpha Centauri, was between four and five light-years distant from the earth, and that there was no possible way to think that distance in miles, or even any calculable fraction of it, his glasses shone, and his hair was roached up as with the stimulation of these stupendous facts. By and by, he said, I came in with Halley's Comet in 1835. It is coming again next year, and I expect to go out with it. It will be the greatest disappointment of my life if I don't go out with Halley's Comet. The Almighty has said, no doubt, now here are these two unaccountable freaks. They came in together. They must go out together. Oh, I am looking forward to that. And a little later he added, I've got some kind of a heart disease, 
and quintard won't tell me whether it is the kind that carries a man off in an instant or keeps him lingering along and suffering for twenty years or so i was in hopes that quintard would tell me that i was likely to drop dead any minute but he didn't he only told me that my blood pressure was too strong he didn't give me any schedule but i expect to go with haley's comet i seem to have omitted making any entries for a few days but among his notes i find this entry which seems to refer to some discussion of a favorite philosophy and has a special interest of its own july fourteenth nineteen o nine yesterday's dispute resumed i still maintaining that whereas we can think we generally don't do it don't do it and don't have to do it we are automatic machines which act unconsciously from morning till sleeping time all day long all day long our machinery is doing things from habit and instinct and without requiring any help or attention from our poor little seven by nine thinking apparatus this reminded me of something thirty years ago in hartford the billiard room was my study and i wrote my letters there the first thing every morning my table lay two points off the starboard bow of the billiard table and the door of exit and entrance bore northeast by east half east from that position consequently you could see the door across the length of the billiard table but you couldn't see the floor by the said table i found i was always forgetting to ask intruders to carry my letters downstairs for the mail so i concluded to lay them on the floor by the door then the intruder would have to walk over them and that would indicate to him what they were there for did it <laughs> no it didn't he was a machine and had habits habits take precedence of thought now consider this a stamped and addressed letter lying on the floor lying aggressively and conspicuously on the floor is an unusual spectacle so unusual a spectacle that you would think an intruder couldn't see it there without immediately divining that it was not there by accident but had been deliberately placed there and for a definite purpose very well it may surprise you to learn that that most simple and most natural and obvious thought would never occur to any intruder on this planet whether he be fool half fool or the most brilliant of thinkers for he is always an automatic machine and has habits and his habits will act before his thinking apparatus can get a chance to exert its powers my scheme failed because every human being has the habit of picking up any apparently misplaced thing and placing it where it won't be stepped on my first intruder was george he went and came without saying anything presently i found the letters neatly piled up on the billiard table i was astonished i put them on the floor again the next intruder 
piled them on the billiard table without a word i was profoundly moved profoundly interested so i set the trap again also again and again and yet again all day long i caught every member of the family and every servant also i caught the three finest intellects in the town in every instance old time-worn automatic habit got in its work so promptly that the thinking apparatus never got a chance i do not remember this particular discussion but i do distinctly recall being one of those whose intelligence was not sufficient to prevent my picking up the letter he had thrown on the floor in front of his bed and being properly classified for doing it clemens no longer kept notebooks as in an earlier time but set down innumerable memoranda comments stray reminders and the like on small pads and bunches of these tiny sheets accumulated on his table and about his room i gathered up many of them then and afterward and a few of these characteristic bits may be offered here knee it is at our mother's knee that we acquire our noblest and truest and highest ideals but there is seldom any money in them jehovah he is all good he made man for hell or hell for man one or the other take your choice he made it hard to get into heaven and easy to get into hell he commended man to multiply and replenish what hell modesty antedates clothes and will be resumed when clothes are no more the latter part of this aphorism is erased and underneath it he adds modesty died when clothes were born modesty died when false modesty was born history a historian who would convey the truth has got to lie often he must enlarge the truth by diameters otherwise his reader would not be able to see it morals are not the important thing nor enlightenment nor civilization a man can do absolutely well without them but he can't do without something to eat the supremest thing is the needs of the body not of the mind and spirit suggestion there is conscious suggestion and there is unconscious suggestion both come from outside whence all ideas come duels i think i could wipe out a dishonor by crippling the other man but i don't see how i could do it by letting him cripple me i have no feeling of animosity toward people who do not believe as i do i merely do not respect them in some serious matters religion i would have them burnt i am old now and once was a sinner i often think of it with a kind of soft regret i trust my days are numbered i would not have that detail overlooked she was always a girl she was always young because her heart was young and i was young because she lived in my heart and preserved its youth from decay he often busied himself working out more extensively some of the ideas that came to him moral ideas he called them 
one fancy which he followed in several forms some of them not within the privilege of print was that of an inquisitive little girl bessie who pursues her mother with difficult questionings under appendix w at the end of this volume the reader will find one of the bessie dialogues he read these aloud as he finished them and it is certain that they lacked neither logic nor humor sometimes he went to a big drawer in his dresser where he kept his finished manuscripts and took them out and looked over them and read parts of them aloud and talked of the plans he had had for them and how one idea after another had been followed for a time and had failed to satisfy him in the end two fiction schemes that had always possessed him he had been unable to bring to any conclusion both of these have been mentioned in former chapters one being the notion of a long period of dream existence during a brief moment of sleep and the other being the story of a mysterious visitant from another realm he had experimented with each of these ideas in no less than three forms and there was fine writing and dramatic narrative in all but his literary architecture had somehow fallen short of his conception the mysterious stranger in one of its forms i thought might be satisfactorily concluded and he admitted that he could probably end it without much labor he discussed something of his plans and later i found the notes for its conclusion but i suppose he was beyond the place where he could take up those old threads though he contemplated fondly enough the possibility and recalled how he had read at least one form of the dream tale to howells who had urged him to complete it end of chapter two hundred and eighty two personal memoranda read by john greenman section seventy two of mark twain a biography part two nineteen o seven to nineteen ten this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne chapter two hundred and eighty three astronomy and dreams august fifth nineteen o nine this morning i noticed on a chair a copy of flaubert's salambo which i recently lent him i asked if he liked it no he said i didn't like any of it but you read it yes i read every line of it you admitted its literary art well it's like this if i should go to the chicago stock yards and they should kill a beef and cut it up and the blood should splash all over everything and then they should take me to another pen and kill another beef and the blood should splash over everything again and so on to pen after pen i should care for it about as much as i do for that book but those were bloody days and you care very much for that period in history yes that is so but when i read tacitus and know that i am reading history i can accept it as such and supply the imaginary details and enjoy it but this thing is such a continuous procession of blood and slaughter and stench it worries me it has great art i can see that that scene of the crucified lions and the death cannon and the tent scene are marvelous but i wouldn't read that book again without a salary august sixteenth he is reading sautonius which he already knows by heart so full of the cruelties and licentiousness of imperial rome this afternoon he began talking about claudius they called claudius a lunatic he said but i just see what nice fancies he had he would go to the arena between times and have captives and wild beasts brought out and turned in together for his special enjoyment sometimes when 
there were no captives on hand, he would say, Well, never mind. Bring out a carpenter. Carpentering around the arena wasn't a popular job in those days. He went visiting once to a province and thought it would be pleasant to see how they disposed of criminals and captives in their crude old-fashioned way but there was no executioner on hand no matter the emperor of rome was in no hurry he would wait so he sat down and stayed there until an executioner came i said how do you account for the changed attitude toward these things we are filled with pity today at the thought of torture and suffering ah but that is because we have drifted that way and exercised the quality of compassion relax a muscle and it soon loses its vigor relax that quality and in two generations in one generation we should be gloating over the spectacle of blood and torture just the same why i read somewhere a letter written just before the lisbon catastrophe in seventeen fifty five about a scene on the public square of lisbon a lot of stakes with the faggots piled for burning and heretics chained for burning the square was crowded with men and women and children and when those fires were lighted and the heretics began to shriek and writhe those men and women and children laughed so they were fairly beside themselves with the enjoyment of the scene the greeks don't seem to have done these things i suppose that indicates earlier advancement in compassion colonel harvey and mr danica came up to spend the night mr clemens had one of his seizures during the evening they come oftener and last longer one last night continued for an hour and a half i slept there september seventh today news of the north pole discovery by peary five days ago the same discovery was reported by cook clemens comment it's the greatest joke of the ages but a moment later he referred to the stupendous fact of arcturus being fifty thousand times as big as the sun september twenty first this morning he told me with great glee the dream he had had just before wakening he said i was in an automobile going slowly with a little girl beside me and some uniformed person walking along by us i said i'll get out and walk too but the officer replied this is only one of the smallest of our fleet then i noticed that the automobile had no front and there were two cannons mounted where the front should be i noticed too that we were traveling very low almost down on the ground presently we got to the bottom of a hill and started up another and i found myself walking ahead of the mobile i turned around to look for the little girl and instead of her i found a kitten capering beside me and when we reached the top of the hill we were looking out over a most barren and desolate waste of sand heaps without a speck of vegetation anywhere and the kitten said this view beggars all admiration then all at once we were in a great group of people and i undertook to repeat to them the kitten's remark but when i tried to do it 
the words were so touching that i broke down and cried and all the group cried too over the kitten's moving remark the joy with which he told this absurd sleep fancy made it supremely ridiculous and we laughed until tears really came one morning he said i was awake a good deal in the night and i tried to think of interesting things i got to working out geological periods trying to think of some way to comprehend them and then astronomical periods of course it's impossible but i thought of a plan that seemed to mean something to me i remembered that neptune is two billion eight hundred million miles away that of course is incomprehensible but then there is the nearest fixed star with its twenty-five trillion miles twenty-five trillion or nearly a thousand times as far and then i took this book and counted the lines on a page and i found that there was an average of thirty-two lines to the page and two hundred and forty pages and i figured out that counting the distance to neptune as one line there were still not enough lines in the book by nearly two thousand to reach the nearest fixed star and somehow that gave me a sort of dim idea of the vastness of the distance and kind of journey into space later i figured out another method of comprehending a little of that great distance by estimating the existence of the human race at thirty thousand years lord kelvin's figures and the average generation to have been thirty-three years with a world population of one billion five hundred million souls i assumed the nearest fixed star to be the first station in paradise and the first soul to have started thirty thousand years ago traveling at the rate of about thirty miles a second it would just now be arriving in alpha centauri with all the rest of that buried multitude stringing out behind at an average distance of twenty miles apart few things gave him more pleasure than the contemplation of such figures as these we made occasional business trips to new york and during one of them visited the museum of natural history to look at the brontosaur and the meteorites and the astronomical model in the entrance hall to him these were the most fascinating things in the world he contemplated the meteorites and the brontosaur and lost himself in strange and marvelous imaginings concerning the far reaches of time and space whence they had come down to us mark twain lived curiously apart from the actualities of life dwelling mainly among his philosophies and speculations he observed vaguely or minutely what went on about him but in either case the fact took a place not in the actual world but in a world within his consciousness or subconsciousness a place where facts were likely to assume new and altogether different relations from those they had borne in the physical occurrence it not infrequently happened therefore when he recounted some incident even the most recent that history took on fresh and startling forms more than once i have known him to relate an occurrence of the day before with a reality of circumstance that carried absolute conviction when the details themselves were precisely reversed if his attention were called to the discrepancy his face would take on a blank look as of one suddenly aroused from dreamland 
to be followed by an almost childish interest in your revelation and ready acknowledgment of his mistake. I do not think such mistakes humiliated him, but they often surprised and, I think, amused him. Insubstantial and deceptive as was this inner world of his, to him it must have been much more real than the world of flitting physical shapes about him. He would fix you keenly with his attention, but you realized at last that he was placing you and seeing you not as a part of the material landscape, but as an item of his own inner world, a world in which philosophies and morals stood upright, a very good world indeed, but certainly a topsy-turvy world when viewed with the eye of mere literal scrutiny. And this was, mainly, of course, because the routine of life did not appeal to him. Even members of his household did not always stir his consciousness. He knew they were there. He could call them by name. He relied upon them. But his knowledge of them always suggested the knowledge that Mount Everest might have of the forests and caves and boulders upon its slopes, useful, perhaps, but hardly necessary to the giant's existence, and, in no important matter, a part of its greater life. End of chapter 283 Astronomy and Dreams Read by John Greenman Section 73 of Mark Twain, A Biography, Part 2, 1907 to 1910. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 284, A Library Concert. In a letter which Clemens wrote to Miss Wallace at this time, he tells of a concert given at Stormfield on September 21st for the benefit of the new Reading Library. Gabrilovich had so far recovered, and he was up and about and able to play. David Bispham, the great baritone, always genial and generous, agreed to take part, and Clara Clemens, already accustomed to public singing, was to join in the program. The letter to Miss Wallace supplies the rest of the history. We had a grand time here yesterday. Concert in aid of the little library. Team Gabrilovich, pianist, David Bispham, vocalist, Clara Clemens, ditto, Mark Twain, introducer of team, detachments and squads and groups and singles came from everywhere, Danbury, New Haven, Norwalk, Redding, Redding Ridge, Ridgefield, and even from New York some in sixty-horsepower motor-cars, some in buggies and carriages, and a swarm of farmer young folk on foot from miles around, five hundred and twenty-five altogether. If we hadn't stopped the sale of tickets a day and a half before the performance, we should have been swamped. We jammed a hundred and sixty into the library. Not quite all had seats. We filled the loggia, the dining room, the hall, clear into the billiard room, the stairs, and the brick paved square outside the dining room door. The artists were received with a great welcome, and it woke them up, and I tell you, they performed to the Queen's taste. The program was an hour and three quarters long, and the encores added a half hour to it. The enthusiasm of the house was hair-lifting. They all stayed an hour after the close to shake hands and congratulate. We had no dollar seats except in the library, but we accumulated $372 for the building fund. We had tea at half-past six for a dozen, 
the Hawthorns, Jeanette Gilder and her niece, etc., and, after eight o'clock dinner, we had a private concert and a ball in the bare-stripped library until ten. Nobody present but the team and Mr. and Mrs. Payne and Jean and her dog and me. Bispham did Danny Deaver and the Earl Koenig in his majestic great organ tones and artillery, and Gabrilovich played the accompaniments as they were never played before, I do suppose. There is not much to add to that account. Clemens introducing the performance was the gay feature of the occasion. He spoke of the great reputation of Bispham and Gabrilovich. Then he said, My daughter is not as famous as these gentlemen, but she is ever so much better looking. The music of the evening that followed, with Gabrilovich at the piano and David Bispham to sing, was something not likely ever to be repeated. Bispham sang the Erlkonig and Kili Kranki and the Grenadiers and several other songs. He spoke of having sung Wagner's arrangement of the Grenadiers at the composer's home following his death, and how none of the family had heard it before. There followed dancing, and Jean Clemens, fine and handsome, apparently full of life and health, danced down that great living room as carefree as if there was no shadow upon her life, and the evening was distinguished in another way, for before it ended Clara Clemens had promised Osip Gabrilovich to become his wife. End of chapter 284 A Library Concert Read by John Greenman Section 74 of Mark Twain, A Biography. Part 2, 1907 to 1910. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 285 A Wedding at Stormfield. The wedding of Osip Gabrilovich and Clara Clemens was not delayed. Gabrilovich had signed for a concert tour in Europe, and unless the marriage took place forthwith, it must be postponed many months. It followed, therefore, fifteen days after the engagement. They were busy days, Clemens enormously excited and pleased over the prospect of the first wedding in his family, personally attended to the selection of those who were to have announcement cards, employing a stenographer to make the list. October 6th was a perfect wedding day. It was one of those quiet, lovely fall days when the whole world seems at peace. Claude, the butler, with his usual skill in such matters, had decorated the great living room with gay autumn foliage and flowers, brought in mainly from the woods and fields. They blended perfectly with the warm tones of the walls and furnishings, and I do not remember ever having seen a more beautiful room. Only relatives and a few of the nearest friends were invited to the ceremony. The Twitchells came over a day ahead, for Twitchell, who had assisted in the marriage rites between Samuel Clemens and Olivia Langdon, was to perform that ceremony for their daughter now. A fellow student of the bride and groom, when they had been pupils of Leschetizky in Vienna, Miss Ethel Newcomb, was at the piano and played softly the wedding march from Tannhauser. Jean Clemens was the only bridesmaid, and she was stately and classically beautiful, with a proud dignity in her office. Jervis Langdon, the bride's cousin and childhood playmate, acted as best man, and Clemens, of course, gave the bride away. By request he wore his scarlet Oxford gown over his snowy flannels, and was splendid beyond words. I do not write of the appearance of the bride and groom, for brides and grooms are always handsome and always happy, and certainly these were no exception. It was all so soon over the feasting ended, and the principals whirling away into the future. I have a picture in my mind of them seated together in the automobile, with Richard Watson Gilder standing on the step for a last good-bye, and before them a wide expanse of autumn foliage and distant hills. I remember Gilder's voice saying, when the car was on the turn and they were waving back to us, 
over the hills and far away beyond the utmost purple rim beyond the night beyond the day through all the world she followed him the matter of the wedding had been kept from the newspapers until the eve of the wedding when the associated press had been notified a representative was there but clemens had characteristically interviewed himself on the subject and it was only necessary to hand the reporter a typewritten copy replying to the question put to himself are you pleased with the marriage he answered yes fully as much as any marriage could please me or any other father there are two or three solemn things in life and a happy marriage is one of them for the terrors of life are all to come i am glad of this marriage and mrs clemens would be glad for she always had a warm affection for gabrilovich there was another wedding at stormfield on the following afternoon an imitation wedding little joy came up with me and wished she could stand in just the spot where she had seen the bride stand and she expressed a wish that she could get married like that clemens said frankness is a jewel only the young can afford it then he happened to remember a ridiculous boy doll a white-haired creature with red coat and green trousers a souvenir imitation of himself from one of the rogerses christmas trees he knew where it was and he got it out then he said now joy we will have another wedding this is mr colonel williams and you are to become his wedded wife so joy stood up very gravely and clemens performed the ceremony and i gave the bride away and joy to him became mrs colonel williams thereafter and entered happily into her new estate end of chapter two hundred and eighty five a wedding at stormfield read by john greenman section seventy five of mark twain a biography part two nineteen o seven to nineteen ten this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Chapter 286 Autumn Days A harvest of letters followed the wedding, a general congratulatory expression mingled with admiration, affection, and goodwill. In his interview Clemens had referred to the pain in his heart and many begged him to deny that there was anything serious the matter with him, urging him to try this relief or that, pathetically eager for his continued life and health. They cited the comfort he had brought to world-weary humanity, and his unfailing stand for human justice as reasons why he should live. Such letters could not fail to cheer him. A letter of this period from John Bigelow gave him a pleasure of its own. Clemens had written Bigelow, apropos of some adverse expression on the tariff. "'Thank you for any hard word you can say about the tariff. I guess the government that robs its own people earns the future it is preparing for itself.' Bigelow was just then declining an invitation to the annual dinner of the Chamber of Commerce. In sending his regrets, he said, the sentiment I would propose, if I dare to be present, would be the words of Mark Twain, the statesman. The government that robs its own people earns the future it is preparing for itself. Now to Clemens himself he wrote, Rochefoucauld never said a cleverer thing, nor Dr. Franklin a wiser one. Be careful, or the demos will be running you for president when you are not on your guard. Yours more than ever, John Bigelow. Among the tributes that came was a sermon by the Reverend Fred Window Adams of Schenectady, New York, with Mark Twain as its subject. Mr. Adams chose for his text, Take Mark, and bring him with thee, for he is profitable for the ministry. And he placed the two Marks, st mark and mark twain side by side as ministers to humanity 
and characterized him as a fearless knight of righteousness. A few weeks later Mr. Adams himself came to Stormfield, and like all open-minded ministers of the gospel, he found that he could get on very well indeed with Mark Twain. In spite of the good will and the good wishes, Clemens' malady did not improve. As the days grew chillier, he found that he must remain closer indoors. The cold air seemed to bring on the pains, and they were gradually becoming more severe. Then, too, he did not follow the doctor's orders in the matter of smoking, nor altogether as to exercise. To Miss Wallace he wrote, I can't walk, I can't drive, I'm not downstairs much, and I don't see company, but I drink barrels of water to keep the pain quiet. I read and read and read and smoke and smoke and smoke all the time, as formerly, and it's a contented and comfortable life. But this was not altogether accurate as to details. He did come downstairs many times daily, and he persisted in billiards regardless of the paroxysms. We found, too, that the seizures were induced by mental agitation. One night he read aloud to Jean and myself the first chapter of an article, The Turning Point in My Life, which he was preparing for Harper's Bazaar. He had begun it with one of his impossible burlesque fancies, and he felt our attitude of disappointment even before any word had been said. Suddenly he rose, and, laying his hand on his breast, said, I must lie down, and started toward the stair. I supported him to his room, and hurriedly poured out the hot water. He drank it, and dropped back on the bed. Don't speak to me, he said. Don't make me talk. Jean came in, and we sat there several moments in silence. I think we both wondered if this might not be the end. But presently he spoke of his own accord, declaring he was better, and ready for billiards. We played for at least an hour afterward, and he seemed no worse for the attack. It is a curious malady, that angina. Even the doctors are acquainted with its manifestations rather than its cause. Clemens' general habits of body and mind were probably not such as to delay its progress. Furthermore, there had befallen him that year one of those misfortunes which his confiding nature peculiarly invited, a betrayal of trust by those in whom it had been boundlessly placed, and it seems likely that the resulting humiliation aggravated his complaint. The writing of a detailed history of this episode afforded him occupation and a certain amusement but probably did not contribute to his health. One day he sent for his attorney, Mr. Charles T. Lark, and made some final revisions in his will. Mark Twain's estate, later appraised at something more than $600,000, was left in the hands of trustees for his daughters. The trustees were Edward E. Loomis, Jervis Langdon, and Zoeth S. Freeman. The direction of his literary affairs was left to his daughter Clara and the writer of this history. To see him, you would never have suspected that he was ill. He was in good flesh, and his movement was as airy and his eye as bright and his face as full of bloom as at any time during the period I had known him. Also he was as light-hearted and full of ideas and plans, and he was even gentler, having grown mellow with age and retirement, like good wine. And, of course, he would find amusement in his condition. He said, I have always pretended to be sick to escape visitors. Now, for the first time, I have got a genuine excuse. It makes me feel so honest. And once, when Jean reported a caller in the living room, he said, Jean, I can't see her. Tell her I am likely to drop dead any minute, and it would be most embarrassing. But he did see her, for it was a poet, Angela Morgan, and he read her poem God's Man aloud with great feeling, and later he sold it for her to Collier's Weekly. He still had violent rages now and then, remembering some of the most notable of his mistakes, 
and once, after denouncing himself rather inclusively as an idiot, he said, I wish to God the lightning would strike me, but I've wished that fifty thousand times and never got anything out of it. I have missed several good chances. Mrs. Clemens was afraid of lightning and would never let me bear my head to the storm. The element of humor was never lacking, and the rages became less violent and less frequent. I was at Stormfield steadily now, and there was a regular routine of afternoon sessions of billiards or reading, in which we were generally alone, for Jean, occupied with her farming and her secretary labors, seldom appeared except at meal times. Occasionally she joined in the billiard games, but it was difficult learning and her interest was not great. She would have made a fine player, for she had a natural talent for games, as she had for languages, and she could have mastered the science of angles as she had mastered tennis and French and German and Italian. She had naturally a fine intellect with many of her father's characteristics, and a tender heart that made every dumb creature her friend. Katie Leary, who had been Jean's nurse, once told how, as a little child, Jean had not been particularly interested in a picture of the Lisbon earthquake, where the people were being swallowed up, but on looking at the next page, which showed a number of animals being overwhelmed, she had said, Poor things! Katie said, Why, you didn't say that about the people! But Jean answered, Oh, they could speak! One night at the dinner-table her father was saying how difficult it must be for a man who had led a busy life to give up the habit of work. "'That is why the Rogerses kill themselves,' he said. "'They would rather kill themselves in the old treadmill than stop and try to kill time. They have forgotten how to rest. They know nothing but to keep on till they drop. I told of something I had read not long before. It was about an aged lion that had broken loose from his cage at Coney Island. He had not offered to hurt anyone, but after wandering about a little rather aimlessly he had come to a picket fence, and a moment later began pacing up and down in front of it, just the length of his cage. They had come and led him back to his prison without trouble, and he had rushed eagerly into it. I noticed that Jean was listening anxiously, and when I finished she said, "'Is that a true story?' She had forgotten altogether the point in illustration. She was concerned only with the poor old beast that had found no joy in his liberty. Among the letters that Clemens wrote just then was one to Miss Wallace, in which he described the glory of the fall colors as seen from his windows. The autumn splendors passed you by. What a pity! I wish you had been here. It was beyond words. It was heaven and hell, and sunset and rainbows and the aurora, all fused into one divine harmony. And you couldn't look at it and keep the tears back such a singing together, and such a whispering together, and such a snuggling together of cozy, soft colors, and such kissing and caressing, and such pretty blushing when the sun breaks out and catches those dainty weeds at it. You remember that weed garden of mine? And then then the far hills sleeping in a dim blue trance oh hearing about it is nothing you should be here to see it in the same letter he refers to some work that he was writing for his own satisfaction letters from the earth said letters supposed to have been written by an immortal visitant and addressed to other immortals in some remote sphere I'll read passages to you. This book will never be published. In fact, it couldn't be, because it would be felony. 
Paine enjoys it, but Paine is going to be damned one of these days, I suppose. I very well remember his writing those letters from the earth. He read them to me from time to time as he wrote them, and they were fairly overflowing with humor and philosophy and satire concerning the human race. The immortal visitor pointed out, one after another, the absurdities of mankind, his ridiculous conception of heaven, and his special conceit in believing that he was the creator's pet the particular form of life for which all the universe was created. Clemens allowed his exuberant fancy free reign, being under no restrictions as to the possibility of print or public offense. He enjoyed them himself, too, as he read them aloud, and we laughed ourselves weak over his bold imaginings. One admissible extract will carry something of the flavor of these chapters. It is where the celestial correspondent describes man's religion. His heaven is like himself, strange, interesting, astonishing, grotesque. I give you my word, it has not a single feature in it that he actually values. It consists, utterly and entirely, of diversions which he cares next to nothing about here in the earth, yet he is quite sure he will like in heaven. Isn't it curious? Isn't it interesting? You must not think I am exaggerating, for it is not so. I will give you the details. Most men do not sing. Most men cannot sing. Most men will not stay where others are singing, if it be continued more than two hours. Note that. Only about two men in a hundred can play upon a musical instrument, and not four in a hundred have any wish to learn how. Set that down. Many men pray, not many of them like to do it. A few pray long, the others make a shortcut. More men go to church than want to. To Forty-nine men in fifty, the Sabbath day is a dreary, dreary bore. Furthermore, all sane people detest noise. All people, sane or insane, like to have variety in their lives. Monotony quickly wearies them. Now then, you have the facts. You know what men don't enjoy. Well, they have invented a heaven out of their own heads all by themselves guess what it is like. In fifteen hundred years you couldn't do it. They have left out the very things they care for most, their dearest pleasures, and replaced them with prayer. In man's heaven everybody sings. There are no exceptions. The man who did not sing on earth sings there. The man who could not sing on earth sings there. Thus, Universal singing is not casual, not occasional, not relieved by intervals of quiet. It goes on all day long and every day during a stretch of twelve hours, and everybody stays where on earth the place would be empty in two hours. The singing is of hymns alone. Nay, it is one hymn alone. The words are always the same in number. They are only about a dozen. There is no rhyme, there is no poetry. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna unto the highest, and a few such phrases constitute the whole service. Meantime, every person is playing on a harp. Consider the deafening hurricane of sound. Consider further, it is a praise service, a service of compliment, flattery, adulation, do you ask who it is that is willing to endure this strange compliment, this insane compliment, and who not only endures it, but likes it, enjoys it, requires it, commands it? Hold your breath. It is God. This race is God, I mean, their own pet invention. Most of the ideas presented in this, his last commentary on human absurdities, were new only as to phrasing. 
he had exhausted the topic long ago in one way or another but it was one of the themes in which he never lost interest many subjects became stale to him at last but the curious invention called man remained a novelty to him to the end from my notebook october twenty fifth i am constantly amazed at his knowledge of history all history religious political military he seems to have read everything in the world concerning rome france and england particularly last night we stopped playing billiards while he reviewed in the most vivid and picturesque phrasing the reasons of rome's decline such a presentation would have enthralled any audience i could not help feeling a great pity that he had not devoted some of his public effort to work of that sort no one could have equaled him at it he concluded with some comments on the possibility of america following rome's example though he thought the vote of the people would always or at least for a long time prevent imperialism november first today he has been absorbed in his old interest in shorthand it is the only rational alphabet he declared all this spelling reform is nonsense what we need is alphabet reform and shorthand is the thing take the letter m for instance it is made with one stroke in shorthand while in longhand it requires at least three the word mephistopheles can be written in shorthand with one sixth the number of strokes that is required in longhand i tell you shorthand should be adopted as the alphabet i said there is this objection the characters are so slightly different that each writer soon forms a system of his own and it is seldom that two can read each other's notes you are talking of stenographic reporting he said rather warmly nothing of the kind is true in the case of the regular alphabet it is perfectly clear and legible would you have it in the schools then yes it should be taught in the schools not for stenographic purposes but only for use in writing to save time he was very much in earnest and said he had undertaken an article on the subject november third he said he could not sleep last night for thinking what a fool he had been in his various investments i have always been the victim of somebody he said and always an idiot myself doing things that even a child would not do never asking anybody's advice never taking it when it was offered i can't see how anybody could do the things i have done and have kept right on doing i could see that the thought agitated him and i suggested that we go to his room and read which we did and had a riotous time over the most recent chapters of the letters from the earth and some notes he had made for future chapters on infant damnation and other distinctive features of orthodox creeds he told an anecdote of an old minister who declared that presbyterianism without infant damnation would be like the dog on the train that couldn't be identified because it had lost its tag somewhat on the defensive i said but we must admit that the so-called christian nations are the most enlightened and progressive he answered yes but in spite of their religion not because of it the church has opposed every innovation and discovery from the day of galileo down to our own time when the use of anesthetics in childbirth was regarded as a sin because it avoided the biblical curse pronounced against eve and every step in astronomy and geology ever taken has been opposed by bigotry and superstition the greeks surpassed us in artistic culture and in architecture five hundred years before the christian religion was born 
I have been reading Gibbon's celebrated fifteenth chapter, he said later, and I don't see what Christians found against it. It is so mild, so gentle in its sarcasm. He added that he had been reading also a little book of brief biographies, and had found in it the saying of Darwin's father, Unitarianism is a feather-bed to catch falling Christians. I was glad to find and identify that saying, he said. It is so good. He finished the evening by reading a chapter from Carlyle's French Revolution, a fine pyrotechnic passage, the gathering at Versailles. I said that Carlyle somehow reminded me of a fervid stump-speaker who pounded his fists and went at his audience fiercely, determined to convince them. Yes, he said, but he is the best one that ever lived. November 10th. This morning early he heard me stirring and called. I went in and found him propped up with a book, as usual. He said, I seldom read Christmas stories, but this is very beautiful. It has made me cry. I want you to read it. It was Booth Tarkington's Beastly's Christmas Party. Tarkington has the true touch, he said. His work always satisfies me. Another book he has been reading with great enjoyment is James Branch Cabell's Chivalry. He cannot say enough of the subtle poetic art with which Cabell has flung the light of romance about dark and sordid chapters of history. End of chapter 286 Autumn Days Read by John Greenman Section 76 of Mark Twain, A Biography Part 2, 1907-1910 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Chapter 287 Mark Twain's Reading Perhaps here one may speak of Mark Twain's reading in general. On the table by him and on his bed and in the billiard-room shelves he kept the books he read most. They were not many, not more than a dozen, but they were manifestly of familiar and frequent usage. All, or nearly all, had annotations, spontaneously uttered marginal notes, title prefatories, or concluding comments. They were the books he had read again and again, and it was seldom that he had not had something to say with each fresh reading. There were the three big volumes by Saint-Simon, the Memoirs, which he once told me he had read no less than twenty times. On the fly-leaf of the first volume he wrote, This and Casanova and Pepys, set in parallel columns, could afford a good coup d'oeil of French and English high life of that epoch. All through those finely printed volumes are his commentaries, sometimes no more than a word, sometimes a filled, closely written margin, he found little to admire in the human nature of Saint-Simon's period, little to approve in Saint-Simon himself beyond his unrestrained frankness, which he admired without stint, and in one paragraph where the details of that early period are set down with startling fidelity, he wrote, O oh, incomparable Saint-Simon! Saint-Simon is always frank, and Mark Twain was equally so where the former tells one of the unspeakable compulsions of Louis the Fourteenth, the latter has commented, We have to grant that God made this royal hog. We may also be permitted to believe that it was a crime to do so. And on another page, In her memories of this period, the Duchesse de St. Clair makes this striking remark. Sometimes one could tell a gentleman, but it was only by his manner of using his fork. His comments on the orthodox religion of Saint-Simon's period are not marked by gentleness. Of the author's reference to the Edict of Nantes, 
which he says depopulated half of the realm, ruined its commerce, and authorized torments and punishments by which so many innocent people of both sexes were killed by thousands. Clemens writes, So much blood has been shed by the church because of an omission from the gospel. Ye shall be indifferent as to what your neighbor's religion is. Not merely tolerant of it, but indifferent to it. Divinity is claimed for many religions, but no religion is great enough or divine enough to add that new law to its code. In the place where Saint-Simon describes the death of Monseigneur, son of the king, and the court hypocrites are wailing their extravagantly pretended sorrow, Clemens wrote, It is all so true, all so human. God made these animals. He must have noticed this scene. I wish I knew how it struck him. There were not many notes in the Suetonius, nor in the Carlyle Revolution, though these were among the volumes he read oftenest. Perhaps they expressed for him too completely and too richly their subject matter to require anything at his hand. Here and there are marked passages and occasional cross-references to related history and circumstance. There was not much room for comment on the narrow margins of the old copy of Pepys, which he had read steadily since the early seventies. But here and there a few crisp words, and the underscoring and marked passages are plentiful enough to convey his devotion to that quaint record which, perhaps next to Suetonius, was the book he read and quoted most. Francis Parkman's Canadian Histories he had read periodically, especially the story of the old regime and of the Jesuits in North America. As late as January 1908, he wrote on the title page of the old regime, Very interesting. It tells how people, religiously and otherwise insane, came over from France and colonized Canada. He was not always complimentary to those who undertook to Christianize the Indians, but he did not fail to write his admiration of their courage, their very willingness to endure privation and even the fiendish savage tortures for the sake of their faith. What matter of men are these? he wrote, apropos of the account of Brissani, who had undergone the most devilish inflictions which savage ingenuity could devise, and yet returned maimed and disfigured the following spring to dare again the knives and fiery brand of the Iroquois. Clemens was likely to be on the side of the Indians, but hardly in their barbarism. In one place he wrote, that men should be willing to leave their happy homes and endure what the missionaries endured in order to teach these Indians the road to hell would be rational, understandable, but why they should want to teach them a way to heaven is a thing which the mind somehow cannot grasp. Other histories, mainly English and French, showed how he had read them, read and digested every word and line. There were two volumes of Lecky, much worn, Andrew D. White's Science and Theology, a chief interest for at least one summer, and among the collection a well-worn copy of Modern English Literature, Its Blemishes and Defects, by Henry H. Breen. On the title page of this book Clemens had written, Hartford, 1876. Use with care, for it is a scarce book. England had to be ransacked in order to get it, or the bookseller speaketh falsely. He once wrote a paper for the Saturday Morning Club, using for his text examples of slipshod English, which Breen had noted. Clemens had a passion for biography, and especially for autobiography, diaries, letters, and such intimate human history. 
Greville's journal of the reigns of George IV and William IV he had read much and annotated freely. Greville, while he admired Byron's talents, abhorred the poet's personality, and in one place condemns him as a vicious person and a debauchee. He adds, Then he despises pretenders and charlatans of all sorts, while he is himself a pretender, as all men are who assume a character which does not belong to them, and affect to be something which they are all the time conscious they are not in reality. Clemens wrote on the margin, But, dear sir, you are forgetting that what a man sees in the human race is merely himself in the deep and honest privacy of his own heart. Byron despised the race because he despised himself. I feel as Byron did, and for the same reason. Do you admire the race, and consequently yourself? A little further along, where Greville laments that Byron can take no profit to himself from the sinful characters he depicts so faithfully, Clemens commented, If Byron, if any man, draws fifty characters, they are all himself, fifty shades, fifty moods of his own character. And when the man draws them well, why do they stir my admiration? Because they are me. I recognize myself. A volume of Plutarch was among the biographies that showed usage, and the Life of P. T. Barnum, written by himself. Two years before the mast he loved, and never tired of, the more recent memoirs of Andrew D. White and Moncure D. Conway both, I remember, gave him enjoyment, as did the letters of Lowell. A volume of the letters of Madame de Sévigne had some annotated margins which were not complimentary to the translator, or for that matter to Sévigne herself, whom he once designates as a nauseating person, many of whose letters had been uselessly translated, as well as poorly arranged for reading. But he would read any volume of letters or personal memoirs, none were too poor that had the throb of life in them, however slight. Of such sort were the books that Mark Twain had loved best, and such were a few of his words concerning them. Some of them belong to his earlier reading, and among these is Darwin's Descent of Man, a book whose influence was always present, though I believe he did not read it any more in later years. In the days I knew him, he read steadily not much besides Suetonius and Pepys and Carlyle. These and his simple astronomies and geologies, and the Mort Arthur and the poems of Kipling, were seldom far from his hand. End of chapter 287 Mark Twain's Reading Read by John Greenman Section 77 of Mark Twain, A Biography, Part 2, 1907-1910 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Chapter 288 A Bermuda Birthday It was the middle of November 1909 when Clemens decided to take another Bermuda vacation, and it was the 19th that we sailed. I went to New York a day ahead and arranged matters, and on the evening of the 18th received the news that Richard Watson Gilder had suddenly died. Next morning there was other news. Clemens' old friend William M. Laffin of The Sun had died while undergoing a surgical operation. I met Clemens at the train. He had already heard about Gilder, but he had not yet learned of Laffin's death. He said, That's just it. Gilder and Laffin get all the good things that come along, and I never get anything. Then suddenly remembering, he added, how curious it is. I have been thinking of Laffin coming down on the train and mentally writing a letter to him on this Stetson Eddy affair. 
I asked when he had begun thinking of Laffan. He said, Within the hour. It was within the hour that I had received the news, and naturally in my mind had carried it instantly to him. Perhaps there was something telepathic in it. He was not at all ill going down to Bermuda, which was a fortunate thing, for the water was rough and I was quite disqualified. We did not even discuss astronomy, though there was what seemed most important news, the reported discovery of a new planet. But there was plenty of talk on the subject as soon as we got settled in the Hamilton Hotel. It was windy and rainy out of doors, and we looked out on the drenched semi-tropical foliage with a great bamboo swaying and bending in the foreground, while he speculated on the vast distance that the new planet must lie from our sun, to which it was still a satellite. The report had said that it was probably four hundred billions of miles distant, and that on this far frontier of the solar system the sun could not appear to it larger than the blaze of a tallow candle. To us it was wholly incredible how, in that dim remoteness, it could still hold true to the central force and follow at a snail pace, yet with unvarying exactitude, its stupendous orbit. Clemens said that heretofore Neptune, the planetary outpost of our system, had been called the tortoise of the skies, but that comparatively it was rapid in its motion, and has become a near neighbor. He was a good deal excited at first, having somehow the impression that this new planet traveled out beyond the nearest fixed star, but then he remembered that the distance to that first solar neighbor was estimated in trillions, not billions, and that our little system, even with its new additions, was a child's handbreadth on the plane of the sky. He had brought along a small book called The Pith of Astronomy, a fascinating little volume, and he read from it about the great tempest of fire in the sun, where the waves of flame roll up two thousand miles high, though the sun itself is such a tiny star in the deeps of the universe. If I dwell unwarrantably on this phase of Mark Twain's character, it is because it was always so fascinating to me, and the contemplation of the drama of the skies always meant so much to him and somehow always seemed akin to him in its proportions. He had been born under a flaming star, a wanderer of the skies. He was himself, to me, always a comet rushing through space from mystery to mystery, regardless of sun and systems. It is not likely to rain long in Bermuda, and when the sun comes back it brings summer, whatever the season. Within a day after our arrival we were driving about those coral roads along the beaches, and by that marvelously variegated water. We went often to the south shore, especially to Devonshire Bay, where the reefs and the sea coloring seem more beautiful than elsewhere. Usually, when we reached the bay, we got out to walk along the indurated shore, stopping here and there to look out over the jeweled water, liquid turquoise, emerald lapis lazuli jade, the imperial garment of the Lord. At first we went alone with only the colored driver Clifford Trott, whose name Clemens could not recollect, though he was always attempting resemblances with ludicrous results. A little later Helen Allen, an early angelfish member already mentioned, was with us and directed the drives, for she had been born on the island and knew every attractive locality, though, for that matter, it would be hard to find there a place that was not attractive. Clemens, in fact, remained not many days regularly at the hotel. He kept a room and his wardrobe there, but he paid a visit to Bay House, the lovely and quiet home of Helen's parents, and prolonged it from day to day and from week to week, because it was a quiet and peaceful place with affectionate attention and limitless welcome. Clifford Trott had orders to come with the carriage each afternoon, and we drove down to Bay House for Mark Twain and his playmate and then went wandering at will among the labyrinth of blossom-bordered, perfectly kept roadways of a dainty paradise that never, I believe, becomes quite a reality, even to those who know it best. Clemens had an occasional paroxysm during these weeks, but they were not likely to be severe or protracted, and I have no doubt the peace of his surroundings, the remoteness from disturbing events, as well as the balmy temperature all contributed to his improved condition. 
he talked pretty continuously during these drives and he by no means restricted his subjects to juvenile matters he discussed history and his favorite sciences and philosophies and i am sure that his drift was rarely beyond the understanding of his young companion for it was mark twain's gift to phrase his thought so that it commanded not only the respect of age but the comprehension and the interest of youth i remember that once he talked during an afternoon's drive on the french revolution and the ridiculous episode of anacharsis clutes orator and advocate of the human race collecting the vast populace of france to swear allegiance to a king even then doomed to the block the very name of clutes suggested humor and nothing could have been more delightful and graphic than the whole episode as he related it helen asked if he thought such a thing as that could ever happen in america no he said the american sense of humor would have laughed it out of court in a week and the frenchman dreads ridicule too though he never seems to realize how ridiculous he is the most ridiculous creature in the world on the morning of his seventy-fourth birthday he was looking wonderfully well after a night of sound sleep his face full of color and freshness his eyes bright and keen and full of good humor i presented him with a pair of cuff buttons silver enameled with the bermuda lily and i thought he seemed pleased with them it was rather gloomy outside so we remained indoors by the fire and played cards game after game of hearts at which he excelled and he was usually kept happy by winning there were no visitors and after dinner helen asked him to read some of her favorite episodes from tom sawyer so he read the whitewashing scene peter and the painkiller and such chapters until tea-time then there was a birthday cake and afterward cigars and talk and a quiet fireside evening once in the course of his talk he forgot a word and denounced his poor memory i'll forget the lord's middle name some time he declared right in the midst of a storm when i need all the help i can get later he said nobody dreamed seventy-four years ago today that i would be in bermuda now and i thought he meant a good deal more than the words conveyed it was during this bermuda visit that mark twain added the finishing paragraph to his article the turning point in my life which at howells's suggestion he had been preparing for harper's bazaar it was a characteristic touch and as the last summary of his philosophy of human life may be repeated here necessarily the scene of the real turning point of my life and of yours was the garden of eden it was there that the first link was forged of the chain that was ultimately to lead to the emptying of me into the literary guild adam's temperament was the first command the deity ever issued to a human being on this planet and it was the only command adam would never be able to disobey it said be weak be water be characterless be cheaply persuadable the later command to let the fruit alone was certainly to be disobeyed not by adam himself but by his temperament which he did not create and had no authority over for the temperament is the man the thing tricked out with clothes and named man is merely its shadow nothing more the law of the tiger's temperament is thou shalt kill the law of the sheep's temperament is thou shalt not kill to issue later commands requiring the tiger to let the fat stranger alone and requiring the sheep 
to imbrue its hands in the blood of the lion is not worth while, for those commands can't be obeyed. They would invite to violations of the law of temperament, which is supreme and takes precedence of all other authorities. I cannot help feeling disappointed in Adam and Eve, that is, in their temperaments, not in them, poor helpless young creatures, afflicted with temperaments made out of butter, which butter was commanded to get into contact with fire and be melted. What I cannot help wishing is that Adam and Eve had been postponed, and Martin Luther and Joan of Arc put in their place, that splendid pair equipped with temperaments not made of butter, but of asbestos, by neither sugary persuasions nor by hell-fire could Satan have beguiled them to eat the apple. There would have been results, indeed, yes, the apple would be intact today. There would be no human race, there would be no you, there would be no me, and the old, old creation dawn scheme of ultimately launching me into the literary guild would have been defeated. End of chapter 288 A Bermuda Birthday Read by John Greenman Section 78 of Mark Twain, A Biography Part 2, 1907-1910 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Chapter 289 The Death of Jean He decided to go home for the holidays, and how fortunate it seems now that he did so. We sailed for America on the 18th of December, arriving the 21st. Jean was at the wharf to meet us, blue and shivering with the cold, for it was wretchedly bleak there, and I had the feeling that she should not have come. She went directly, I think, to Stormfield, he following a day or two later. On the 23rd I was lunching with Jean alone. She was full of interest in her Christmas preparations. She had a handsome tree set up in the loggia, and the packages were piled about it, with new ones constantly arriving. With her farm management, her housekeeping, her secretary work, and her Christmas preparations, it seemed to me that she had her hands over full. Such a mental pressure could not be good for her. I suggested that, for a time at least, I might assume a part of her burden. I was to remain at my own home that night, and I think it was as I left Stormfield that I passed Jean on the stair. She said cheerfully that she felt a little tired and was going up to lie down, so that she would be fresh for the evening. I did not go back, and I never saw her alive again. I was at breakfast next morning when word was brought in that one of the men from Stormfield was outside and wished to see me immediately. When I went out, he said, "'Miss Jean is dead. They have just found her in her bathroom. Mr. Clemens sent me to bring you.' It was as incomprehensible as such things always are. I could not realize at all that Jean, so full of plans and industries and action, less than a day before, had passed into that voiceless mystery which we call death. Harry Isles drove me rapidly up the hill. As I entered Clemens' room, he looked at me helplessly and said, "'Well, I suppose you have heard of this final disaster. He was not violent or broken down with grief. He had come to that place where, whatever the shock or the ill turn of fortune, he could accept it, and even in that first moment of loss he realized that, for Jean at least, the fortune was not ill. Her malady had never been cured, and it had been one of his deepest dreads that he would leave her behind him, 
it was believed at first that jean had drowned and dr smith tried methods of resuscitation but then he found that it was simply a case of heart cessation caused by the cold shock of her bath the gabrilowitsches were by this time in europe and clemens cabled them not to come later in the day he asked me if we would be willing to close our home for the winter and come to stormfield he said that he should probably go back to bermuda before long but that he wished to keep the house open so that it would be there for him to come to at any time that he might need it we came of course for there was no thought among any of his friends but for his comfort and peace of mind jervis langdon was summoned from elmira for jean would lie there with the others in the loggia stood the half-trimmed christmas tree and all about lay the packages of gifts and in jean's room on the chairs and upon her desk were piled other packages nobody had been forgotten for her father she had bought a handsome globe he had always wanted one once when i went into his room he said i have been looking in at jean and envying her i have never greatly envied any one but the dead i always envy the dead he told me how the night before they had dined together alone how he had urged her to turn over a part of her work to me how she had clung to every duty as if now after all the years she was determined to make up for lost time while they were at dinner a telephone inquiry had come concerning his health for the papers had reported him as returning from bermuda in critical condition he had written this playful answer manager associated press new york i hear the newspapers say i am dying the charge is not true i would not do such a thing at my time of life i am behaving as good as i can merry christmas to everybody mark twain jean telephoned it for him to the press it had been the last secretary service she had ever rendered she had kissed his hand he said when they parted for she had a severe cold and would not wish to impart it to him then happily she had said good night and he had not seen her again the reciting of this was good to him for it brought the comfort of tears later when i went in again he was writing i am setting it down he said everything it is a relief to me to write it it furnishes me an excuse for thinking he continued writing most of the day and at intervals during the next day and the next it was on christmas day that they went with jean on her last journey katie leary her baby nurse had dressed her in the dainty gown which she had worn for clara's wedding and they had pinned on it a pretty buckle which her father had brought her from bermuda and which she had not seen no greek statue was ever more classically beautiful than she was lying there in the great living-room which in its brief history had seen so much of the round of life they were to start with jean at about six o'clock and a little before that time clemens he was unable to make the journey asked me what had been her favorite music i said that she seemed always to care most for the schubert impromptu opus 142 number two then he said play it when they get ready to leave with her and add the intermezzo for susie and the largo for mrs clemens when i hear the music i shall know that they are starting tell them to set lanterns at the door so i can look down and see them go so i sat at the organ and began playing as they lifted and bore her away a soft heavy snow was falling and the gloom of those shortest days was closing in there was not the least wind or noise the whole world was muffled the lanterns at the door threw their light out on the thickly falling flakes i remained at the organ but the little group at the door saw him come to the window above the light on his white hair as he stood mournfully gazing down 
watching Jean going away from him for the last time. I played steadily on as he had instructed, the impromptu, the intermezzo from Cavalleria, and Handel's Largo. When I had finished I went up and found him. "'Poor little Jean,' he said. "'But for her it is so good to go.' In his own story of it he wrote, "'From my windows I saw the hearse and the carriages wind along the road and gradually grow vague and spectral in the falling snow, and presently disappear. Jean was gone out of my life, and would not come back any more. The cousin she had played with when they were babies together, he and her beloved old Katie, were conducting her to her distant childhood home, where she will lie by her mother's side once more, in the company of Susie and Langdon. He did not come down to dinner, and when I went up afterward I found him curiously agitated. He said, For one who does not believe in spirits, I have had a most peculiar experience. I went into the bathroom just now and closed the door. You know how warm it always is in there, and there are no drafts. All at once I felt a cold current of air about me. I thought the door must be open, but it was closed. I said, Jean, is this you trying to let me know? you have found the others and the cold air was gone i saw that the incident had made a very great impression upon him but i don't remember that he ever mentioned it afterward next day the storm had turned into a fearful blizzard the whole hilltop was a raging driving mass of white he wrote most of the day but stopped now and then to read some of the telegrams or letters of condolence which came flooding in. Sometimes he walked over to the window to look out on the furious tempest. Once during the afternoon he said, Jean always so loved to see a storm like this, and just now, at Elmira, they are burying her. Later he read aloud some lines by Alfred Austin which Mrs. Crane had sent him, lines which he had remembered in the sorrow for Susie. When last came sorrow around barn and byre, wind careen snow, the year's white sepulchre lay. Come in, I said, and warm you by the fire, and there she sits and never goes away. It was that evening that he came into the room where Mrs. Payne and I sat by the fire, bringing his manuscript. "'I have finished my story of Jean's death,' he said. "'It is the end of my autobiography. I shall never write any more. I can't judge it myself at all. One of you read it aloud to the other, and let me know what you think of it. If it is worthy, perhaps some day it may be published." It was, in fact, one of the most exquisite and tender pieces of writing in the language. He had ended his literary labors with that perfect thing which so marvelously speaks the loftiness and tenderness of his soul. It was thoroughly in keeping with his entire career that he should, with this rare dramatic touch, bring it to a close. A paragraph which he omitted may be printed now. December 27th. Did I know Jean's value? No. I only thought I did. I knew a ten-thousandth fraction of it. That was all. It is always so with us. It has always been so. We are like the poor, ignorant, private soldier, dead now four hundred years, 
who picked up the great Sancy diamond on the field of the lost battle and sold it for a franc. Later he knew what he had done. Shall I ever be cheerful again, happy again? Yes, and soon, for I know my temperament, and I know that the temperament is master of the man, and that he is its fettered and helpless slave, and must in all things do as it commands. A man's temperament is born in him, and no circumstances can ever change it. My temperament has never allowed my spirits to remain depressed long at a time. That was a feature of Jean's temperament, too. She inherited it from me. I think she got the rest of it from her mother. Jean Clemens had two natural endowments, the gift of justice and a genuine passion for all nature. In a little paper found in her desk she had written, I know a few people who love the country as I do, but not many. Most of my acquaintances are enthusiastic over the spring and summer months, but very few care much for it the year round. A few people are interested in the spring foliage and the development of the wild flowers. Nearly all enjoy the autumn colors, while comparatively few pay much attention to the coming and going of the birds the changing in their plumage and songs, the apparent springing into life on some warm April day of the chipmunks and woodchucks, the scurrying of baby rabbits, and again in the fall the equally sudden disappearance of some of the animals, and the growing shyness of others. To me it is all as fascinating as a book, more so, since I have never lost interest in it. It is simple and frank, like Thoreau, Perhaps, had she exercised it, there was a third gift, the gift of written thought. Clemens remained at Stormfield ten days after Jean was gone. The weather was fiercely cold, the landscape desolate, the house full of tragedy. He kept pretty closely to his room, where he had me bring the heaps of letters, a few of which he answered personally. For the others he prepared a simple card of acknowledgment. He was, for the most part, in gentle mood during these days, though he would break out now and then and rage at the hardness of a fate that had laid an unearned burden of illness on Jean and shadowed her life. They were days not wholly without humor. None of his days could be altogether without that, though it was likely to be a melancholy sort. Many of the letters offered orthodox comfort, saying in effect, God does not willingly punish us. When he had read a number of these, he said, Well, why does he do it, then? We don't invite it. Why does he give himself the trouble? I suggested that it was a sentiment that probably gave comfort to the writer of it. So it does, he said, and I am glad of it, glad of anything that gives comfort to anybody. He spoke of the larger God, the God of the great unvarying laws, and by and by dropped off to sleep quite peacefully, and indeed peace came more and more to him each day with the thought that Jean and Susie and their mother could not be troubled any more. To Mrs. Gabrilovich he wrote, Reading, Connecticut, December twenty ninth, 1909. O Clara! Clara, dear, I am so glad she is out of it and safe, safe. I am not melancholy. I shall never be melancholy again, I think. You see, I was in such distress when I came to realize that you were gone far away and no one stood between her and danger but me and I could die at any moment, and then, oh, then, what would become of her? 
for she was willful, you know, and would not have been governable. You can't imagine what a darling she was that last two or three days, and how fine and good and sweet and noble and joyful, thank heaven, and how intellectually brilliant. I had never been acquainted with Jean before. I recognized that. But I mustn't try to write about her. I can't. I have already poured my soul out with the pen, recording that last day or two. I will send you that, and you must let no one but Ossip read it. Goodbye. I love you so, and Ossip, father. End of chapter 289 The Death of Jean Read by John Greenman Section 79 of Mark Twain, A Biography Part 2, 1907-1910 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography By Albert Bigelow Payne Chapter 290 The Return to Bermuda I don't think he attempted any further writing for print. His mind was busy with ideas, but he was willing to talk rather than to write, rather even than to play billiards, it seemed, although we had a few quiet games, the last we should ever play together. Evenings he asked for music, preferring the Scotch airs such as Bonnie Doon and The Campbells Are Coming. I remember that once, after playing the latter for him, he told, with great feeling, how the Highlanders, led by General Colin Campbell, had charged at Lucknow, inspired by that stirring air. When he had retired I usually sat with him, and he drifted into literature or theology or science or history, the story of the universe and man. One evening he spoke of those who had written but one immortal thing and stopped there. He mentioned Ben Bolt. "'I met that man once,' he said. "'In my childhood I sang Sweet Alice Ben Bolt, and in my old age, fifteen years ago, I met the man who wrote it. His name was Brown.' Thomas Dunn English, Mr. Clemens apparently remembered only the name satirically conferred upon him by Edgar Allan Poe, Thomas Dunn Brown. He was aged, forgotten, a mere memory. I remember how it thrilled me to realize that this was the very author of Sweet Alice Ben Bolt. He was just an accident. He had a vision and echoed it. A good many persons do that. The thing they do is to put in compact form the thing which we have all vaguely felt. Twenty years ago is just like it. I have wandered through the village, Tom, and sat beneath the tree. And Holmes' last leaf is another, the memory of the hallowed past and the gravestones of those we love. It is all so beautiful. The past is always beautiful. He quoted with great feeling and effect. The massy marbles rest on the lips that we have pressed in their bloom, and the names we love to hear have been carved for many a year on the tomb. He continued in this strain for an hour or more. He spoke of humor, and thought it must be one of the chief attributes of God. He cited plants and animals that were distinctly humorous in form and in their characteristics. These, he declared, were God's jokes. Why, he said, humor is mankind's greatest blessing. Your own case is an example, I answered. Without it, Whatever your reputation as a philosopher, you could never have had the widespread affection that is shown by the writers of that great heap of letters. 
Yes, he said gently, they have liked to be amused. I tucked him in for the night, promising to send him to Bermuda, with Claude to take care of him, if he felt he could undertake the journey in two days more. He was able, and he was eager to go, for he longed for that sunny island, and for the quiet peace of the Allen home. His niece, Mrs. Loomis, came up to spend the last evening in Stormfield, a happy evening full of quiet talk, and next morning, in the old closed carriage that had been his wedding gift, he was driven to the railway station. This was on January 4, 1910. He was to sail next day, and that night at Mr. Loomis's Howells came in, and for an hour or two they reviewed some of the questions they had so long ago settled, or left forever unsettled, and laid away. I remember that at dinner Clemens spoke of his old Hartford butler, George, and how he had once brought George to New York and introduced him at the various publishing houses as his friend, with curious and sometimes rather embarrassing results. The talk drifted to sociology and to the labor unions, which Clemens defended as being the only means by which the workman could obtain recognition of his rights. Howells, in his book, mentions this evening, which he says, was made memorable to me by the kind, clear, judicial sense with which he explained and justified the labor unions as the sole present help of the weak against the strong. They discussed dreams, and then in a little while Howells rose to go. I went also, and as we walked to his nearby apartment he spoke of Mark Twain's supremacy. He said, I turn to his books for cheer when I am downhearted. There was never anybody like him. There never will be. Clemens sailed next morning. They did not meet again. End of chapter 290 The Return to Bermuda Read by John Greenman Section 80 of Mark Twain, A Biography Part 2 1907 to 1910. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 291 Letters from Bermuda. Stormfield was solemn and empty without Mark Twain, but he wrote by every steamer, at first with his own hand, and during the last week by the hand of one of his enlisted secretaries some member of the Allen family, usually Helen. His letters were full of brightness and pleasantry, always concerned more or less with business matters, though he was no longer disturbed by them, for Bermuda was too peaceful and too far away, and besides, he had faith in the Mark Twain Company's ability to look after his affairs. I cannot do better, I believe, than to offer some portions of these letters here. He reached Bermuda on the 7th of January, 1910, and on the 12th he wrote, Again I am living the ideal life. There is nothing to mar it but the bloody-minded bandit Arthur, a small playmate of Helen's, of whom Clemens pretended to be fiercely jealous. Once he wrote a memorandum to Helen, Let Arthur read this book. There is a page in it that is poisoned. Who still fetches and carries Helen, presently he will be found drowned. Claude comes to Bay House twice a day to see if I need any service. He is invaluable. There was a military lecture last night at the officer's mess prospect, as the lecturer honored me with a special urgent invitation and said he wanted to lecture to me particularly, I naturally took Helen and her mother into the private carriage and went. As soon as we landed at the door with the crowd, the governor came to me and was very cordial. I met up with that charming Colonel Chapman, we had known him on the previous visit, and other officers of the regiment, 
and had a good time. A few days later he wrote, Thanks for your letter and for its contenting news of the situation in that foreign and far-off and vaguely remembered country where you and Loomis and Lark and other beloved friends are. I had a letter from Clara this morning. She is solicitous and wants me well and watchfully taken care of. My, my, she ought to see Helen and her parents and Claude administer that trust. Also, she says, I hope to hear from you or Mr. Payne very soon. I am writing her, and I know you will respond to your part of her prayer. She is pretty desolate now after Jean's emancipation. The only kindness that God ever did that poor unoffending child in all her hard life. Send Clara a copy of Howell's gorgeous letter. The gorgeous letter mentioned was an appreciation of his recent bizarre article, The Turning Point in My Life, and here follows January 18th, 1910. Dear Clemens, While your wonderful words are warm in my mind yet, I want to tell you what you know already, that you never wrote anything greater, finer, than that turning-point paper of yours. I shall feel it honor enough if they put on my tombstone, he was born in the same century and general section of middle western country with Dr. S. L. Clemens, Oxon, and had his degree three years before him through a mistake of the university. I hope you are worse. You will never be riper for a purely intellectual life, and it is a pity to have you lagging along with a worn-out material body on top of your soul. Yours ever, W. D. Howells. On the margin of this letter Clemens had written, I reckon this spontaneous outburst from the first critic of the day is good to keep, ain't it, Payne? January 24th he wrote again his contentment. Life continues here the same as usual. There isn't a fault in it. Good time, good home, tranquil contentment all day and every day without a break. I know familiarly several very satisfactory people and meet them frequently. Mr. Hamilton, the Sloanes, Mr. and Mrs. Fells, Miss Waterman, and so on. I shouldn't know how to go about bettering my situation. On February 5th he wrote that the climate and condition of his health might require him to stay in Bermuda pretty continuously, but that he wished Stormfield kept open so that he might come to it at any time. And he added, Yesterday Mr. Allen took us on an excursion in Mr. Hamilton's big motorboat. Present, Mrs. Allen, Mr. and Mrs. and Miss Sloan, Helen, Mildred Howells, Claude, and me. Several hours swift skimming over ravishing blue seas, a brilliant sun. Also, a couple of hours of picnicking and lazying under the cedars in a secluded place. The Orotava is arriving with two hundred and sixty passengers. I shall get letters by her, no doubt. P.S. Please send me the standard unabridged that is on the table in my bedroom. I have no dictionary here. There is no mention in any of these letters of his trouble, but he was having occasional spasms of pain, though in that soft climate they would seem to have come with less frequency, and there was so little to disturb him, and much that contributed to his peace. Among the callers at the Bay House to see him was Woodrow Wilson, 
and the two put in some pleasant hours at miniature golf, putting on the Allen lawn. Of course, a catastrophe would come along now and then. Such things could not always be guarded against. In a letter toward the end of February, he wrote, It is two-thirty in the morning, and I am writing because I can't sleep. I can't sleep because a professional pianist is coming tomorrow afternoon to play for me. My God, I wouldn't allow Pederewski or Gabrilovich to do that. I would rather have a leg amputated. I knew he was coming, but I never dreamed it was to play for me. When I heard the horrible news four hours ago, be damned if I didn't come near screaming. I meant to slip out and be absent, but now I can't. Don't pray for me. The thing is just as damned bad as it can be already. Clemens' love for music did not include the piano, except for very gentle melodies, and he probably did not anticipate these from a professional player. He did not report the sequel of the matter, but it is likely that his imagination had discounted its tortures. Sometimes his letters were pure nonsense. Once he sent a sheet on one side of which was written, Bay House, March 5, 1910, received of S.L.C., two dollars and forty cents in return for my promise to believe everything he says hereafter helen s allen and on the reverse for sale the proprietor of the herein before mentioned promise desires to part with it on account of ill health and obliged to go away somewheres so as to let it reciprocate and will take any reasonable amount for it above two per cent of its face because experienced parties think it will not keep but only a little while in this kind of weather and is a kind of property that don't give a cuss for cold storage nohow Clearly, however serious Mark Twain regarded his physical condition, he did not allow it to make him gloomy. He wrote that matters were going everywhere to his satisfaction, that Clara was happy, that his household and business affairs no longer troubled him, that his personal surroundings were of the pleasantest sort. Sometimes he wrote of what he was reading, and once spoke particularly of Professor William Lyon Phelps' literary essays which he said he had been unable to lay down until he had finished the book. To Phelps himself he wrote, I thank you ever so much for the book, which I find charming, so charming indeed that I read it through in a single night, and did not regret the lost night's sleep. I am glad if I deserve what you said about me, and even if I don't, I am proud and well contented, since you think I deserve it. So his days seemed full of comfort, but in March I noticed that he generally dictated his letters, and once, when he sent some small photographs, I thought he looked thinner and older. Still he kept up his merriment. In one letter he said, While the matter is in my mind, I will remark that if you ever send me another letter which is not paged at the top, I will write you with my own hand, so that I may use with utter freedom and without embarrassment the kind of words which alone can describe such a criminal, to wit, dash, 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 dash. You will have to put into words those dashes because propriety will not allow me to do it myself in my secretary's hearing. You are forgiven, but don't let it occur again. He had still made no mention of his illness, but on the 25th of March he wrote something of his plans for coming home. 
he had engaged passage on the bermudian for april twenty third he said and he added but don't tell anybody i don't want it known i may have to go sooner if the pain in my breast does not mend its ways pretty considerable i don't want to die here for this is an unkind place for a person in that condition i should have to lie in the undertaker's cellar until the ship would remove me and it is dark down there and unpleasant the colliers will meet me on the pier and i may stay with them a week or two before going home it all depends on the breast pain i don't want to die there i am growing more and more particular about the place but in the same letter he spoke of plans for the summer suggesting that we must look into the magic lantern possibilities so that library entertainments could be given at stormfield i confess that this letter in spite of its light tone made me uneasy and i was tempted to sail for bermuda to bring him home three days later he wrote again i have been having a most uncomfortable time for the past four days with that breast pain which turns out to be an affection of the heart just as i originally suspected the news from new york is to the effect that non-bronchial weather has arrived there at last therefore if i can get my breast trouble in traveling condition i may sail for home a week or two earlier than has been proposed the same mail that brought this brought a letter from mr allen who frankly stated that matters had become very serious indeed mr clemens had had some dangerous attacks and the physician considered his condition critical these letters arrived april first i went to new york at once and sailed next morning before sailing i consulted with dr quintard who provided me with some opiates and instructed me in the use of the hypodermic needle he also joined me in a cablegram to the Gabrilovitches, then in italy advising them to sail without delay end of chapter two hundred and ninety one letters from bermuda read by john greenman section eighty one of mark twain a biography part two nineteen o seven to nineteen ten this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne chapter two hundred and ninety two the voyage home i sent no word to bermuda that i was coming and when on the second morning i arrived at hamilton i stepped quickly ashore from the tender and hurried to bay house the doors were all open as they usually are in that summer island and no one was visible i was familiar with the place and without knocking i went through to the room occupied by mark twain as i entered i saw that he was alone sitting in a large chair clad in the familiar dressing-gown bay house stands upon the water and the morning light reflected in at the window had an unusual quality he was not yet shaven and he seemed unnaturally pale and gray certainly he was much thinner i was too startled for the moment to say anything when he turned and saw me he seemed a little dazed why he said holding out his hand you didn't tell us you were coming no i said it is rather sudden i didn't quite like the sound of your last letters but those were not serious he protested you shouldn't have come on my account i said then that i had come on my own account and that i had felt the need of recreation and had decided to run down and come home with him that's very good he said in his slow gentle fashion now i am glad to see you his breakfast came in and he ate with an appetite when he had been shaved and freshly propped up in his pillows it seemed to me after all that i must have been mistaken in thinking him so changed certainly he was thinner but his color was fine his eyes were bright 
he had no appearance of a man whose life was believed to be in danger. He told me then of the fierce attacks he had gone through, how the pains had torn at him, and how it had been necessary for him to have hypodermic injections, which he amusingly termed hypnotic injunctions and subcutaneous applications, and he had his humor out of it, as of course he must have, even though death should stand there in person. From Mr. and Mrs. Allen and from the physician I learned how slender had been his chances, and how uncertain were the days ahead. Mr. Allen had already engaged passage on the Oceana for the twelfth, and the one purpose now was to get him physically in condition for the trip. How devoted those kind friends had been to him! They had devised every imaginable thing for his comfort. Mr. Allen had rigged an electric bell which connected with his own room, so that he could be aroused instantly at any hour of the night. Clemens had refused to have a nurse, for it was only during the period of his extreme suffering that he needed any one, and he did not wish to have a nurse always around. When the pains were gone he was as bright and cheerful and seemingly as well as ever. On the afternoon of my arrival we drove out, as formerly, and he discussed some of the old subjects in quite the old way. He had been re-reading Macaulay, he said, and spoke at considerable length of the hypocrisy and intrigue of the English court under James the Second. He spoke, too, of the Reading Library. I had sold for him that portion of the land where Jean's farmhouse had stood, and it was in his mind to use the money for some sort of a memorial to Jean. I had written suggesting that perhaps he would like to put up a small library building, as the Adams lot faced the corner where Jean had passed every day when she rode to the station for the mail. He had been thinking this over, he said, and wished the idea carried out. He asked me to write at once to his lawyer, Mr. Lark, and have a paper prepared appointing trustees for a memorial library fund. The pain did not trouble him that afternoon nor during several succeeding days. He was gay and quite himself, and he often went out on the lawn, but we did not drive out again. For the most part he sat propped up in his bed, reading or smoking or talking in the old way, and as I looked at him he seemed so full of vigor and the joy of life that I could not convince myself that he would not outlive us all. I found that he had been really very much alive during those three months, too much for his own good sometimes, for he had not been careful of his hours or his diet, and had suffered in consequence. He had not been writing, though he had scribbled some playful valentines, and he had amused himself one day by preparing a chapter of advice, for me it appeared, which, after reading it aloud to the Allens and receiving their approval, he declared he intended to have printed for my benefit as it would seem to have been the last bit of continued writing he ever did, and because it is characteristic and amusing, a few paragraphs may be admitted. The advice is concerning deportment on reaching the gate which St. Peter is supposed to guard. Upon arrival, do not speak to St. Peter until spoken to. It is not your place to begin. Do not begin any remark with, say. When applying for a ticket, avoid trying to make conversation. If you must talk, let the weather alone. St. Peter cares not a damn for the weather. And don't ask him what time the 4.30 train goes. There aren't any trains in heaven, except through trains, and the less information you get about them, well, the better for you. You can ask him for his autograph, there is no harm in that, but be careful and don't remark that it is one of the penalties of greatness. He has heard that before. Don't try to Kodak him. Hell is full of people who have made that mistake. Leave your dog outside. Heaven goes by favor. If it went by 
merit you would stay out and the dog would go in you will be wanting to slip down at night and smuggle water to those poor little chaps the infant damned but don't you try it you would be caught and nobody in heaven would respect you after that explain to helen why i don't come if you can there were several pages of this counsel one paragraph was written in shorthand i meant to ask him to translate it but there were many other things to think of and i did not remember i spent most of each day with him merely sitting by the bed and reading while he himself read or dozed his nights were wakeful he found it easier to sleep by day and he liked to think that some one was there he became interested in hardy's jude and spoke of it with high approval urging me to read it he dwelt a good deal on the morals of it or rather on the lack of them he followed the tale to the end finishing it the afternoon before we sailed it was his last continuous reading i noticed when he slept that his breathing was difficult and i could see from day to day that he did not improve but each evening he would be gay and lively and he liked the entire family to gather around while he became really hilarious over the various happenings of the day it was only a few days before we sailed that the very severe attacks returned the night of the eighth was a hard one the doctors were summoned and it was only after repeated injections of morphine that the pain had been eased when i returned in the early morning he was sitting in his chair trying to sing after his old morning habit he took my hand and said well i had a picturesque night every pain i had was on exhibition he looked out the window at the sunlight on the bay and green dotted islands sparkling and bright in the liquid light he quoted that's hoffman anything left of hoffman no i said i must watch for the bermudian and see if she salutes he said presently the captain knows i am here sick and he blows two short whistles just as they come up behind that little island those are for me he said he could breathe easier if he could lean forward and i placed a card table in front of him his breakfast came in and a little later he became quite gay he drifted to macaulay again and spoke of king james plot to assassinate william the second and how the clergy had brought themselves to see that there was no difference between killing a king in battle and by assassination he had taken his seat by the window to watch for the bermudian she came down the bay presently her bright red stacks towering vividly above the green island it was a brilliant morning and the sky and the water a marvelous blue he watched her anxiously and without speaking suddenly there were two white puffs of steam and two short hoarse notes went up from her those are for me he said his face full of contentment captain fraser does not forget me there followed another bad night my room was only a little distance away and claude came for me i do not think any of us thought he would survive it but he slept at last or at least dozed in the morning he said that breast pain stands watch all night and the short breath all day i am losing enough sleep to supply a worn-out army i want a jugful of that hypnotic injection every night and every morning we began to fear now that he would not be able to sail on the twelfth but by great good fortune he had wonderfully improved by the twelfth so much so that i began to believe if once he could be in stormfield where the air was more vigorous he might easily survive the summer the humid atmosphere of the season increased the difficulty of his breathing that evening he was unusually merry mr and mrs allen and helen and myself went in to wish him good-night he was loath to let us leave but was reminded that 
he would sail in the morning, and that the doctor had insisted that he must be quiet and lie still in bed and rest. He was never one to be very obedient. A little later Mrs. Allen and I, in the sitting-room, heard someone walking softly outside on the veranda. We went out there, and he was marching up and down in his dressing-gown as unconcerned as if he were not an invalid at all. He hadn't felt sleepy, he said, and thought a little exercise would do him good. Perhaps it did, for he slept soundly that night, a great blessing. Mr. Allen had chartered a special tug to come to Bay House, landing in the morning, and take him to the ship. He was carried in a little hand-chair to the tug, and all the way out he seemed light-spirited, anything but an invalid. The sailors carried him again in the chair to his stateroom, and he bade those dear Bermuda friends good-bye, and we sailed away. As long as I remember anything, I shall remember the forty-eight hours of that homeward voyage. It was a brief two days as time is measured, but as time is lived, it has taken its place among those unmeasured periods by the side of which even years do not count. At first he seemed quite his natural self, and asked for a catalogue of the ship's library, and selected some memoirs of the Countess of Cardigan for his reading. He asked also for the second volume of Carlyle's French Revolution, which he had with him, we ran immediately into the more humid, more oppressive air of the Gulf Stream, and his breathing became at first difficult, then next to impossible. There were two large portholes, which I opened, but presently he suggested that it would be better outside. It was only a step to the main deck, and no passengers were there. I had a steamer chair brought, and with Claude supported him to it and bundled him with rugs, but it had grown damp and chilly and his breathing did not improve. It seemed to me that the end might come at any moment, and this thought was in his mind, too. For once, in the effort for breath, he managed to say, I am going. I shall be gone in a moment. Breath came, but I realized then that even his cabin was better than this. I steadied him back to his berth and shut out most of that deadly dampness. He asked for his hypnotic injunction, for his humor never left him, and though it was not yet the hour prescribed, I could not deny it. It was impossible for him to lie down, even to recline, without great distress. The opiate made him drowsy, and he longed for the relief of sleep. But when it seemed about to possess him, the struggle for air would bring him upright. During the more comfortable moments he spoke quite in the old way, and time and again made an effort to read, and reached for his pipe or a cigar, which lay in the little berth hammock at his side. I held the match, and he would take a puff or two with satisfaction. Then the piece of it would bring drowsiness, and while I supported him there would come a few moments, perhaps, of precious sleep. Only a few moments for the devil of suffocation was always lying in wait to bring him back for fresh tortures. Over and over again this was repeated, varied by him being steadied on his feet or sitting on the couch opposite the berth. In spite of his suffering, two dominant characteristics remained, the sense of humor and tender consideration for another. Once when the ship rolled and his hat fell from the hook, and made the circuit of the cabin floor, he said, The ship is passing the hat. Again he said, I am sorry for you, Payne, but I can't help it. I can't hurry this dying business. Can't you give me enough of the hypnotic injunction to put an end to me? He thought if I could arrange the pillows so he could sit straight up it would not be necessary to support him and then I could sit on the couch and read while he tried to doze. He wanted me to read Jude, he said, so we could talk about it. I got all the pillows I could and built them up around him and sat down with the book, and this seemed to give him contentment. He would doze off a little and then come up with a start, his piercing agate eyes searching me out to see if I was still there. Over and over, twenty times in an hour, this was repeated. When I could deny him no longer, I administered the opiate. 
but it never completely possessed him or gave him entire relief. As I looked at him there, so reduced in his estate, I could not but remember all the labor of his years and all the splendid honor which the world had paid to him. Something of this may have entered his mind, too, for once when I offered him some of the milder remedies which we had brought, he said, After forty years of public effort, I have become just a target for medicines. The program of change from birth to the floor, from floor to the couch, from the couch back to the berth among the pillows, was repeated again and again, he always thinking of the trouble he might be making, rarely uttering any complaint. But once, he said, I never guessed that I was going to outlive John Bigelow. And again, this is such a mysterious disease. If we only had a bill of particulars, we'd have something to swear at. Time and again he picked up Carlyle or the Cardigan memoirs, and read, or seemed to read, a few lines. But then the drowsiness would come and the book would fall. Time and again he attempted to smoke, or in his drowse simulated the motion of placing a cigar to his lips and puffing in the old way. Two dreams beset him in his momentary slumber, one of a play in which the title role of the general manager was always unfilled. He spoke of this now and then when it had passed, and it seemed to amuse him. The other was a discomfort. A college assembly was attempting to confer upon him some degree which he did not want. Once, half roused, he looked at me searchingly and asked, "'Isn't there something I can resign and be out of all this? They keep trying to confer that degree upon me, and I don't want it. Then realizing, he said, I am like a bird in a cage, always expecting to get out and always beaten back by the wires. And somewhat later, Oh, it is such a mystery, and it takes so long. Toward the evening of the first day, when it grew dark outside, he asked, how long have we been on this voyage? I answered that this was the end of the first day. How many more are there? he asked. Only one and two nights. We'll never make it, he said. It's an eternity. But we must on Clara's account, I told him, and I estimated that Clara would be more than halfway across the ocean by now. It is a losing race, he said. No ship can outsail death. It has been written, I do not know with what proof, that certain great dissenters have recanted with the approach of death, have become weak and afraid to ignore old traditions in the face of the great mystery. I wish to write here that Mark Twain, as he neared the end, showed never a single tremor of fear or even of reluctance. I have dwelt upon these hours when suffering was upon him, and the death the imminent shadow, in order to show that, at the end, he was as he had always been, neither more nor less, and never less than brave. Once, during a moment when he was comfortable and quite himself, he said earnestly, "'When I seem to be dying, I don't want to be stimulated back to life. I want to be made comfortable to go." There was not a vestige of hesitation. There was no grasping at straws, no suggestion of dread. Somehow those two days and nights went by. Once, when he was partially relieved by the opiate, I slept, while Claude watched. And again, in the fading end of the last night, when we had passed at length into the cold, bracing northern air, and breath had come back to him, and with it sleep. Relatives, physicians, and news-gatherers were at the dock to welcome him. He was awake, and the northern air had brightened him, 
though it was the chill, I suppose, that brought on the pains in his breast, which fortunately he had escaped during the voyage. It was not a prolonged attack, and it was, blessedly, the last one. An invalid carriage had been provided, and a compartment secured on the afternoon express to Reading, the same train that had taken him there two years before. Dr. Robert H. Halsey and Dr. Edward Quintard attended him, and he made the journey really in cheerful comfort, for he could breathe now, and in the relief came back old interests. Half reclining on the couch, he looked through the afternoon papers. It happened curiously that Charles Harvey Jenning, who something more than four years earlier had been so largely responsible for my association with Mark Twain, was on the same train, in the same coach, bound for his country place at New Hartford. Lounsbury was waiting with the carriage, and on that still, sweet April evening we drove him to Stormfield, much as we had driven him two years before. Now and then he mentioned the apparent backwardness of the season, for only a few of the trees were beginning to show their green. As we drove into the lane that led to the Stormfield entrance, he said, "'Can we see where you have built your billiard-room?' The gable showed above the trees, and I pointed it out to him. "'It looks quite imposing,' he said. I think it was the last outside interest he ever showed in anything. He had been carried from the ship and from the train, and when we drew up to Stormfield, where Mrs. Payne, with Katie Leary and others of the household, was waiting to greet him, he stepped from the carriage alone with something of his old lightness and with all his old courtliness, and offered each one his hand. Then, in the canvas chair which we had brought, Claude and I carried him upstairs to his room and delivered him to the physicians and to the comforts and blessed air of home. This was Thursday evening, April 14th, 1910. End of chapter 292 The Voyage Home Read by John Greenman Section 82 of Mark Twain, A Biography Part 2, 1907 to 1910 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 293. The Return to the Invisible. There would be two days more before Ossip and Clara Gabrilovich could arrive. Clemens remained fairly bright and comfortable during this interval, though he clearly was not improving. The physicians denied him the morphine now, as he no longer suffered acutely. But he craved it, and once, when I went in, he said rather mournfully, "'They won't give me the subcutaneous any more.' It was Sunday morning when Clara came. He was cheerful and able to talk quite freely. He did not dwell upon his condition, I think, but spoke rather of his plans for the summer. At all events he did not then suggest that he counted the end so near. But a day later it became evident to all that his stay was very brief." His breathing was becoming heavier, though it seemed not to give him much discomfort. His articulation also became affected. I think the last continuous talking he did was to Dr. Halsey on the evening of April 17th, the day of Clara's arrival. A mild opiate had been administered, and he said he wished to talk himself to sleep. He recalled one of his old subjects, dual personality, and discussed various instances that flitted through his mind, Jekyll and Hyde phases in literature and fact. He became drowsier as he talked. He said at last, "'This is a peculiar kind of disease. It does not invite you to read. It does not invite you to be read to. It does not invite you to talk, nor to enjoy any of the usual sick-room methods of treatment. What kind of a disease is that? Some kinds of sicknesses have pleasant features about them. You can read and smoke and have only to lie still. And a little later he added, 
it is singular very singular the laws of mentality vacuity i put out my hand to reach a book or newspaper which i have been reading most glibly and it isn't there not a suggestion of it he coughed violently and afterward commented if one gets to meddling with a cough it very soon gets the upper hand and is meddling with you that is my opinion of seventy-four years growth the news of his condition everywhere published brought great heaps of letters but he could not see them a few messages were reported to him at intervals he read a little Suetonius and Carlyle lay on the bed beside him, and he would pick them up as the spirit moved him and read a paragraph or a page. Sometimes when I saw him thus, the high color still in his face and the clear light in his eyes, I said, It is not reality. He is not going to die. On Tuesday the 19th he asked me to tell Clara to come and sing to him. It was a heavy requirement but she somehow found strength to sing some of the scotch airs which he loved and he seemed soothed and comforted when she came away he bade her good-bye saying that he might not see her again but he lingered through the next day and the next his mind was wandering a little on wednesday and his speech became less and less articulate but there were intervals when he was quite clear quite vigorous and he apparently suffered little we did not know it then, but the mysterious messenger of his birth-year, so long anticipated by him, appeared that night in the sky. The perihelion of Halley's Comet for 1835 was November 16th. For 1910 it was April 20th. On Thursday morning, the 21st, his mind was generally clear, and it was said by the nurses that he read a little from one of the volumes on his bed from the Suetonius, or from one of the volumes of Carlyle. Early in the forenoon he sent word by Clara that he wished to see me, and when I came in he spoke of two unfinished manuscripts which he wished me to throw away, as he briefly expressed it, for he had not many words left now. I assured him that I would take care of them, and he pressed my hand. It was his last word to me. Once or twice that morning he tried to write some request which he could not put into intelligible words, and once he spoke to Gabrilovich, who, he said, could understand him better than the others. Most of the time he dozed. Somewhat after midday, when Clara was by him, he roused up and took her hand, and seemed to speak with less effort. "'Good-bye,' he said, and Dr. Quintard, who was standing near, thought he added, if we meet but the words were very faint he looked at her for a little while without speaking then he sank into a doze and from it passed into a deeper slumber and did not heed us any more through that peaceful spring afternoon the life wave ebbed lower and lower it was about half past six and the sun lay just on the horizon when Dr. Quintard noticed that the breathing, which had gradually become more subdued, broke a little. There was no suggestion of any struggle. The noble head turned a little to one side, there was a fluttering sigh, and the breath that had been unceasing through seventy-four tumultuous years had stopped forever. He had entered into the estate envied so long, in his own words, the words of one of his latest memoranda, he had arrived at the dignity of death, the only earthly dignity that is not artificial, the only safe one. The others are traps that can beguile to humiliation death, the only immortal who treats us all alike, whose pity and whose peace 
and whose refuge are for all, the soiled and the pure, the rich and the poor, the loved and the unloved. End of chapter 293 The Return to the Invisible Read by John Greenman Section 83 of Mark Twain, A Biography Part 2, 1907 to 1910 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography By Albert Bigelow Payne Chapter 294 the last rites. It is not often that a whole world mourns. Nations have often mourned a hero, and races, but perhaps never before had the entire world really united in tender sorrow for the death of any man. In one of his aphorisms he wrote, Let us endeavor so to live that when we come to die, even the undertaker will be sorry. And it was thus that Mark Twain himself had lived. No man had ever so reached the heart of the world, and one may not even attempt to explain just why. Let us only say that it was because he was so limitlessly human that every other human heart, in whatever sphere or circumstance, responded to his touch. From every remote corner of the globe the cables of condolence swept in. Every printed sheet in Christendom was filled with lavish tribute. Pulpits forgot his heresies and paid him honor. No king ever died that received so rich a homage as his. To quote or to individualize would be to cheapen this vast offering. We took him to New York to the brick church and Dr. Henry Van Dyke spoke only a few simple words, and Joseph Twitchell came from Hartford and delivered, brokenly, a prayer from a heart wrung with double grief, for Harmony, his wife, was nearing the journey's end, and a telegram that summoned him to her deathbed came before the services ended. Mark Twain, dressed in the white he loved so well, lay there with the nobility of death upon him, while a multitude of those who loved him passed by and looked at his face for the last time. The flowers of which so many had been sent were banked around him, but on the casket itself lay a single laurel wreath which Dan Beard and his wife had woven from the laurel which grows on Stormfield Hill. He was never more beautiful than as he lay there, and it was an impressive scene to see those thousands file by regard him for a moment gravely, thoughtfully, and pass on. All sorts were there, rich and poor, some crossed themselves, some saluted, some paused a little to take a closer look, but no one offered even to pick a flower. Howells came, and in his book he says, I looked a moment at the face I knew so well, and it was patient with the patience I had so often seen in it, something of a puzzle, a great silent dignity, an assent to what must be from the depths of a nature whose tragical seriousness broke in the laughter which the unwise took for the whole of him. That night we went with him to Almira, and next day, a somber day of rain, he lay in those stately parlors that had seen his wedding day, and where Susie had lain, and Mrs. Clemens, and Jean, while Dr. Eastman spoke the words of peace which separate us from our mortal dead. Then in the quiet, steady rain of that Sunday afternoon we laid him beside those others where he sleeps well, though some have wished that, like De Soto, he might have been laid to rest in the bed of that great river which must always be associated with his name. End of chapter 294 The Last Rites Read by John Greenman Section 84 of Mark Twain, A Biography Part 2, 1907 to 1910 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne 
Chapter 295 Mark Twain's Religion There is such a finality about death. However interesting it may be as an experience, one cannot discuss it afterward with one's friends. I have thought it a great pity that Mark Twain could not discuss, with Howells, say, or with Twitchell, the sensation and the particulars of the change. Supposing there be a recognizable change, in that transition of which we have speculated so much, with such slender returns, no one ever debated the undiscovered country more than he. In his whimsical, semi-serious fashion, he had considered all the possibilities of the future state, orthodox and otherwise, and had drawn picturesquely original conclusions. He had sent Captain Stormfield in a dream to report the aspects of the early Christian heaven. He had examined the scientific aspects of the more subtle philosophies. He had considered spiritualism, transmigration, the various esoteric doctrines, and in the end he had logically made up his mind that death concludes all, while with that less logical hunger which survives in every human heart he had never ceased to expect an existence beyond the grave his disbelief and his pessimism were identical in their structure they were of his mind never of his heart once a woman said to him mr clemens you are not a pessimist you only think you are and she might have added with equal force and truth you are not a disbeliever in immortality you only think you are nothing could have conveyed more truly his attitude toward life and death his belief in god the creator was absolute but it was a god far removed from the creator of his early teaching every man builds his god according to his own capacities mark twain's god was of colossal proportions so vast indeed that the constellated stars were but molecules in his veins a god as big as space itself mark twain had many moods and he did not always approve of his own god but when he altered his conception it was likely to be in the direction of enlargement a further removal from the human conception and the problem of what we call our lives in nineteen o six he wrote see also eighteen seventy chapter seventy eight eighteen ninety nine chapter two hundred and five and various talks, 1906, 1907, etc. Let us now consider this real God, the genuine God, the great God, the sublime and supreme God, the authentic creator of the real universe, whose remotenesses are visited by comets only, comets unto which incredible distant neptune is merely an outpost a sandy hook to homeward bound specters of the deeps of space that have not glimpsed it before for generations a universe not made with hands and suited to an astronomical nursery but spread abroad through the illimitable reaches of space by the fiat of the real god just mentioned by comparison with whom the gods whose myriads infest the feeble imaginations of men are as a swarm of gnats scattered and lost in the infinitudes of the empty sky at an earlier period the date not exactly fixable but the stationery used and the handwriting suggest the early eighties he set down a few concisely written pages of conclusions conclusions from which he did not deviate materially in after years the document follows i believe in god the almighty i do not believe he has ever sent a message to man by anybody or delivered one to him by word of mouth or made himself visible to mortal eyes at any time in any place i believe that the old and new testaments 
were imagined and written by man, and that no line in them was authorized by God, much less inspired by Him. I think the goodness, the justice, and the mercy of God are manifested in His works. I perceive that they are manifested toward me in this life. The logical conclusion is that they will be manifested toward me in the life to come, if there should be one. I do not believe in special providences. I believe that the universe is governed by strict and immutable laws. If one man's family is swept away by a pestilence, and another man's spared, it is only the law working. God is not interfering in that small matter, either against the one man or in favor of the other. I cannot see how eternal punishment hereafter could accomplish any good end. Therefore, I am not able to believe in it. To chasten a man in order to perfect him might be reasonable enough. To annihilate him when he shall have proved himself incapable of reaching perfection might be reasonable enough. But to roast him forever for the mere satisfaction of seeing him roast would not be reasonable. Even the atrocious God imagined by the Jews would tire of the spectacle eventually. There may be a hereafter, and there may not be. I am wholly indifferent about it. If I am appointed to live again, I feel sure it will be for some more sane and useful purpose than to flounder about for ages in a lake of fire and brimstone for having violated a confusion of ill-defined and contradictory rules said but not evidenced to be of divine institution if annihilation is to follow death i shall not be aware of the annihilation and therefore shall not care a straw about it i believe that the world's moral laws are the outcome of the world's experience it needed no god to come down out of heaven to tell men that murder and theft and the other immortalities were bad both for the individual who commits them and for society which suffers from them if i break all these moral laws I cannot see how I injure God by it, for he is beyond the reach of injury from me. I could as easily injure a planet by throwing mud at it. It seems to me that my misconduct could only injure me and other men. I cannot benefit God by obeying these moral laws i could as easily benefit the planet by withholding my mud let these sentences be read in the light of the fact that i believe i have received moral laws only from man none whatever from god Consequently, I do not see why I should be either punished or rewarded hereafter for the deeds I do here. 
if the tragedies of life shook his faith in the goodness and justice and the mercy of god as manifested toward himself he at any rate never questioned that the wider scheme of the universe was attuned to the immutable law which contemplates nothing less than absolute harmony i never knew him to refer to this particular document but he never destroyed it and never amended it nor is it likely that he would have done either had it been presented to him for consideration even during the last year of his life he was never intentionally dogmatic in a memorandum on a fly-leaf of moncure d conway's sacred anthology he wrote religion the easy confidence with which i know another man's religion is folly teaches me to suspect that my own is also mark twain nineteenth century a d and in another note i would not interfere with any one's religion either to strengthen it or to weaken it i am not able to believe one's religion can affect his hereafter one way or the other no matter what that religion may be but it may easily be a great comfort to him in this life hence it is a valuable possession to him mark twain's religion was a faith too wide for doctrines a benevolence too limitless for creeds from the beginning he strove against oppression sham and evil in every form he despised meanness he resented with every drop of blood in him anything that savored of persecution or a curtailment of human liberties it was a religion identified with his daily life and his work he lived as he wrote and he wrote as he believed his favorite weapon was humor good humor with logic behind it a sort of glorified truth it was truth wearing a smile of gentleness hence all the more quickly heeded he will be remembered with the greatest humorists of all time says howells with cervantes with swift or with any others worthy of his company none of them was his equal in humanity mark twain understood the needs of men because he was himself supremely human in one of his dictations he said i have found that there is no ingredient of the race which i do not possess in either a small or a large way when it is small as compared with the same ingredient in somebody else there is still enough of it for all the purposes of examination with his strength he had inherited the weaknesses of our kind with him as with another a myriad of dreams and schemes and purposes daily flitted by with him as with another the spirit of desire led him often to a high mountain-top and was not rudely put aside but lingeringly and often invited to return with him as with another a crowd of jealousies and resentments and wishes for the ill of others daily went seething and scorching along the highways of the soul with him as with another regret remorse and shame stood at the bedside during long watches of the night and in the end with him the better thing triumphed forgiveness and generosity and justice in a word humanity certain of his aphorisms and memoranda each in itself constitutes an epitome of mark twain's creed his paraphrase when in doubt tell the truth is one of these and he embodied his whole attitude toward infinity when in one of his stray pencilings he wrote why even poor little ungodlike man holds himself responsible for the welfare of his child to the extent of his ability it is all that we require of god end of chapter 295 mark twain's religion read by john greenman
Section 85 of Mark Twain, A Biography, Part 2, 1907 to 1910. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Chapter 296, Postscript. Every life is a drama, a play in all its particulars, comedy, farce, tragedy, all the elements are there. To examine in detail any life, however conspicuous or obscure, is to become amazed, not only at the inevitable sequence of events, but at the interlinking of details, often far removed, into a marvelously intricate pattern which no art can hope to reproduce, and can only feebly imitate. The biographer may reconstruct an episode, present a picture, or reflect a mood by which the reader is enabled to feel something of the glow of personality, and know, perhaps, a little of the substance of the past. In so far as the historian can accomplish this, his work is a success. At best, his labor will be pathetically incomplete, for whatever its detail and its resemblance to life, these will record mainly but an outward expression behind which was the mighty sweep and tumult of unwritten thought. The overwhelming proportion of any life which no other human soul can ever really know. Mark Twain's appearance on the stage of the world was a succession of dramatic moments. He was always exactly in the setting. Whatever he did, or whatever came to him, was timed for the instant of greatest effect. At the end he was more widely observed and loved and honored than ever before, and at the right moment, and in the right manner, he died. How little one may tell of such a life as his! He traveled always such a broad and brilliant highway, with plumes flying and crowds following after. Such a whirling panorama of life and death and change! I have written so much, and yet I have put so much aside, and often the best things, it seemed afterward, perhaps because each in its way was best, and the variety infinite. One may only strive to be faithful, and I would have made it better if I could. End of chapter 296 Postscript Read by John Greenman Section 86 of Mark Twain, A Biography. Appendixes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography. By Albert Bigelow Payne. Appendix A. Letter from Orion Clemens to Miss Wood concerning Henry Clemens. See Chapter 26. Keokuk, Iowa, October 3, 1858. Miss Wood. My mother, having sent me your kind letter, with a request that myself and wife should write to you, I hasten to do so. In my memory I can go away back to Henry's infancy. I see his large blue eyes intently regarding my father when he rebuked him for his credulity in giving full faith to the boyish idea of planting his marbles, expecting a crop therefrom. Then comes back the recollection of the time when, standing we three alone by our father's grave, I told them always to remember that brothers should be kind to each other. Afterward I see Henry returning from school with his books for the last time. He must go into my printing office. He learned rapidly. A word of encouragement or a word of discouragement told upon his organization electrically. I could see the effects in his day's work. Sometimes I would say, Henry! He would stand full front with his eyes upon mine, all attention. If I commanded him to do something, without a word he was off instantly, probably in a run. If a cat was to be drowned or shot, Sam, though unwilling yet firm, was selected for the work. If a stray kitten was to be fed and taken care of, Henry was expected to attend to it, and he would faithfully do so. 
so they grew up and many was the grave lecture commenced by ma to the effect that sam was misleading and spoiling henry but the lectures were never concluded for sam would reply with a witticism or dry unexpected humor that would drive the lecture clean out of my mother's mind and change it to a laugh those were happier days my mother as lively as any girl of sixteen she is not so now and sister pamela i have described in describing henry for she was his counterpart the blow falls crushingly on her but the boys grew up sam a rugged brave quick-tempered generous-hearted fellow henry quiet observing thoughtful leaning on sam for protection sam and i too leaning on him for knowledge picked up from conversation or books for henry seemed never to forget anything and devoted much of his leisure hours to reading henry is gone his death was horrible how i could have sat by him hung over him watched day and night every change of expression and ministered to every want in my power that i could discover this was denied to me but sam whose organization is such as to feel the utmost extreme of every feeling was there both his capacity of enjoyment and his capacity of suffering are greater than mine and knowing how it would have affected me to see so sad a scene i can somewhat appreciate sam's sufferings in this time of great trouble when my two brothers whose heart-strings have always been a part of my own were suffering the utmost stretch of mortal endurance you were there like a good angel to aid and console and i bless and thank you for it with my whole heart i thank all who helped them then i thank them for the flowers they sent to henry for the tears that fell for their sufferings and when he died and all of them for all the kind attentions they bestowed upon the poor boys we thank the physicians and we shall always gratefully remember the kindness of the gentleman who at so much expense to himself enabled us to deposit henry's remains by our father with many kind wishes for your future welfare i remain your earnest friend respectfully orion clemens end of appendix a letter from orion clemens to miss wood concerning henry clemens read by john greenman section eighty seven of mark twain a biography appendixes this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Appendix B. Mark Twain's Burlesque of Captain Isaiah Sellers See Chapter 27. The item which served as a text for the Sergeant Fathom communication was as follows. Vicksburg, May 4, 1859 My opinion for the benefit of the citizens of New Orleans the water is higher this far up than it has been since 1815. My opinion is that the water will be four feet deep in Canal Street before the first of next June. Mrs. Turner's plantation at the head of Big Black Island is all under water, and it has not been since 1815. I, Sellers, Captain Sellers, as in this case, sometimes signed his own name to his communications the burlesque introductory our friend sergeant fathom one of the oldest cub pilots on the river and now on the railroad line steamer trombone sends us a rather bad account concerning the state of the river sergeant fathom is a cub of much experience and although we are loath to coincide in his view of the matter we give his note a place in our columns only hoping that his prophecy will not be verified in this instance while introducing the sergeant we consider it but simple justice we quote from a friend of his to remark that he is distinguished for being in pilot phrase close 
as well as superhumanly safe. It is a well-known fact that he has made 1,450 trips in the New Orleans and St. Louis trade, without causing serious damage to a steamboat. This astonishing success is attributed to the fact that he seldom runs his boat after early candlelight. It is related of the sergeant that upon one occasion he actually ran the chute of Glasscox Island downstream in the night, and at a time, too, when the river was scarcely more than bank full. His method of accomplishing this feat proves what we have just said of his safeness. He sounded the chute first, and then built a fire at the head of the island to run by. As to the sergeant's closeness, we have heard it whispered that he once went up to the right of the old hen. Glasscox Island and the old hen were phenomenally safe places, but this is probably a pardonable little exaggeration, prompted by the love and admiration in which he is held by various ancient dames of his acquaintance. For albeit the sergeant may have already numbered the allotted years of man, still his form is erect, his step is firm, his hair retains its sable hue, and, more than all, he hath a winning way about him an air of docility and sweetness if you will and a smoothness of speech together with an exhaustless fund of funny sayings and lastly an overflowing stream without beginning or middle or end of astonishing reminiscences of the ancient mississippi which taken together form a tout ensemble which is sufficient excuse for the tender epithet which is by common consent applied to him by all those ancient dames aforesaid of she arming creature as the sergeant has been longer on the river and is better acquainted with it than any other cub extant his remarks are entitled to far more consideration and are always read with the deepest interest by high and low rich and poor from kehoe to kamchatka for let it be known that his fame extends to the uttermost parts of the earth. The Communication R. R. Steamer Trombone Vicksburg, May 8, 1859 The river from New Orleans up to Natchez is higher than it has been since the niggers were executed, which was in the fall of 1813, and my opinion is that if the rise continues at this rate, the water will be on the roof of the St. Charles Hotel before the middle of January. The point at Cairo, which has not even been moistened by the river since 1813, is now entirely under water. However, Mr. Editor, the inhabitants of the Mississippi Valley should not act precipitately and sell their plantations at a sacrifice on account of this prophecy of mine for I shall proceed to convince them of a great fact in regard to this matter, viz. that the tendency of the Mississippi is to rise less and less high every year, with an occasional variation of the rule, that such has been the case for many centuries, and eventually that it will cease to rise at all. Therefore, I would hint to the planters, as we say in an innocent little parlor game commonly called draw, that if they can only stand the rise this time, they may enjoy the comfortable assurance that the old river's banks will never hold a full again during their natural lives. In the summer of 1763 I came down the river on the old first jubilee. She was new then, however a singular sort of single-engine boat, with a Chinese captain and a Choctaw crew, forecastle on her stern, wheels in the center, and the jackstaff nowhere, for I steered her with a window-shutter, and when we wanted to land we sent a line ashore and rounded her too with a yoke of oxen. Well, sir, we wooded off the top of the big bluff above Selma, the only dry land visible, and waited there three weeks, swapping knives and playing seven-up with the Indians, waiting for the river to fall. Finally it fell about a hundred feet, and we went on. 
one day we rounded too and i got in a horse trough which my partner borrowed from the indians up there at selma while they were at prayers and went down to sound around number eight and while i was gone my partner got around on the hills at hickman after three days labor we finally succeeded in sparring her off with a capstan bar and went on to memphis by the time we got there the river had subsided to such an extent that we were able to land where the gayoso house now stands we finished loading at memphis and loaded part of the stone for the present st louis courthouse which was then in the process of erection to be taken up on our return trip you can form some conception by these memoranda of how high the water was in 1763 in 1775 it did not rise so high by thirty feet in 1790 it missed the original mark at least sixty-five feet in 1797 one hundred and fifty feet and in 1804 nearly two hundred and fifty feet these were high water years the high waters since then have been so insignificant that i have scarcely taken the trouble to notice them thus you will perceive that the planters need not feel uneasy the river may make an occasional spasmodic effort at a flood but the time is approaching when it will cease to rise altogether in conclusion sir i will condescend to hint at the foundation of these arguments when me and de soto discovered the mississippi i could stand at bolivar landing several miles above roaring waters bar and pitch a biscuit to the main shore on the other side and in low water we waded across at donaldsonville the gradual widening and deepening of the river is the whole secret of the matter yours etc sergeant fathom end of appendix b mark twain's burlesque of captain isaiah sellers read by john greenman section eighty eight of mark twain a biography appendixes this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow Payne. appendix c one mark twain's empire city hoax see chapter forty one the latest sensation a victim to jeremy diddling trustees he cuts his throat from ear to ear scalps his wife and dashes out the brains of six helpless children from abram curry who arrived here yesterday afternoon from carson we learn the following particulars concerning a bloody massacre which was committed in ormsby county night before last it seems that during the past six months a man named p hopkins or philip hopkins has been residing with his family in the old log house just at the edge of the great pine forest which lies between empire city and dutch nicks the family consisted of nine children five girls and four boys the oldest of the group mary being nineteen years old and the youngest tommy about a year and a half twice in the past two months mrs hopkins while visiting carson expressed fears concerning the sanity of her husband remarking that of late he had been subject to fits of violence and that during the prevalence of one of these he had threatened to take her life it was mrs hopkins misfortune to be given to exaggeration however and but little attention was given to what she said about ten o'clock on monday evening hopkins dashed into carson on horseback with his throat cut from ear to ear and bearing in his hand a reeking scalp from which the warm smoking blood was still dripping and fell in a dying condition in front of the magnolia saloon hopkins expired in the course of five minutes without speaking the long red hair of the scalp he bore marked it as that of mrs hopkins a number of citizens headed by sheriff gashery mounted at once and rode down to hopkins house where a ghastly scene met their eyes the scalpless corpse of mrs hopkins lay across the threshold with her head split open and her right hand almost severed from the wrist near her lay the axe with which the murderous deed had been committed 
in one of the bedrooms six of the children were found one in bed and the others scattered about the floor they were all dead their brains had evidently been dashed out with a club and every mark about them seemed to have been made with a blunt instrument the children must have struggled hard for their lives as articles of clothing and broken furniture were strewed about the room in the utmost confusion julia and emma aged respectively fourteen and seventeen were found in the kitchen bruised and insensible but it is thought their recovery is possible the eldest girl mary must have sought refuge in her terror in the garret as her body was found there frightfully mutilated and the knife with which her wounds had been inflicted still sticking in her side the two girls julia and emma who had recovered sufficiently to be able to talk yesterday morning declare that their father knocked them down with a billet of wood and stamped on them they think they were the first attacked they further state that hopkins had shown evidence of derangement all day but had exhibited no violence he flew into a passion and attempted to murder them because they advised him to go to bed and compose his mind curry says hopkins was about forty-two years of age and a native of western pennsylvania he was always affable and polite and until very recently no one had ever heard of his ill-treating his family he had been a heavy owner in the best mines of virginia and gold hill but when the san francisco papers exposed our game of cooking dividends in order to bolster up our stocks he grew afraid and sold out and invested an immense amount in the spring valley water company of san francisco he was advised to do this by a relative of his one of the editors of the san francisco bulletin who had suffered pecuniarily by the dividend cooking system as applied to the daney mining company recently hopkins had not long ceased to own in the various claims on the comstock load however when several dividends were cooked on his newly acquired property their water totally dried up and spring valley stock went down to nothing it is presumed that this misfortune drove him mad and resulted in his killing himself and the greater portion of his family the newspapers of san francisco permitted this water company to go on borrowing money and cooking dividends under cover of which the cunning financiers crept out of the tottering concern leaving the crash to come upon poor and unsuspecting stockholders without offering to expose the villainy at work we hope the fearful massacre detailed above may prove the saddest result of their silence two news gathering with mark twain alfred doten's son gives the following account of a reporting trip made by his father and mark twain when the two were on comstock papers my father and mark twain were once detailed to go over to como and write up some new mines that had been discovered over there my father was on the gold hill news he and mark had not met before but became promptly acquainted and were soon calling each other by their first names they went to a little hotel at carson agreeing to do their work there together next morning when morning came they set out and suddenly on a corner mark stopped and turned to my father saying by gracious alf isn't that a brewery it is mark let's go in they did so and remained there all day swapping yarns sipping beer and lunching going back to the hotel that night the next morning precisely the same thing occurred when they were on the same corner mark stopped as if he had never been there before and said good gracious alf isn't that a brewery it is mark let's go in so again they went in and again stayed all day this happened again the next morning and the next then my father became uneasy a letter had come from gold hill asking him where his report of the mines was they agreed that next morning 
they would really begin the story that they would climb to the top of the hill that overlooked the mines and write it from there but the next morning as before mark was surprised to discover the brewery and once more they went in a few moments later however a man who knew all about the mines a mining engineer connected with them came in he was a godsend my father set down a valuable informing story while mark got a lot of entertaining mining yarns out of him next day virginia city and gold hill were gaining information from my father's article and the entertainment from mark's story of the mines end of appendix c one mark twain's empire city hoax the latest sensation and two news gathering with mark twain read by john greenman section eighty nine of mark twain a biography appendixes this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne appendix d from mark twain's first lecture delivered october second eighteen sixty six see chapter fifty four hawaiian importance to america after a full elucidation of the sugar industry of the sandwich islands its profits and possibilities he said i have dwelt upon this subject to show you that these islands have a genuine importance to america an importance which is not generally appreciated by our citizens they pay revenues into the united states treasury now amounting to over a half a million a year i do not know what the sugar yield of the world is now but ten years ago according to the patent office reports it was eight hundred thousand hogsheads the sandwich islands properly cultivated by go-ahead americans are capable of providing one-third as much themselves with the pacific railroad built the great china mail line of steamers touching at honolulu we could stock the islands with americans and supply a third of the civilized world with sugar and with the silkiest longest stapled cotton this side of the sea islands and the very best quality of rice the property has got to fall to some heir and why not the united states native passion for funerals they are very fond of funerals big funerals are their main weakness fine grave clothes fine funeral appointments and a long procession are things they take a generous delight in they are fond of their chief and their king they reverence them with a genuine reverence and love them with a warm affection and often look forward to the happiness they will experience in burying them they will beg borrow or steal money enough and flock from all the islands to be present at a royal funeral on oahu years ago a kanaka and his wife were condemned to be hanged for murder they received the sentence with manifest satisfaction because it gave an opening for a funeral you know all they care for is a funeral it makes but little difference to them whose it is they would as soon attend their own funeral as anybody else's this couple were people of consequence and had landed estates 
they sold every foot of ground they had and laid it out in fine clothes to be hung in and the woman appeared on the scaffold in a white satin dress and slippers and fathoms of gaudy ribbon and the man was arrayed in a gorgeous vest blue claw hammer coat and brass buttons and white kid gloves as the noose was adjusted around his neck he blew his nose with a grand theatrical flourish so as to show his embroidered white handkerchief i never never knew of a couple who enjoyed hanging more than they did view from haleakala it is a solemn pleasure to stand upon the summit of the extinct crater of haleakala ten thousand feet above the sea and gaze down into its awful crater twenty-seven miles in circumference and two hundred and twenty feet deep and to picture to yourself the seething world of fire that once swept up out of the tremendous abyss ages ago the prodigious funnel is dead and silent now and even has bushes growing far down in its bottom where the deep sea line could hardly have reached in the old times when the place was filled with liquid lava these bushes look like parlor shrubs from the summit where you stand and the file of visitors moving through them on their mules is diminished to a detachment of mice almost and to them you standing so high up against the sun ten thousand feet above their heads look no larger than a grasshopper this in the morning but at three or four in the afternoon a thousand little patches of white clouds like handfuls of wool come drifting noiselessly one after another into the crater like a procession of shrouded phantoms and circle round and round the vast sides and settle gradually down and mingle together until the colossal basin is filled to the brim with snowy fog and all its seared and desolate wonders are hidden from sight and then you may turn your back to the crater and look far away upon the broad valley below with its sugar houses glinting like white specks in the distance and the great sugar fields diminished to green veils amid the lighter tinted verdure around them and abroad upon the limitless ocean but i should not say you look down you look up at these things you are ten thousand feet above them but yet you seem to stand in a basin with the green islands here and there and the valleys and the wide ocean and the remote snow peak of mauna loa all raised up before and above you and pictured out like a brightly tinted map hung at the ceiling of a room you look up at everything nothing is below you it has a singular and startling effect to see a miniature world thus seemingly hung in mid-air but soon the white clouds come trooping along in ghostly squadrons and mingle together in heavy masses a quarter of a mile below you and shut out 
everything completely hide the sea and all the earth save the pinnacle you stand on as far as the eye can reach it finds nothing to rest upon but a boundless plain of clouds tumbled into all manner of fantastic shapes a billowy ocean of wool a flame with the gold and purple and crimson splendors of the setting sun and so firm does this grand cloud pavement look that you can hardly persuade yourself that you could not walk upon it that if you stepped upon it you would plunge headlong and astonish your friends at dinner ten thousand feet below standing on that peak with all the world shut out by that vast plain of clouds a feeling of loneliness comes over a man which suggests to his mind the last man at the flood perched high upon the last rock with nothing visible on any side but a mournful waste of waters and the ark departing dimly through the distant mists and leaving him to storm and night and solitude and death notice of mark twain's lecture the trouble is over the inimitable mark twain delivered himself last night of his first lecture on the sandwich islands or anything else some time before the hour appointed to open his head the academy of music on pine street was densely crowded with one of the most fashionable audiences it was ever my privilege to witness during my long residence in this city the elite of the town were there and so was the governor of the state occupying one of the boxes whose rotund face was suffused with a halo of mirth during the whole entertainment the audience promptly notified mark by the usual sign stamping that the auspicious hour had arrived and presently the lecturer came sidling and swinging out from the left of the stage his very manner produced a generally vociferous laugh from the assemblage he opened with an apology by saying that he had partly succeeded in obtaining a band but at the last moment the party engaged backed out he explained that he had hired a man to play the trombone but he on learning that he was the only person engaged came at the last moment and informed him that he could not play this placed mark in a bad predicament and wishing to know his reasons for deserting him at that critical moment he replied that he wasn't going to make a fool of himself by sitting up there on the stage and blowing his horn all by himself after the applause subsided he assumed a very grave countenance and commenced his remarks proper with the following well-known sentence when in the course of human events etc he lectured fully an hour and a quarter and his humorous sayings were interspersed with geographical agricultural and statistical remarks sometimes branching off and reaching beyond soaring in the very choicest language up to the very pinnacle of descriptive power end of appendix d from mark twain's first lecture delivered october second eighteen sixty six read by john greenman section ninety of mark twain a biography appendixes this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne appendix e from the jumping frog book mark twain's first published volume see chapters fifty eight and fifty nine one advertisement mark twain is too well known to the public to require a formal introduction at my hands by his story of the frog he scaled the heights of popularity at a single jump and won for himself the sobriquet of the wild 
humorist of the Pacific Slope. He is also known to fame as the moralist of the Maine, and it is not unlikely that as such he will go down to posterity. It is in his secondary character as humorist, however, rather than the primal one of moralist, that I aim to present him in the present volume, and here a ready explanation will be found for the somewhat fragmentary character of many of these sketches, for it was necessary to snatch threads of humor wherever they could be found, very often detaching them from serious articles and moral essays with which they were woven and entangled originally written for newspaper publication many of the articles referred to events of the day the interest of which has now passed away and contained local allusions which the general reader would fail to understand in such cases excision became imperative further than this remark or comment is unnecessary mark twain never resorts to tricks of spelling nor rhetorical buffoonery for the purpose of provoking a laugh the vein of his humor runs too rich and deep to make surface gliding necessary, but there are few who can resist the quaint similes, keen satire, and hard good sense which form the staple of his writing. J. P. 2. From Answers to Correspondence Moral Statistician I don't want any of your statistics. I took your whole batch and lit my pipe with it. I hate your kind of people. You are always ciphering out how much a man's health is injured, and how much his intellect is impaired, and how many pitiful dollars and cents he wastes in the course of ninety-two years' indulgence in the fatal practice of smoking, and in the equally fatal practice of drinking coffee, and in playing billiards occasionally, and in taking a glass of wine at dinner, etc., etc., etc. Of course, you can save money by denying yourself all these vicious little enjoyments for fifty years, but then what can you do with it? What use can you put it to? Money can't save your infinitesimal soul. All the use that money can be put to is to purchase comfort and enjoyment in this life. Therefore, as you are an enemy to comfort and enjoyment, where is the use in accumulating cash. It won't do for you to say that you can use it to better purpose in furnishing good table, and in charities, and in supporting tract societies, because you know yourself that you people who have no petty vices are never known to give away a cent and that you stint yourselves so in the matter of food that you are always feeble and hungry, and you never dare to laugh in the daytime, for fear some poor wretch, seeing you in good humor, will try to borrow a dollar of you, and in church you are always down on your knees with your eyes buried in the cushion, when the contribution box comes around, and you never give the revenue officers a true statement of your income. Now you all know all these things yourselves, don't you? Very well, then. What is the use of your stringing out your miserable lives to a clean and withered old age? What is the use of your saving money that is so utterly worthless to you? In a word, why don't you go off somewhere and die, and not be always trying to seduce people into becoming as ornery and unlovable as you are yourselves, by your ceaseless and villainous 
moral statistics. Now, I don't approve of dissipation, and I don't indulge in it either, but I haven't a particle of confidence in a man who has no redeeming petty vices whatever, and so I don't want to hear from you any more. I think you are the very same man who read me a long lecture last week about the degrading vice of smoking cigars, and then came back in my absence with your vile, reprehensible, fireproof gloves on, and carried off my beautiful parlor stove. 3. From A Strange Dream Example of Mark Twain's early descriptive writing. In due time I stood, with my companion, on the wall of the vast cauldron which the natives, ages ago, named Halemaumau, the abyss wherein they were wont to throw the remains of their chiefs, to the end that vulgar feet might never tread above them. We stood there at dead of night, a mile above the level of the sea, and looked down a thousand feet upon a boiling, surging, roaring ocean of fire, shaded our eyes from the blinding glare, and gazed far away over the crimson waves with a vague notion that a supernatural fleet manned by demons and freighted with the damned might presently sail up out of the remote distance, started when tremendous thunderbursts shook the earth, and followed with fascinated eyes the grand jets of molten lava that sprang high up toward the zenith and exploded in a world of fiery spray that lit up the somber heavens with an infernal splendor. What is your little bonfire of Vesuvius to this? My ejaculation roused my companion from his reverie, and we fell into a conversation appropriate to the occasion and the surroundings. We came at last to speak of the ancient custom of casting the bodies of dead chieftains into this fearful cauldron, and my comrade, who is of the blood royal, mentioned that the founder of his race, old King Kamehameha the first, that invincible old pagan Alexander, had found other sepulture than the burning depths of the Halimamau. I grew interested at once. I knew that the mystery of what became of the corpse of the warrior king had never been fathomed. I was aware that there was a legend connected with this matter, and I felt as if there could be no more fitting time to listen to it than the present. The descendant of the Kamehamehas said the dead king was brought in royal state down the long, winding road that descends from the rim of the crater to the scorched and chasm-riven plain that lies between the Halemaumau and those beetling walls yonder in the distance. The guards were set, and the troops of mourners began the weird wail for the departed. In the middle of the night came a sound of innumerable voices in the air, and the rush of invisible wings. The funeral torches wavered, burned blue, and went out. The mourners and watchers fell to the ground, paralyzed by fright, and many minutes elapsed before anyone dared to move or speak, for they believed 
that the phantom messengers of the dread goddess of fire had been in their midst when at last a torch was lighted the bier was vacant the dead monarch had been spirited away end of appendix e from the jumping frog book mark twain's first published volume and from a strange dream read by john greenman section ninety one of mark twain a biography appendixes this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Appendix F The Innocents Abroad See Chapter 60 New York Herald Editorial on the Return of the Quaker City Pilgrimage, November 19, 1867 In yesterday's Herald we published a most amusing letter from the pen of that most amusing American genius, Mark Twain, giving an account of that most amusing of all modern pilgrimages, the pilgrimage of the Quaker City. It has been amusing all through this Quaker City affair. It might have become more serious than amusing if the ship had been sold at Jaffa, Alexandria, or Yalta in the Black Sea, as it appears might have happened in such a case the passengers would have been more effectually sold than the ship the descendants of the puritan pilgrims have naturally enough some of them an affection for ships but if all that is said about this religious cruise be true they have also a singularly sharp eye to business it was scarcely wise on the part of the pilgrims although it was well for the public that so strange a genius as mark twain should have found admission into the sacred circle we are not aware whether mr twain intends giving us a book on this pilgrimage but we do know that a book written from his own peculiar standpoint giving an account of the characters and events on board ship and of the scenes which the pilgrims witnessed would command an almost unprecedented sale there are varieties of genius peculiar to america of one of these varieties mark twain is a striking specimen for the development of his peculiar genius he has never had a more fitting opportunity besides there are some things which he knows and which the world ought to know about this last edition of the mayflower end of appendix f the innocents abroad see chapter sixty read by john greenman section ninety two of mark twain a biography appendixes this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography albert bigelow payne appendix g Mark Twain at the Correspondence Club, Washington. See Chapter 63. Woman. A Eulogy of the Fair Sex. The Washington Correspondence Club held its anniversary on Saturday night. Mr. Clemens, better known as Mark Twain, responded to the toast, Woman, the pride of the professions and the jewel of ours. He said, Mr. President, i do not know why i should have been singled out to receive the greatest distinction of the evening for so the office of replying to the toast to woman has been regarded in every age applause i do not know why i have received this distinction unless it be that I am a trifle less homely than the other members of the club. But be this as it may, Mr. President, I am proud of the position, and you could not have chosen anyone who would have accepted it more gladly or labored with a 
heartier good will to do the subject justice than I, because, sir, I love the sex. Laughter. I love all the women, sir, irrespective of age or color. Laughter. Human intelligence cannot estimate what we owe to woman, sir. She sews on our buttons. Laughter. She mends our clothes. Laughter. She ropes us in at the church fairs. She confides in us. She tells us whatever she can find out about the private affairs of the neighbors. She gives good advice and plenty of it. She gives us a piece of her mind sometimes, and sometimes all of it. She soothes our aching brows. She bears our children, ours as a general thing. This last sentence appears in Twain's published speeches and may have been added later. David Widger, Project Gutenberg in all relations of life sir it is but just and a graceful tribute to woman to say of her that she is a brick great laughter wheresoever you place woman sir in whatsoever position or estate she is an ornament to that place she occupies and a treasure to the world here Mr. Twain paused, looked inquiringly at his hearers, and remarked that the applause should come in at this point. It came in. Mr. Twain resumed his eulogy. Look at the noble names of history. Look at Cleopatra. Look at Desdemona. Look at Florence Nightingale. Look at Joan of Arc. Look at Lucretia Borgia. Disapprobation expressed well said mr twain scratching his head doubtfully suppose we let lucretia slide look at joyce heth look at mother eve i repeat sir look at the illustrious names of history look at the widow mccree look at lucy stone look at elizabeth caddy stanton look at george francis train great laughter and sir I say with bowed head and deepest veneration, look at the mother of Washington. She raised a boy that could not lie, could not lie, applause. But he never had any chance. It might have been different with him if he had belonged to a newspaper correspondence club laughter groans hisses cries of put him out mark looked around placidly upon his excited audience and resumed i repeat sir that in whatsoever position you place a woman she is an ornament to society and a treasure to the world as a sweetheart she has few equals and no superior laughter as a cousin she is convenient as a wealthy grandmother with an incurable distemper she is precious as a wet nurse she has no equal among men laughter what sir would the people of this earth be without woman they would be scarce sir mighty scarce another line added later in the published speeches d w then let us cherish her let us protect her let us give her our support our encouragement our sympathy ourselves if we get a chance laughter but jesting aside mr president woman is lovable gracious kind of heart beautiful worthy of all respect of all esteem of all deference not any here 
will refuse to drink her health right cordially, for each and every one of us has personally known, loved, and honored the very best one of them all, his own mother. Applause. End of Appendix G. Mark Twain at the Correspondence Club, Washington. Read by John Greenman. Section 93 of Mark Twain, A Biography. Appendixes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography. By Albert Bigelow Payne. Appendix H. Announcement for Lecture of July 2nd, 1868. See Chapter 66. The Public to Mark Twain. Correspondence. San Francisco, June 30th. Mr. Mark Twain. Dear Sir, hearing that you are about to sail for New York in the P.M.S.S. Company's steamer of the 6th July to publish a book, and learning with the deepest concern that you propose to read a chapter or two of that book in public before you go, we take this method of expressing our cordial desire that you will not. We beg and implore you, do not. There is a limit to human endurance we are your personal friends we have your welfare at heart we desire to see you prosper and it is upon these accounts and upon these only that we urge you to desist from the new atrocity you contemplate yours truly sixty names including bret hart major general ord major general halleck the orphan asylum and various benevolent societies citizens on foot and horseback and fifteen hundred in the steerage reply san francisco june thirtieth to the fifteen hundred and others it seems to me that your course is entirely unprecedented heretofore when lecturers singers actors and other frauds have said they were about to leave town, you have always been the very first people to come out in a card beseeching them to hold on for just one night more and inflict just one more performance on the public. But as soon as I want to take a farewell benefit, you come after me with a card signed by the whole community and the board of aldermen praying me not to do it but it isn't of any use you cannot move me from my fell purpose i will torment the people if i want to i have a better right to do it than these strange lecturers and orators that come here from abroad it only costs the public a dollar apiece, and if they can't stand it, what do they stay here for? Am I to go away and let them have peace and quiet for a year and a half, and then come back and only lecture them twice? What do you take me for? No, gentlemen, ask of me anything else, and I will do it cheerfully, but do not ask me not to afflict the people. I wish to tell them all I know about Venice. I wish to tell them about the city of the sea, that most venerable, most brilliant, and proudest republic the world has ever seen. I wish to hint at what it achieved in twelve hundred years and what it lost in two hundred. I wish to furnish a deal of pleasant information, somewhat highly spiced, but still palatable, digestible, and eminently fitted for the intellectual stomach. My last lecture was not as fine as I thought it was, 
but I have submitted this discourse to several able critics, and they have pronounced it good. Now, therefore, why should I withhold it? Let me talk only just this once, and I will sail positively on the 6th of July, and stay away until I return from China two years. Yours truly, Mark Twain. Further Remonstrance. San Francisco, June 30th. Mr. Mark Twain, learning with profound regret that you have concluded to postpone your departure until the 6th July, and learning also with unspeakable grief that you propose to read from your forthcoming book or lecture again before you go at the new mercantile library, we hasten to beg of you that you will not do it. Curb this spirit of lawless violence, and emigrate at once. Have the vessel's bill for your passage sent to us. We will pay it. Your friends, Pacific Board of Brokers, and other financial and social institutions. San Francisco, June 30th. Mr. Mark Twain, dear sir, will you start now, without any unnecessary delay? Yours truly, proprietors of the Alta, Bulletin, Times, Call, Examiner, and other San Francisco publications. San Francisco, June 30th. Mr. Mark Twain, dear sir, do not delay your departure. You can come back and lecture another time. In the language of the worldly, you can cut and come again. Your friends, the clergy. San Francisco, June 30th. Mr. Mark Twain, dear sir, you had better go. Yours, the chief of police. Reply. San Francisco, June 30th. Gentlemen, restrain your emotions. You observe that they cannot avail. Read New Mercantile Library, Bush Street. Thursday evening, July 2nd, 1868. One night only. Farewell lecture of Mark Twain. Subject, The Oldest of the Republics, Venice, Past and Present. Box office open Wednesday and Thursday. No extra charge for reserved seats. Admission, one dollar. Doors open at seven. Orgies to commence at eight p.m. The public displays and ceremonies projected to give fitting eclat to this occasion have been unavoidably delayed until the fourth. The lecture will be delivered certainly on the second, and the event will be celebrated two days afterward by a discharge of artillery on the fourth, a procession of citizens, the reading of the Declaration of Independence, and by a gorgeous display of fireworks from Russian Hill in the evening, which I have ordered at my sole expense, the cost amounting to eighty thousand dollars at new mercantile library bush street thursday evening july second eighteen sixty eight end of appendix h announcement for lecture of july second eighteen sixty eight read by john greenman section ninety four of mark twain a biography appendixes this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Appendix I Mark Twain's Championship of Thomas K. Beecher See Chapter 74 There was a religious turmoil in Elmira in 1869, a disturbance among the ministers due to the success of Thomas K. Beecher in a series of meetings he was conducting in the Opera House. Mr. Beecher's teachings had never been very orthodox or doctrinal, but up to this time they had been seemingly unobjectionable to his brother clergyman, 
who fraternized with him and joined with him in the monday meetings of the ministerial union of elmira when each monday a sermon was read by one of the members the situation presently changed mr beecher was preaching his doubtful theology to large and nightly increasing audiences and it was time to check the exodus the ministerial union of elmira not only declined to recognize and abet the opera house gatherings but they requested him to withdraw from their monday meetings on the ground that his teachings were pernicious mr beecher said nothing of the matter and it was not made public until a notice of it appeared in a religious paper naturally such a course did not meet with the approval of the langdon family and awoke the scorn of a man who so detested bigotry in any form as mark twain he was a stranger in the place and not justified to speak over his own signature but he wrote an article and read it to members of the langdon family and to dr and mrs taylor their intimate friends who were spending an evening in the langdon home it was universally approved and the next morning appeared in the elmira advertiser over the signature of s cat it created a stir of course the article follows mr beecher and the clergy the ministerial union of elmira new york at a recent meeting passed resolutions disapproving the teachings of rev t k beecher declining to cooperate with him in his sunday evening services at the opera house and requesting him to withdraw from their monday morning meeting this has resulted in his withdrawal and thus the pastors are relieved from further responsibility as to his action new york evangelist poor beecher all this time he could do whatever he pleased that was wrong and then be perfectly serene and comfortable over it because the ministerial union of elmira was responsible to god for it he could lie if he wanted to and those ministers had to answer for it he could promote discord in the church of christ and those parties had to make it right with the deity as best they could he could teach false doctrines to empty opera houses and those sorrowing lambs of the ministerial union had to get out their sackcloth and ashes and stand responsible for it he had such a comfortable thing of it but he went too far in an evil hour he slaughtered the simple geese that laid the golden egg of responsibility for him and now they will uncover their customary complacency and lift up their customary cackle in his behalf no more and so at last he finds himself in the novel position of being responsible to god for his acts instead of to the ministerial union of elmira to say that this is appalling is to state it with a degree of mildness which amounts to insipidity we cannot justly estimate this calamity without first reviewing certain facts that conspired to bring it about mr beecher was and is in the habit of preaching to a full congregation in the independent congregational church in this city the meeting-house was not large enough to accommodate all the people who desired admittance mr beecher regularly attended the meetings of the ministerial union of elmira every monday morning and they received him into their fellowship and never objected to the doctrines which he taught in his church so in an unfortunate moment he conceived the strange idea that they would connive at the teaching of the same doctrines in the same way in a larger house therefore he secured the opera house and proceeded to preach there every sunday evening to assemblages comprising from a thousand to fifteen hundred persons he felt warranted in this course by a passage of scripture which says go ye into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature opera houses were not ruled out specifically in this passage and so he considered it proper to regard 
opera houses as a part of all the world he looked upon the people who assembled there as coming under the head of every creature these ideas were as absurd as they were far-fetched but still they were the honest ebullitions of a diseased mind his great mistake was in supposing that when he had the savior's endorsement of his conduct he had all that was necessary he overlooked the fact that there might possibly be a conflict of opinion between the savior and the ministerial union of elmira and there was wherefore blind and foolish mr beecher went to his destruction the ministerial union withdrew their approbation and left him dangling in the air with no other support than the countenance and approval of the gospel of christ mr beecher invited his brother ministers to join forces with him and help him conduct the opera house meetings they declined with great unanimity in this they were wrong since they did not approve of those meetings it was a duty they owed to their consciences and their god to contrive their discontinuance they knew this they felt it yet they turned coldly away and refused to help at those meetings when they well knew that their help earnestly and persistently given was able to kill any great religious enterprise that ever was conceived of the ministers refused and the calamitous meetings at the opera house continued and not only continued but grew in interest and importance and sapped of their congregations churches where the gospel was preached with that sweet monotonous tranquillity and that impenetrable profundity which stir up such consternation in the strongholds of sin it is a pity to have to record here that one clergyman refused to preach at the opera house at mr beecher's request even when that incendiary was sick and disabled and if that man's conscience justifies him in that refusal i do not under the plea of charity for a sick brother he could have preached to that opera house multitude a sermon that would have done incalculable damage to the opera house experiment and he need not have been particular about the sermon he chose either he could have relied on any he had in his barrel the opera house meetings went on other congregations were thin and grew thinner but the opera house assemblages were vast every sunday night in spite of sense and reason multitudes passed by the churches where they might have been saved and marched deliberately to the opera house to be damned the community talked 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 everybody discussed the fact that the ministerial union disapproved of the opera house meetings also the fact that they disapproved of the teachings put forth there and everybody wondered how the ministerial union could tell whether to approve or disapprove of those teachings seeing that those clergymen had never attended an opera house meeting and therefore didn't know what was taught there everybody wondered over that curious question and they had to take it out in wondering mr beecher asked the ministerial union to state their objections to the opera house matter they could not at least they did not he said to them that if they would come squarely out and tell him that they desired the discontinuance of those meetings he would discontinue them they declined to do that why should they have declined they had no right to decline and no excuse to decline if they honestly believed that those meetings interfered in the slightest degree with the best interests of religion that is a proposition which the profoundest head among them cannot get around but the opera house meetings went on that was the mischief of it and so one monday morning when mr b appeared at the usual minister's meeting his brother clergyman desired him to come there no more he asked why they gave no reason they simply declined to have his company longer mr b said he could not accept this execution without a trial 
and since he loved them and had nothing against them he must insist upon meeting with them in the future just the same as ever and so after that they met in secret and thus got rid of this man's importunate affection the ministerial union had ruled out beecher a point gained he would get up an excitement about it in public but that was a miscalculation he never mentioned it they waited and waited for the grand crash but it never came after all their labor pains their ministerial mountain had brought forth only a mouse and a stillborn one at that beecher had not told on them beecher malignantly persisted in not telling on them the opportunity was slipping away alas for the humiliation of it they had to come out and tell it themselves and after all their bombshell did not hurt anybody when they did explode it they had ceased to be responsible to god for beecher and yet nobody seemed paralyzed about it somehow it was not even of sufficient importance apparently to get into the papers though even the poor little facts that smith has sought a trotting team and alderman jones child has the measles are chronicled there with avidity something must be done as the ministerial union had told about their desolating action when nobody else considered it of enough importance to tell they would also publish it now that the reporters failed to see anything in it important enough to print and so they startled the entire religious world no doubt by solemnly printing in the evangelist the paragraph which heads this article they have got their excommunication bull started at last it is going along quite lively now and making considerable stir let us hope they even know it in podunk wherever that may be it excited a two-line paragraph there happy happy world that knows at last that a little congress of congregationless clergymen of whom it had never heard before have crushed a famous beecher and reduced his audiences from fifteen hundred down to fourteen hundred and seventy-five at one fell blow happy happy world that knows at last that these obscure innocents are no longer responsible for the blemishless teachings the power the pathos the logic and the other and manifold intellectual pyrotechnics that seduce but to damn the opera house assemblages every sunday night in elmira and miserable oh thrice miserable beecher for the ministerial union of elmira will never no never more be responsible to god for his shortcomings excuse these tears for the protection of a man who is uniformly charged with all the newspaper deviltry that sees the light in elmira journals i take this opportunity of stating under oath duly subscribed before a magistrate that mr beecher did not write this article and further still that he did not inspire it and further still the ministerial union of elmira did not write it and finally the ministerial union did not ask me to write it no i have taken up this cudgel in defense of the ministerial union of elmira solely from a love of justice without solicitation i have constituted myself the champion of the ministerial union of elmira and it shall be a labor of love with me to conduct their side of a quarrel in print for them whenever they desire me to do it or if they are busy and have not the time to ask me i will cheerfully do it anyhow in closing this i must remark that if any question the right of the clergymen of elmira to turn mr beecher out of the ministerial union to such i answer that mr beecher recreated that institution after it had been dead for many years and invited those gentlemen to come into it which they did and so of course they have a right to turn him out if they want to 
the difference between beecher and the man who put an adder in his bosom is that beecher put in more adders than he did and consequently had a proportionately livelier time of it when they got warmed up cheerfully s cat end of appendix i mark twain's championship of thomas k beecher read by john greenman section ninety five of mark twain a biography appendixes this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow Payne. appendix j the indignity put upon the remains of george holland by the rev mr sabine see chapter seventy seven what a ludicrous satire it was upon christian charity even upon the vague theoretical idea of it which doubtless this small saint mouths from his own pulpit every sunday contemplate this freak of nature and think what a cardiff giant of self-righteousness is crowded into his pygmy skin if we probe and dissect and lay open this diseased this cancerous piety of his we are forced to the conviction that it is the production of an impression on his part that his guild do about all the good that is done on the earth and hence are better than common clay hence are competent to say to such as george holland you are unworthy you are a play actor and consequently a sinner i cannot take the responsibility of recommending you to the mercy of heaven it must have had its origin in that impression else he would have thought we are all instruments for the carrying out of god's purposes it is not for me to pass judgment upon your appointed share of the work or to praise or to revile it i have divine authority for it that we are all sinners and therefore it is not for me to discriminate and say we will supplicate for this sinner for he was a merchant prince or a banker but we will beseech no forgiveness for this other one for he was a play actor it surely requires the furthest possible reach of self-righteousness to enable a man to lift his scornful nose in the air and turn his back upon so poor and pitiable a thing as a dead stranger come to beg the last kindness that humanity can do in its behalf this creature has violated the letter of the gospel and judged george holland not george holland either but his profession through him then it is in a measure fair that we judge this creature's guild through him in effect he has said we are the salt of the earth we do all the good work that is done to learn how to be good and do good men must come to us actors and such are obstacles to moral progress pray look at the thing reasonably a moment laying aside all biases of education and custom if a common public impression is fair evidence of a thing then this minister's legitimate recognized and acceptable business is to tell people calmly coldly and in stiff written sentences from the pulpit to go 
and do right be just be merciful be charitable and his congregation forget it all between church and home but for fifty years it was george holland's business on the stage to make his audience go and do right and be just merciful and charitable because by his living breathing feeling pictures he showed them what it was to do these things and how to do them and how instant and ample was the reward is it not a singular teacher of men this reverend gentleman who is so poorly informed himself as to put the whole stage under ban and say i do not think it teaches moral lessons where was ever a sermon preached that could make filial ingratitude so hateful to men as the sinful play of king lear or where was there ever a sermon that could so convince men of the wrong and the cruelty of harboring a pampered and unanalyzed jealousy as the sinful play of othello and where are there ten preachers who can stand in the pulpit preaching heroism unselfish devotion and lofty patriotism and hold their own against any one of five hundred william tells that can be raised upon five hundred stages in the land at a day's notice it is almost fair and just to aver although it is profanity that nine-tenths of all the kindness and forbearance and christian charity and generosity in the hearts of the american people to-day got there by being filtered down from their fountainhead the gospel of christ through dramas and tragedies and comedies on the stage and through the despised novel and the christmas story and through the thousand and one lessons suggestions and narratives of generous deeds that stir the pulses and exalt and augment the nobility of the nation day by day from the teeming columns of ten thousand newspapers and not from the drowsy pulpit all that is great and good in our particular civilization came straight from the hand of jesus christ and many creatures and of diverse sorts were doubtless appointed to disseminate it and let us believe that this seed and the result are the main thing and not the cut of the sower's garment and that whosoever in his way and according to his opportunity sows the one and produces the other has done high service and worthy and further let us try with all our strength to believe that whenever old simple-hearted george holland sowed this seed and reared his crop of broader charities and better impulses in men's hearts it was just as acceptable before the throne as if the seed had been scattered in vapid platitudes from the pulpit of the ineffable sabine himself am i saying that the pulpit does not do its share toward disseminating the marrow the meat of the gospel of christ for we are not talking of ceremonies and wire-drawn creeds now 
but the living heart and soul of what is pretty often only a specter no i am not saying that the pulpit teaches assemblages of people twice a week nearly two hours altogether and does what it can in that time the theater teaches large audiences seven times a week twenty-eight or thirty hours altogether and the novels and newspapers plead and argue and illustrate stir move thrill thunder urge persuade and supplicate at the feet of millions and millions of people every single day and all day long and far into the night and so these vast agencies till nine-tenths of the vineyard and the pulpit tills the other tenth yet now and then some complacent blind idiot says you unanointed are coarse clay and useless you are not as we the regenerators of the world go bury yourselves elsewhere for we cannot take the responsibility of recommending idlers and sinners to the yearning mercy of heaven how does a soul like that stay in a carcass without getting mixed with the secretions and sweated out through the pores think of this insect condemning the whole theatrical service as a disseminator of bad morals because it has black crooks in it forgetting that if that were sufficient ground people would condemn the pulpit because it had crooks and kellogs and sabines in it no i am not trying to rob the pulpit of any atom of its full share and credit in the work of disseminating the meat and marrow of the gospel of christ but i am trying to get a moment's hearing for worthy agencies in the same work that with overwrought modesty seldom or never claim a recognition of their great services i am aware that the pulpit does its excellent one-tenth and credits itself with it now and then though most of the time a press of business causes it to forget it i am aware that in its honest and well-meaning way it bores the people with uninflammable truisms about doing good bores them with correct compositions on charity bores them chloroforms them stupefies them with argumentative mercy without a flaw in the grammar or an emotion which the minister could put in in the right place if he turned his back and took his finger off the manuscript and in doing these things the pulpit is doing its duty and let us believe that it is likewise doing its best and doing it in the most harmless and respectable way and so i have said and shall keep on saying let us give the pulpit its full share of credit in elevating and ennobling the people but when a pulpit takes to itself authority to pass judgment upon the work and worth of just as legitimate an instrument of god as itself who spent a long life preaching from the stage the self-same gospel without the alteration of a single sentiment or a single axiom of right it is fair and just that somebody who believes that actors were made for a high and good purpose 
and that they accomplish the object of their creation and accomplish it well should protest and having protested it is also fair and just being driven to it as it were to whisper to the sabine pattern of clergymen under the breath a simple instructive truth and say ministers are not the only servants of god upon earth nor his most efficient ones either by a very very long distance sensible ministers already know this and it may do the other kind good to find it out but to cease teaching and go back to the beginning again was it not pitiable that spectacle honored and honorable old george holland whose theatrical ministry had for fifty years softened hard hearts bred generosity in cold ones kindled emotion in dead ones uplifted base ones broadened bigoted ones and made many and many a stricken one glad and filled it brim full of gratitude figuratively spit upon in his unoffending coffin by this crawling slimy sanctimonious self-righteous reptile end of appendix j the indignity put upon the remains of george holland by the rev mr sabine read by john greenman section ninety six of mark twain a biography appendixes this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne appendix k a substitute for ruloff have we a sydney carton among us see chapter eighty two to editor of tribune sir i believe in capital punishment i believe that when a murder has been done it should be answered for with blood i have all my life been taught to feel this way and the fetters of education are strong the fact that the death law is rendered almost inoperative by its very severity does not alter my belief in its righteousness the fact that in england the proportion of executions to condemnations is one to sixteen and in this country only one to twenty-two and in france only one to thirty-eight does not shake my steadfast confidence in the propriety of retaining the death penalty it is better to hang one murderer in sixteen twenty two thirty eight than not to hang any at all feeling as i do i am not sorry that ruloff is to be hanged but i am sincerely sorry that he himself has made it necessary that his vast capabilities for usefulness should be lost to the world in this mine and the public's is a common regret for it is plain that in the person of ruloff one of the most marvelous of intellects that any age has produced is about to be sacrificed and that too while half the mystery of its strange powers is yet a secret here is a man who has never entered the doors of a college or a university and yet by the sheer might of his innate gifts has made himself such a colossus in abstruse learning 
that the ablest of our scholars are but pygmies in his presence by the evidence of professor mather mr surbridge mr richmond and other men qualified to testify this man is as familiar with the broad domain of philology as common men are with the passing events of the day his memory has such a limitless grasp that he is able to quote sentence after sentence paragraph after paragraph chapter after chapter from a gnarled and knotty ancient literature that ordinary scholars are capable of achieving little more than a bowing acquaintance with but his memory is the least of his great endowments by the testimony of the gentleman above referred to he is able to critically analyze the works of the old masters of literature and while pointing out the beauties of the originals with a pure and discriminating taste is as quick to detect the defects of the accepted translations and in the latter case if exceptions be taken to his judgment he straightway opens up the quarries of his exhaustless knowledge and builds a very chinese wall of evidence around his position every learned man who enters ruloff's presence leaves it amazed and confounded by his prodigious capabilities and attainments one scholar said he did not believe that in matters of subtle analysis vast knowledge in his peculiar field of research comprehensive grasp of subject and serene kingship over its limitless and bewildering details any land or any era of modern times had given birth to ruloff's intellectual equal what miracles this murderer might have wrought and what luster he might have shed upon his country if he had not put a forfeit upon his life so foolishly but what if the law could be satisfied and the gifted criminal still be saved if a life be offered up on the gallows to atone for the murder ruloff did will that suffice if so give me the proofs for in all earnestness and truth i aver that in such a case i will instantly bring forward a man who in the interests of learning and science will take ruloff's crime upon himself and submit to be hanged in ruloff's place i can and will do this thing and i propose this matter and make this offer in good faith you know me and know my address samuel langhorne april twenty ninth eighteen seventy one End of Appendix K, a substitute for Ruloff, have we a Sidney Carton among us? Read by John Greenman.